Chapter 32 of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 32. On ne peut jamais dire. Fontaine, je ne boire jamais de tonneau. If we could choose our ills, we should not choose suspense. Rachel aged perceptibly during these last weeks. Her strong white hands became thinner, her lustreless eyes and haggard face betrayed her. In years gone by she had said to herself, when a human love had failed her, I will never put myself through this torture a second time. Whatever happens, I will not endure it again. And now she was enduring it again, though in a different form. There is an element of mother love in the devotion which some women give to men. In the first instance, it had opened the door of Rachel's heart to Hugh, and had gradually merged with other feelings, and deepened into the painful love of a woman not in her first youth, for a man of whom she is not sure. Rachel was not sure of Hugh. Of his love for her, she was sure, but not of the man himself, the gentle, refined, lovable nature that mutely worshipped and clung to her. She could not repulse him any more than she could repulse a child. But, through all her knowledge of him, the knowledge of love, the only true knowledge of our fellow creatures, a thread of doubtful anxiety was interwoven. She could form some idea how men like Dick, Lord Newhaven, or the Bishop would act in given circumstances, but she could form no definite idea how Hugh would act in the same circumstances. Yet she knew Hugh a thousand times better than any of the others. Why was this? Many women before Rachel have sought diligently to find, and have shut their eyes diligently, lest they should discover what it is that is dark to them in the character of the man they love. Perhaps Rachel half knew all the time the subtle inequality in Hugh's character. Perhaps she loved him all the better for it. Perhaps she knew that if he had been without a certain undefinable weakness, he would not have been drawn towards her strength. She was stronger than he, and perhaps she loved him more than she could have loved an equal. Les esprits faibles ne sont jamais sincères. She had come across that sentence one day in a book she was reading, and had turned suddenly blind and cold with anger. He is sincere, she said fiercely, as if repelling an accusation. He would never deceive me. No one had accused Hugh. The same evening he made the confession for which she had waited so long. As he began to speak, an intolerable suspense, like a new and acute form of a familiar disease, lay hold on her. Was he going to live or die? She should know at last. Was she to part with him, to bury love for the second time? Or was she to keep him, to be his wife, the mother of his children? As he went on, his language becoming more confused, she hardly listened to him. She had known all that too long. She had forgiven it, not without tears, but still she had forgiven it long ago. Then he stopped. It seemed to Rachel as if she had reached a moment in life which she could not bear. She waited, but still he did not speak. Then she was not to know. She was to be ground between the millstones of four more dreadful days and nights. She suddenly became aware as she stared at Hugh's blanching face, that he believed she was about to dismiss him. The thought had never entered her mind. Do you not know that I love you? she said silently to him as he kissed her hand. When he had left her, a gleam of comfort came to her, the only gleam that lightened the days and nights that followed. It was not his fault if he had made a half-confession. If he had gone on, and had told her of the drawing of lots, and which had drawn the fatal lot, he would have been wanting in sense of honour. He owed it to the man he had injured to preserve entire secrecy. He told me of the sin which might affect my marrying him, said Rachel, but the rest had nothing to do with me. He was right not to speak of it. If he had told me, and then a few days afterwards Lord Newhaven had committed suicide, he would know I should put two and two together, and who the woman was, and the secret would not have died with Lord Newhaven as it ought to do. But if Hugh were the man who had to kill himself, 
He might have told me so without a breach of confidence, because then I should never have guessed who the others were. If he were the man, he could have told me. He certainly would have told me, for it could have done no harm to anyone. Surely Lady Newhaven must be right when she was so certain that her husband had drawn the short lighter. And she herself had gained the same impression from what Hugh had vaguely said at Wilderley. But what are impressions, suppositions, except the food of suspense? Rachel sighed and took up her burden as best she could. Hugh's confession had at least one source of comfort in it. Deadly cold comfort if he were about to leave her. She knew that night, as she lay awake, that she had not quite trusted him up till now, by the sense of entire trust and faith in him which rose up to meet his self-accusation. What might have turned away Rachel's heart from him had had the opposite effect. He told me the worst of himself, that he risked losing me by doing it. He wished me to know before he asked me to marry him. Though he acted dishonourably once, he is an honourable man. He has shown himself upright in his dealing with me. Hugh came back no more after that evening. Rachel told herself she knew why. She understood. He could not speak of love and marriage when the man he had injured was on the brink of death. Her heart stood still when she thought of Lord Newhaven, a gentle, kindly man who was almost her friend, and who was playing with such quiet dignity a losing game. Hugh had taken from him his wife, and by that act was now taking from him his life too. It was an even chance, she groaned. Hugh is not responsible for his death. Oh, my God, at least he is not responsible for that. It might have been he who had to die instead of Lord Newhaven. But if it is he, surely he could not leave me without a word. If it is he, he would have come to bid me good-bye. He cannot go down into silence without a word. If it is he, he will come yet. She endured through the two remaining days, turning faint with terror each time the doorbell rang, lest it might be Hugh. But Hugh did not come. Then, after repeated frantic telegrams from Lady Newhaven, she left London precipitately to go to her, as she had promised, on the 28th of November, the evening of the last day of the five months. End of chapter 32Chapter 33 of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 33. And he went out immediately, and it was night. It was nearly dark when Rachel reached West of Abbey. A great peace seemed to pervade the long, dim lines of the gardens, and to be gathered in the solemn arches of the ruins against the darkening sky. Through the low doorway, a faint light of welcome peered. As she drove up, she was aware of two tall figures pacing amicably together in the dusk. As she passed them, she heard Lord Newhaven's low laugh at something his companion had said. A sense of unreality seized her. It was not the world which was out of joint, which was rushing to its destruction. It must be she who was mad, stark mad, to believe these chimeras. As she got out of the carriage, a step came lightly along the gravel, and Lord Newhaven emerged into the little ring of light by the archway. "'It's very good of you to come,' he said cordially, with extended hand. "'My poor wife is very unwell, and expecting you anxiously. She told me she had sent for you.' All was unreal. The familiar rooms and passages, the flickering light of the wood fire in the drawing room, the darkened room into which Rachel stole softly and knelt down, beside a trembling white figure, which held her with a drowning clutch. "'I will be in the drawing-room after dinner,' Lady Newhaven whispered hoarsely. "'I won't dine down. I can't bear to see him.' It was all unreal, except the jealousy which suddenly took Rachel by the throat and nearly choked her. "'I have undertaken what is beyond my strength,' she said to herself, as she hastily dressed for dinner. How shall I bear it when she speaks of him? How shall I go through with it? Presently she was dining alone with Lord Newhaven. He mentioned that it was Dick Vernon with whom he had been walking when she arrived. Dick was staying in Southminster for business, combined with hunting, and had written over. 
Lord Haven looked furtively at Rachel as he mentioned Dick. Her indifference was evidently genuine. She had not grown thin and part with what little look she possessed on Dick's account, he said to himself, and the remembrance slipped across his mind of Hugh's first word when he recovered consciousness after drowning. Rachel. I would have asked Dick to dine, continued Lord Newhaven, when the servants had gone, but I thought two was company and three none, and that it was not fair on you and Violet to have him on your hands, as I am obliged to go to London on business by the night express. He was amazed at the instantaneous effect of his words. Rachel's face became suddenly livid, and she sank back in her chair. He saw that it was only by a supreme effort that she prevented herself from fainting. The truth flashed into his mind. She knows, he said to himself, that imbecile, that brainless viper to whom I am tied is actually confided in her. And she and Scarlet are in love with each other, and the suspense is wearing her out. He looked studiously away from her, and continued a desultory conversation, but his face darkened. The little boys came in and pressed themselves one on each side of their father, their eyes glued on the crystallised cherries. Rachel had recovered herself, and she watched the children and their father with a pain at her heart, which was worse than the faintness. She had been unable to believe that if Lord Newhaven had drawn the short lighter, he would remain quietly here over the dreadful morrow, under the same roof as Teddy and Pawley. There was surely nothing horrible could happen so near them. Yet he seemed to have no intention of leaving Weston. Then perhaps he had not drawn the short lighter after all. At the moment when suspense, momentarily lulled, was once more rising hideous, colossal, he casually mentioned that he was leaving by the night train. The reason was obvious. The shock of relief almost stunned her. He would do it quietly tomorrow, away from home, she said to herself, watching him with miserable eyes, as he divided the cherries equally between the two boys. She dreaded going upstairs to Lady Newhaven, but anything was better than remaining in the dining room. She rose hurriedly, and the boys raced to the door and struggled which should open it for her. Lady Newhaven was lying on a sofa by the wood fire in the drawing room. Rachel went straight up to her and said hoarsely, and Lord Newhaven tells me he is going to London this evening by the night express. Lady Newhaven threw up her arms. Then it is he, she said. When he stayed on and on up to today, I began to be afraid that it was not he after all. And yet little things made me feel sure it was, and he was only waiting to do it before me and the children. I've been so horribly frightened. Oh, that he might only go away, and that I might never, never look upon his face again. Rachel sat down by the latticed window and looked out into the darkness. She could not bear to look at Lady Newhaven. Was there any help anywhere from this horror of death without, from this demon of jealousy within? I am her only friend, she said to herself over and over again. I cannot bear it, and I must bear it. I cannot desert her now. She has no one to turn to but me. Rachel, where are you? said the feeble, plaintive voice. Rachel rose and went unsteadily towards her. It was fortunate the room was lit only by the firelight. Sit down by me here on the sofa and let me lean against you. You do come for me, Rachel, though you say nothing. You are the only true friend I have in the world, the only woman who really loves me. Your cheek is quite wet and you are actually trembling. You always feel for me. I can bear it now you are here and he is going away. When the boys had been reluctantly coerced to bed, Lord Newhaven rang for his valet, told him what to pack, that he should not want him to accompany him, and then went to his sitting room on the ground floor. Scarlet seems a fortunate person, he said, pacing up and down. That woman loves him, and if she marries him, she will reform him. Is he going to escape altogether in this world and the next, if there is a next? Is there no justice anywhere? Perhaps at this moment he is thinking that he has salved his conscience by offering to fight, and that after all I can't do anything to prevent his living and marrying her if he chooses. He knows well enough I shall not touch him or sue for a divorce, for fear of the scandal. He thinks he has me there, and he's right. But he's mistaken if he thinks I can do nothing. 
I may as well go up to London and see for myself whether he is still on his feet tomorrow night. It's a mere formality, but I will do it. I might have guessed that she would try to smirch her own name and the boys through her if she had the chance. She will defeat me yet, unless I am careful. Oh, ye gods, why did I marry a fool who does not even know her own interests? If I had life over again, I would marry a Becky Sharp, any she-devil incarnate, if only she had brains. One cannot circumvent a fool, because one can't foresee their line of action. But Miss West, for a miracle, is safe. She has a lock-and-key face. But she's not for Scarlet. Did Scarlet tell her himself in an access of moral spring-cleaning preparatory to matrimony? No. He may have told her that he had got into trouble with some woman, but not about the drawing of lots. Whatever his faults are, he has the instincts of a gentleman, and his mouth is shut. I could trust him like myself there. But she's not for him. He may think he will marry her, but I draw the line there. Violet and I have other views for him. He can live if he wants to, and apparently he does want to, but whether he will continue to want to is another question. But he shall not have Rachel. She must marry Dick. A distant rumbling was heard of the carriage driving under the stable archway on its way to the front door. Lord Newhaven picked up a novel with a mark in it and left the room. In the passage he stopped a moment at the foot of the narrow black oak staircase to the nurseries, which had once been his own nurseries. All was very silent. He listened, hesitated, his foot on the lowest stair. The butler came round the corner to announce the carriage. Um, I shall be back in four days at the furthest, Lord Newhaven said to him, and, turning, went on quickly to the hall, where the piercing night air came in with the stamping of the impatient horse's hoofs. A minute later, the two listening women upstairs heard the carriage drive away into the darkness, and a great silence settled down upon the house. End of chapter 33Chapter 34 of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 34 The Fool Seth, Who Would Have Thought It? Winter had brought trouble with it to Warpington Vicarage. A new baby had arrived, and the old baby was learning, not in silence, what kings and ministers undergo when they are deposed. Hester had never greatly cared for the old baby. She was secretly afraid of it. But in its hour of adversity she took to it, and she and Reggie spent many hours concerning it for the arrival of the little chrysalis upstairs. Mrs. Gressley recovered slowly, and before she was downstairs again, Reggie sickened with one of those swift, sudden illnesses of childhood which made childless women thank God for denying them their prayers. Mrs. Gressley was not well enough to be told, and for many days Mr. Gressley and Hester and Dr. Brown held Reggie forcibly back from the Valley of the Shadow, where, since the first cradle was rocked, the soft feet of children have cleft so sharp an entrance over the mother hearts that vainly barred the way. Mr. Gressley's face grew as thin as Hester's as the days went by. On his rounds, for he let nothing interfere with his work, Heavy farmers in dog-carts, who opposed him at vestry meetings, stopped to ask after Reggie. The most sullen of his parishioners touched their hats to him as he passed, and mothers of families who never could be induced to leave their cooking to attend morning service, and were deeply offended at being called after-dinner Christians in consequence, forgot the opprobrious term, and brought little offerings of new-laid eggs and rosy apples to tempt the little master. Mr. Gresty was touched, grateful. "'I don't think I've always done them justice,' he actually said to Hester one day. "'They do seem to understand me a little better at last. Walsh has never spoken to me since my sermon on dissent, though I always made a point of being friendly to him. But today he stopped, and said he knew what trouble was, and how he had lost,' Mr. Gresty's voice faltered. "'It is a long time ago, but... How, when he was about my age, he lost his eldest boy, and how he always remembered Reggie in his prayers, and I must keep up a good heart. 
we shook hands, said Mr. Dressley. I sometimes think Walsh means well, and that he may be a good-hearted man after all. Beneath the arrogance which a belief in apostolic succession seems to induce in natures like Mr. Cressley's, as mountain air induces asthma in certain lungs, the shaft of agonised anxiety had pierced to a thin layer of humidity. Hester knew that that layer was only momentarily disturbed, and that the old self would infallibly reassert itself. But the momentary glimpse drew her heart towards her brother. He was conscious of it, and love almost grew between them as they watched by Reggie's bed. At last, after an endless night, the little faltering feet came to the dividing of the ways and hesitated. The dawn fell grey on the watchful faces of the doctor and Hester and on the dumb suspense of the poor father. And with a sigh as one who half knows he's making a lifelong mistake, Reggie settled himself against Hester's shoulder and fell asleep. The hours passed, the light grew strong, and still Reggie slept. Dr. Brown put cushions behind Hester and gave her food. He looked anxiously at her. Can you manage? he whispered later when the sun was streaming in at the nursery window. And she smiled back in scorn. Could she manage? What did he take her for? At last Reggie stretched himself and opened his eyes. The doctor took him gently from Hester, gave him food, and laid him down. He is all right, he said. He will sleep all day. Mr. Gressley, who had hardly stirred, hid his face in his hands. Don't try to move, Miss Hester, said Dr. Brown gently. Hester did not try. She could not. Her hands and face were rigid. She looked at him in terror. I shall have to scream in another moment, she whispered. The old doctor picked her up and carried her swiftly to her room, where Fraulein ministered to her. At last he came down and found Mr. Gressley waiting for him at the foot of the stair. You are sure he's all right? he asked. Sure, Fraulein is with him. He got the turn at dawn. Thank God! Well, I should say thank your sister, too. She saved him. I tell you, Gresty, neither you nor I could have sat all those hours without stirring, as she did. She had cramp after the first hour. She has a will of iron in that weak body of hers. I had no idea she was so uncomfortable, said Mr. Gresty, half incredulous. That is one of the reasons why I always say you ought not to be a clergyman, snapped the little doctor, and was gone. Mr. Gresty was not offended. He was too overwhelmed with thankfulness to be piqued. Good old Brown, he said indulgently. He has been up all night, and he is so tired he does not know he is talking nonsense. As if a man who did not understand cramp was not qualified to be a priest. Ha <laughs> ha! You always like to have a little hit at me, and he is welcome to it. I must just creep up and kiss dear Hester. I never should have thought she had it in her to care for anyone as she's shown she cares for Reggie. I shall tell her so, and how surprised I am, and how I love her for it. She has always seemed so insensible, so callous. But, please God, this is the beginning of a new life for her. If it is, she shall never hear one word of reproach about the past from me. A day or two later, the Bishop of Southminster had a touch of rheumatism, and Dr. Brown attended him. This momentary malady may possibly account to the reader for an incident which remained to the end of life inexplicable to Mr. Gressley. Two days after Reggie had taken the turn towards health, and on the afternoon of the very same day when Dr. Brown had interviewed the bishop's rheumatism, the Episcopal carriage might have been seen squeezing its august proportions into the narrow drive of Warpington Vicarage. At least, it was always called the drive, though the horses' noses were reflected in the glass of the front door, while the hind wheels still jarred the gateposts. Out of the carriage stepped, not the bishop, but the tall figure of Dick Vernon, who rang the bell and then examined a crack in the portico. He had plenty of time to do so. Lord, what fools, he said half loud. The crazy thing is shouting out that it is going to drop on their heads, 
and they put a clamp across the crack. Might as well put a respirator on a South Sea Islander. Is Mr. Cressley in? Well, then, just ask him to step this way, will you? Look here, James, if you want to be had up for manslaughter, you leave this port as it is. No, I did not drive over from the Southminster on purpose to tell you, but I mentioned it now I'm here. I added the portico myself when I came here, said Mr. Gressley stiffly, who had not forgotten or forgiven the enormity of Dick's behaviour at the temperance meeting. So I should have thought, said Dick, warming to the subject and mounting on a small garden chair, and some escaped lunatic has put a clamp on the stucco. I placed the clamp myself, replied Mr. Gressley. There really is no necessity for you to waste your time and mine here. I understand the portico perfectly. The crack is merely superficial. Is it? said Dick. Then why does it run round these two consumptive little pillars? I tell you, it's tired of standing up. It's going to sit down. Look here. Dick tore up the stucco with his knife and caught the clamp as it fell. That clamp was only put in the stucco. It never reached the stone or the wood, whatever the little kettle is made of. You ought to be thankful it did not drop on one of the children or on your own head. It would have knocked all the texts out of it for some time to come. Mr. Gresley did not look very grateful as he led the way to his study. I was lunching with the bishop today, said Dick, and Dr. Brown was there. He told us about the trouble here. He said the little chap Reggie was going on like a house on fire. The bishop told me to ask after him particularly. He is wonderfully better every day said Mr. Gressley, softening. How kind of the bishop to send you to inquire. Not having children himself, I should never have thought. No, said Dick, you wouldn't. Do you remember when we were at Cheam and Ogilvy's marked sovereign was found in the pocket of my flannel sock trousers? You were the only one of the boys, you and that sneak field, who was not sure I might not have taken it. You said it looked awfully bad, and so it did. No one was glad than I was when it was cleared up, said Mr. Gressley. No, said Dick, but we don't care much what anyone thinks when it's cleared up. It's before that matters. Is Hester in? I've got two notes for her. One from Brown and one from the Bishop. My orders are to take her back with me. That's why the Bishop sent the carriage. I'm afraid Hester will hardly care to leave us at the present, said Mr. Gresley. My wife is on her sofa, and Reggie is still very weak. He has taken one of those unaccountable fancies of children for her, and can hardly bear her out of his sight. The bishop has taken another of those unaccountable fancies for her, said Dick, looking full at Mr. Gressley in an unpleasant manner. I'm not one that holds that parsons should have their own way in everything. I've seen too much of missionaries. I just shove out curates and vicars and all that small fry if they get in my way. But when they break out in buttons and gaiters, by Jove, I knock under to them. At least I do to men like the bishop. He knows a thing or two. He's told me not to come back without Hester, and I'm not going to. Ah, there she is in the garden. Dick's large back had been turned towards the window, but he had seen the reflection of a passing figure in the glass of a framed testimonial which had occupied a prominent place on the study wall, and he at once marched out into the garden and presented the letters to Hester. Hester was bewildered at the thought of leaving Mornington, into which she seemed to have grown like a Buddhist into his tree. She was reluctant, would think it over, etc., but Dick, after one glance at her strained face, was obdurate. He would hear no reason. He would not go away. She and Fräulein nervously cast a few clothes into a box. Fräulein, so excited by the apparition of a young man and a possible love affair, that she could hardly fold Hester's tea gowns. When Hester came down with her hat on, she found Dick untiring Mr. Presley's bicycle in the most friendly manner, while the outraged owner stood by remonstrating. I assure you, Dick, I don't wish it to be touched. I know my own machine. If it were a common puncher, I could mend it myself, but I don't want the whole thing ruined by an ignorant person. I should take it into Southminster on the first opportunity. No need to do that, said Dick cheerfully. Might as well go to a doctor to have your nails cut. Do it at home. You don't believe in the water test? <laughs> That's rot. You'll believe in it when you see it. You're learning it now. There. Yeah. Now I've got it in the pail. You saw all those blooming little bubbles jostling up in a row. There's a leak at the valve. Oh, no, there isn't. It's only unscrewed. Good Lord, James, it's only unscrewed. You thought the whole machine was out of order. There, now I've screwed it up. Devil a bubble. What's that you're saying about swearing in your presence? Oh, don't apologise. You can't help being a clergyman. 
Look for yourself. You will never learn if you look the other way just when a good-natured chap is showing you. I would have put the tyre on again, but as you say, you can do it better yourself, so I won't. Sorry to keep you waiting, Hester. And look here, James, you ought to bicycle more. Strengthen your legs for playing the harmonium on Sundays. Well, I could not tell you at an organ in that little one-horse church. Goodbye, Fraulein. Goodbye, James. Home, Coleman, and look here, said Dick, putting his mischievous face out of the window as the carriage turned. If you're getting up steam for another temperance meeting, I'd be a man. Goodbye, dear James, interrupted Hester hastily, and the carriage drove away. He looks pasty, said Dick after an interval. A chap like James has no power in his arms and legs. He can kneel down in church and put his arm round Mrs. Gresty's waist, but that's about all he's up to. He doesn't take enough exercise. He's not well. I don't think I ought to have left them. You had no choice. Brown said unless you could be got away at once, you would be laid up. I was at luncheon at the palace when he said it. The bishop's sister was too busy with her good works to come herself, so I came instead. I said I should not come back alive without you. They seemed to think I should all the same, but of course that was absurd. I wanted the bishop to bet upon it, but he wouldn't. Do you always get what you want? said Hester. Generally, if it depends on myself, but sometimes things depend on others beside me. And then I may be beaten. They were passing west of Abbey, wrapped in a glory of sunset and mist. Did you know Miss West was there? Dick said suddenly. No, said Hester, surprised. I thought she was in London. She came down last night to be with Lady Newhaven, who is not well. Miss West is a great friend of yours, isn't she? Yes. Well, she has one fault, and it's one I can't put up with. She won't look at me. Don't put up with it, said Hester softly. We women all have our faults, dear Dick. But if men point them out to us in a nice way, we can sometimes cure them. End of chapter 34Chapter 35 of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 35 When the sun sets, who doth not look for night? Shakespeare Two nights had passed since Lord Newhaven had left the Abbey, and now the second day, the first day of December, was waning to its close. How Rachel had lived through them she knew not. The twenty-ninth had been the appointed day. Both women had endured till then, feeling that that day would make an end. Neither had contemplated the possibility of hearing nothing for two days more. Long afterwards, in quiet years, Rachel tried to recall those two days and nights, but memory only gave lurid glimpses as of lightning across darkness. In one of these glimpses, she recalled that Lady Newhaven had become ill, that the doctor had been sent for that she had been stupefied with narcotics. In another, she was walking in the desolate frost-nipped gardens, and the two boys were running towards her across the grass. As the sun sank on the afternoon of the second day, it peered in at her, sitting alone by her window. Lady Newhaven, after making the whole day frightful, was mercifully asleep. Rachel sat looking out into the distance beyond the narrow confines of her agony. Has not every man and woman who has suffered sat thus by the window, looking out, seeing nothing, but still gazing blindly out, hour after hour? Perhaps the quiet Mother Earth watches us, and whispers to our deaf ears, Vatanu balde, du hesch du ach. Little pulse of life writhing in your shirt afar, the shirt is but of clay of your mother's weaving, and she will take it from you presently when you lay back your head on her breast. There had been wind all day, a high, dreadful wind which had accompanied all the nightmare of the day as a wail accompanies pain. But now it had dropped with the sun, who was setting with little pageant across the level land. The whole sky, from north to south, from east to west, was covered with a wind-threshed floor of thin, wan clouds, and shreds of clouds, through which, as through a veil, the steadfast face of the heaven beyond looked down. And suddenly, from east to west, from north to south, as far as the trees and wolds in the dim, forgotten east, 
The exhausted, livid cloud blushed wave on wave, league on league, red as the heart of a rose. The wind-whipped earth was still, the trees held their breath. Very black against the glow, the carved cross on the adjoining gable stood out. And in another moment, the mighty tide of colour went as it had come, swiftly ebbing across its infinite shores of sky. And the waiting night came down suddenly. Oh, my God, said Rachel, stretching out her hands to ward off the darkness. Not another night. I cannot bear another night. A slow step came along the gravel. It passed below the window and stopped at the door. Someone knocked. Rachel tore open the throat of her gown. She was suffocating. Her long-drawn breathing seemed to deaden all other sounds. Nevertheless, she heard it, the faint footfall of someone in the hall, a distant opening and shutting of doors. A vague, indescribable tremor seemed to run through the house. She stole out of her room and down the passage. At Lady Newhaven's door, her French maid was hesitating, her hand on the handle. Below, on the stairs, stood a clergyman and the butler. "'I am the bearer of sad tidings,' said the clergyman. Rachel recognised him as the archdeacon at whom Lord Newhaven had so often laughed. "'Perhaps you would prepare Lady Newhaven before I break them to her.' The door was suddenly opened and Lady Newhaven stood in the doorway. One small clinched hand held together the long white dressing gown which she had hastily flung round her, while the other was outstretched against the doorpost. She swayed as she stood. Morphia and terror burned in her glassy eyes, fixed in agony upon the clergyman. The light in the hall below struck upward at her colourless face. In later days, this was the picture which Lady Newhaven recalled to mind as the most striking of the whole series. Tell her, said Rachel sharply. The archdeacon advanced. Prepare yourself, dear Lady Newhaven, he said sonorously. Our dear friend, Lord Newhaven, has met with a serious accident. Um, the Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Is he dead? whispered Lady Newhaven. The archdeacon bowed his head. Everyone except the children heard the scream which rang through the house. Rachel put her arms round the tottering, distraught figure, drew it gently back into the room, and closed the door behind her. End of chapter 35。Chapter 36 of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 36 And Micanor lay dead in his harness. First Book of Maccabees, Chapter 15, Verse 28 Rachel laid down the papers which were full of Lord Newhaven's death. He has managed it well, she said to herself. No one could suspect that it was not an accident. He has played his losing game to the bitter end, weighing each move. None of the papers even hint that his death was not an accident. He is provided against that. The butler received a note from Lord Newhaven the morning after his death, mentioning the train by which he should return to Westop that day, and ordering a carriage to meet him. A great doctor made public the fact that Lord Newhaven had consulted him the day before about the attacks of vertigo from which it appeared he had suffered of late. A similar attack seemed to have seized upon him while waiting at Clapham Junction, when the Down Express thundered past. The few who saw him said that, as he was pacing the empty platform, he staggered suddenly as the train was sweeping up behind him, put his hand to his head, and stumbled over the edge onto the line. Death was instantaneous. Only his wife and one other woman knew that it was premeditated. The only thing I cannot understand about it, said Rachel to herself, is why a man who from first to last could act with such caution and with such deliberate determination, should have been two days late. The 29th of November was the last day of the five months, and he died on the afternoon of December the 1st. Why did he wait two days after he left Westop? I should have thought he should have been the last man in the world to overstep the allotted time by so much as an hour. Yet, nevertheless, 
He waited two whole days. I don't understand it. After an interminable interval, Lord Newhaven's luggage returned, the familiar portmanteau and dressing bag, and even the novel which he was reading when he left Westham, with the mark still in it. All came back. And a coffin came back too, and was laid before the little altar in the disused chapel. I will go and pray for him in the chapel as soon as the lid is fastened down, said Lady Newhaven to Rachel. But I dare not before. I can't believe he is really dead. And they say somebody ought to look just to verify. I know it is always done. Dear Rachel, would you mind? So Rachel, familiar with death, as are all who have known poverty or who have loved their fellows, went alone into the chapel and stood a long time looking down upon the muffled figure, the garment of flesh which the soul had so deliberately rent and flung aside. Her face was fixed in a grave attention, as of one who sees that which he awaits. The sarcasm, the weariness, the indifference, the impatient patience, these were gone. These were indeed dead. The sharp, thin face knew them no more. It looked intently, unflinchingly, through its half-closed eyes, into the beyond, which some call death, which some call life. Forgive him, said Rachel, kneeling beside the coffin. My friend, forgive him. He has injured you, I know, and your just revenge, for you thought it just, has failed to reach him. But the time for vengeance has passed. The time for forgiveness has come. Forgive my poor Hugh, who will never forgive himself. Do you not see now, you who see so much, that it was harder for him than for you, that it would have been the easier part for him if he had been the one to draw death, to have atoned to you for his sin against you by his death, in instead of feeling, as he always must, that your stroke failed, and that he has taken your life from you as well as your honour. Forgive him, said Rachel, over and over again. But the unheeding face looked earnestly into the future. It had done with the past. Ah, said Rachel, if I who love him can forgive him, cannot you, who only hated him, forgive him too? For love is greater than hate. She covered the face and went out. End of chapter 36Chapter 37 of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 37. The nombre des êtres qui veulent voir vrai est extraordinairement petit. Ce qui dominait l'homme, c'est la peur de la vérité, à moins que la vérité ne leur soit utile. Amiel. Lady Newhaven insisted on attending the funeral, the little boy in either hand. Rachel had implored that she would spare the children, knowing how annoyed their father would have been. But Lady Newhaven was obdurate. No, she said, he may not have cared much about them, but that is no reason why they should forget he is their father. So Teddy and Paulie stared with round eyes at the crowd and at the coffin and the wealth of flowers and the deep grave in which their old friend and playfellow was laid. Perhaps they did not understand. They did not cry. They are like their father. They have not much heart, Lady Newhaven said to Rachel. Dick, who was at the funeral, looked at them, winking his hawk eyes a little, and afterwards he came back boldly to the silent house and obtained leave to take them away for the afternoon. He brought them back towards bedtime with a dancing doll he had made for them and a man's face cut out of cork. They met Rachel and the governess in the garden on their return and fluted them with their trophies. Dick waited a moment after the others had gone in. It seems hard on him to have left it all, he said. His wife and the little chaps and his nice home and everything. Rachel could say nothing. He was very fond of the boys, he went on. He would have done anything for them. He did what he could, said Rachel, almost inaudibly, and then added, He was very fond of you. 
He was a good friend, said Dick, his crooked mouth twitching a little, and a good enemy. That was why I liked him. He was hard to make a friend of, or an enemy. But when he once did either, he never let go. Rachel shivered. The frost was settling white upon the grass. I must go in, she said, holding out her hand. Are you staying much longer? said Dick, keeping it in his. I leave tomorrow morning very early. You will be in London, perhaps? I think so, for the present. May I come and see you? The expression of Dick's eyes was unmistakable. In the dusk he seemed all eyes and hands. Dear Mr. Dick, it's no use. I like plain speaking, said Dick. I can't think why it's considered such a luxury. You're quite right to say that, and I should be quite wrong if I did not say that I mean to keep on till you're actually married. He released her hand with difficulty. It was too dark to see his face. She hesitated a moment and then fled into the house. It is a well-known fact that after the funeral the strictest etiquette permits, nay encourages, certain slight relaxations on the part of the bereaved. Lady Newhaven lay on the sofa in her morning room in her long black draperies, her small hands folded. They were exquisite, little blue-veined hands. There were no rings on them except a wedding ring. Her maid, who had been living in an atmosphere of pleasurable excitement since Lord Newhaven's death, glanced with enthusiastic admiration at her mistress. Lady Newhaven was a fickle, inconsiderate mistress, but at this moment her behaviour was perfect. She, Angelique, knew what her own part should be, and played it with effusion. She suffered no one to come into the room. She, who would never do a hand's turn for the English servants, put on coal with her own hands, she took the lamps from the footman at the door. Presently she brought in a little tray with food and wine, and softly besought Milady to eat. Perhaps the mistress and maid understood each other. Lady Newhaven impatiently shook her head, and Angelique wrung her hands. In the end, Angelique prevailed. Have they all gone? Lady Newhaven asked, after the little meal was finished and, with much coaxing, she had drunk a glass of champagne. Angelique assured her they were all gone, the relations who had come to the funeral. Milor Vindham and L'Honorable Carson were the last. They were dining with Miss West and were leaving immediately after dinner by the evening express. Ask Miss West to come to me as soon as they have gone, she said. Angelique hung about the room and was finally dismissed. Lady Newhaven lay quite still, watching the fire. A great peace had descended upon that much-tossed soul. The dreadful restlessness of the last weeks was gone. The long suspense, prolonged beyond its time, was over. The shock of its ending, which shattered her at first, was over too. She was beginning to breathe again, to take comfort once more. Not the comfort that Rachel had tried so hard to give her, but the comfort of feeling that happiness and ease were in store for her once more, that these five hideous months were to be wiped out, and not her own past, to which she still secretly clung, out of which she was already building her future. It is December now. You and I shall be married next December, D.V., not before. We will be married quietly in London and go abroad. I shall have a few tailor-made gowns from Vernon, but I shall wait for my other things till I am in Paris on my way back. The boys will be at school by then. Paulie is rather young, but they had better go together, and they need not come home for the holidays just at first. I don't think Hugh would care to have the boys always about. I won't keep my title. I hate everything to do with him. Lord Newhaven was still him, and I know the Queen does not like it. I would be presented as Mrs. Scarlet, and we will live at his place in Shropshire, and at last we shall be happy. He will never turn against me, as he did. Lady Newhaven's thoughts travelled back, in spite of herself, to her marriage with Lord Newhaven, and the humble, boundless admiration which he had accepted as a matter of course, which had been extinguished so entirely, so inexplicably, soon after marriage, which had been succeeded by still more inexplicable paroxysms of bitterness and contempt. Other men, 
they knew him reflected, respected and loved their wives, even after they lost their complexions. She had kept hers. Why had he been different from others? It was impossible to account for men and their ways. And how he had sneered at her when she talked gravely to him, especially on religious subjects. Decidedly, Edward had been very difficult, until he settled down into the sarcastic indifference that had marked all his intercourse with her after the first year. He will never be like that, she said to herself, and he will never laugh at me for being religious. He understands me as Edward never did, and I will be married in a pale shade of violet velvet, trimmed with ermine, as it would be a winter wedding, and my bouquet shall be of Neapolitan violets to match my name. May I come in? said Rachel's voice. Do, said Lady Newhaven, but without enthusiasm. She no longer needed Rachel. The crisis during which she had clung to her was past. What shipwrecked seaman casts a second thought after his rescue to the log which supported him upon a mountainous sea? Rachel interrupted pleasant thoughts. Lady Newhaven observed that her friend's face had grown unbecomingly thin, and that what little colour there was in it was faded. She is the same age as I am, but she looks much older, said Lady Newhaven to herself, adding aloud, Dear Rachel. Everyone has gone, said Rachel, and I have had a telegram from Lady Trenton. She has reached Paris and will be here tomorrow afternoon. Dearest Mamma, said Lady Newhaven. So now, said Rachel, sitting down near the sofa with a set countenance, I shall feel quite happy about leaving you. Must you go? I must. I have arranged to leave by the 7.30 tomorrow morning. I think it will be better if we say good-bye overnight. I shall miss you dreadfully. Lady Newhaven perceived suddenly, and with resentment, that Rachel was anxious to go. I do not think you will miss me. I don't know why you say that. You have been so dear and sympathetic. You understand me much better than Mamma. And then Mamma was always so fond of Edward. She cried for joy when I was engaged to him. She said her only fear was that I should not appreciate him. She never could see that he was in fault. I must say he was kind to her. I do wish I was not obliged to have her now. I know she would do nothing but talk of him. Now I come to think of it, do stay, Rachel. There is a reason why I can't stay, and why you won't wish me to stay, when I tell you. Oh, Mr. Vernon, I saw you and him holding hands in the dusk. But I don't mind if you marry him, Rachel. I believe he is a good sort of a young man. Not the kind I could ever have looked at. But what does that matter? I am afraid it has rankled in your mind that I once warned you against him. But after all, it is your affair, not mine. I was not going to speak of Mr. Vernon. Lady Newhaven sighed impatiently. She did not want to talk of Rachel's affairs. She wanted, now the funeral was over, to talk of her own. She often said there were few people with less curiosity about others than herself. Rachel pulled herself together. Violet, she said, we've known each other five months, haven't we? Yes, exactly. The first time you came to my house was that dreadful night of the drawing of lots. I always thought Edward drew the short lighter. It was so like him to turn it off with a laugh. I want you to remember, if ever you think hardly of me, that during those five months I did try to be a friend. I may have failed, but I did my best. But you did not fail. You have been a real friend, and you will always be so, dear Rachel. And when Hugh and I are married, you will often come and stay with us. A great compassion flooded Rachel's heart for this poor creature, with its house of cards. And her face became fixed as a surgeon's who gets out his knife. I think I ought to tell you, you ought to know, that I care for Mr. Scarlet. He is mine, said Lady Newhaven instantly, her blue eyes dilating. He is unmarried, and I am unmarried, said Rachel hoarsely. I don't know how it came about, but I have gradually become attached to him. He is not unmarried, it is false. He is my husband in the sight of heaven. I have always, through everything, looked upon him as such. This seemed more probable than that heaven had so regarded him. 
Rachel did not answer. She had confided her love to no one, not even to Hester, and to speak of it to Lady Newhaven had been like tearing the words out of herself with hot pincers. I knew he was poor, but I did not know he was as poor as that, said Lady Newhaven, after a pause. Rachel got up suddenly and moved away to the fireplace. She felt it would be horribly easy to strangle that voice. And you came down here pretending to be my friend, while all the time you were stealing his heart from me? Still Rachel did not answer. Her forehead was pressed against the mantel shelf. She prayed urgently that she might stay upon the hearth rug, that whatever happened she might not go near the sofa. And you think he is in love with you? I do. Are you not rather credulous? But I suppose he has told you over and over again that he cares for you yourself alone. Is the wedding day fixed? No, he has not asked me to marry him yet. I wanted to tell you before it happened. Lady Newhaven threw herself back on the sofa. She laughed softly. A little mirror hung tilted at an angle, which allowed her to see herself as she lay. She saw a very beautiful woman. And then she turned and looked at Rachel, who had no beauty, as she understood it, and laughed again. My poor dear, she said in a voice that made Rachel wince. You is no better than the worst. He's made love to you pour passer le temps, and you have taken him seriously like the dear, simple woman you are. But he will never marry you. The yeah, only he has not proposed. Of course not. Men are like that. It is hateful of them, but they will do it. They are the vainest creatures in the world. Don't you see that the reason he has not asked you is because he knows that Edward had to, and that I should soon be free to marry him. And, Rachel, you need not feel the least little bit humiliated, for I shan't tell a soul. And, after all, he loved me first. Lady Newhaven was quite reassured. It had been a horrible moment, but it was past. Why do I always make trouble? she said with plaintive self-complacency. Rachel, you must not be jealous of me. I can't help it. Rachel tried to say, I am not, but the words would not come. She was jealous, jealous of the past, cut to the heart every time she noticed that Lady Newhaven's hair waved over her ears and that she had taper fingers. I think it is no use talking of this any more, Rachel said. Perhaps I was wrong to speak of it at all. I did as I would be done by. As I am starting early, I think I will say good night and goodbye. Good night, dear Rachel, and perhaps as you say it had better be goodbye. You may remain quite easy in your mind that I shall never breathe a word of what you have said to any living soul, except you, she added to herself as Rachel left the room. End of chapter 37Chapter 38 of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 38. To every coward safety, and afterwards his evil hour. Sleep, that fickle courtier of our hours of ease, had deserted Hugh. When the last hour of the last day was over, and the dawn which he had bound himself in honour not to see, found him sitting alone in his room, where he had sat all night. Horror fell upon him at what he had done. Now that its mire was upon him, he saw by how foul, by how dastardly a path he had escaped. To every coward safety, and afterwards his evil hour. Hugh's evil hour had come. But was he a coward? Men not braver than he have earned the Victoria Cross, have given up their lives freely for others. Hugh had it in him to do as well as any man in hot blood, but not in cold. That was where Lord Newhaven had the advantage of him. He had been overmatched from the first. The strain without had been greater than the power of resistance within. As the light grew, Hugh tasted of that cup which God holds to no man's lips, remorse. Would the cup of death which he pushed aside have been more bitter? He took up his life like a thief. Was it not stolen? He could not bear his rooms. He could not bear the crowded streets. He could not bear the parks. He wandered aimlessly from one to the other, driven out of each in turn, consumed by the smouldering flame of his self-contempt. 
scorn seemed written on the faces of the passers-by. As the day waned, he found himself once again for the twentieth time in the park, pacing in the dim, persistent rain which had been falling all day. But he could not get away from the distant roar of the traffic. He heard it everywhere, like the Niagara which he had indeed escaped, but the sound of which would be in his ears till he died. He drew nearer and nearer to the traffic, and stood still in the rain, listening to it intently. Might one of those thousand wheels be even now bringing his enemy towards him, to force him to keep his unspoken word? He would not realise that his worst enemy was he who stood with him in the rain. The forlorn London trees, black and bare, seemed to listen too, and to cling closer to their parks and grass, as if they dimly foresaw the inevitable time coming when they too should toil and hate and suffer, as they saw on all sides those stinted uprooted figures toil and suffer, which have once been trees like themselves. We shall come to it, they seemed to say, shivering in all their branches, as they peered through the iron rails at the stream of human life, much as man peers at a passing funeral. The early night drove Hugh back to the house. He found a note from a man who had rooms above him, enclosing a theatre ticket which at the last moment he had been prevented using. He instantly clutched at the idea of escaping from himself for a few hours at least. He hastily changed his wet clothes, ate some food that had been prepared for him, and hurried out once more. The play was Julius Caesar at Her Majesty's. He had seen it several times, but tonight it appealed to him as it had never done before. He hardly noticed the other actors. His whole interest centred in the awful figure of Cassius, splendid in its unswerving, deathless passion of a great hate and a great love. His eyes never left the ruthless figure as it stood in silence with its unflinching eyes upon its victim. Had not Lord Newhaven thus watched him, Hugh, ready to strike when the hour came? The moment of the murder was approaching. Hugh held his breath. Cassius knelt with the rest before Caesar. Hugh saw his hand seek the handle of his sword, saw the end of the sheath tilt upwards under his robe as the blade slipped out of it. Then came the sudden outburst of animal ferocity long held in leash, of stab on stab, the self-recovery, the cold stare at the dead figure with Cassius's foot upon its breast. For a moment the scene vanished. Hugh saw again the quiet study with its electric reading lamp, the pistols over the mantelpiece, the tigered lint in Lord Newhaven's eyes. He was like Cassius. He too had been ready to risk life, everything in the prosecution of his hate. He shall never stand looking down on my body, said Hugh to himself, with his cursed foot upon me. And he realised that if he had been a worthier antagonist, that also might have been. The play dealt with men. Cassius and Lord Newhaven were men. But what was he? The fear of death leading the love of life by the hand took with shame a lower seat. Hugh saw them at last in their proper places. If he could have died then, he would have died cheerfully, gladly, as he saw Cassius die by his own hand, counting death the little thing it is. Afterwards, as he stood in the crowd near the door, where the rain was delaying the egress, he saw suddenly Lord Newhaven's face watching him. His heart leaped. He has come to make me keep my word, he said to himself, the exultation of the play still upon him. I will not avoid him. Let him do it. And he pressed forward towards him. Lord Newhaven looked fixedly at him for a moment, and then disappeared. He will follow me and stab me in the back, said Hugh. I will walk home by the street where the pavement is up, and let him do it. He walked slowly, steadily, on, looking neither to right nor left. Presently he came to a barrier across a long, deserted street, with a red lamp keeping guard over it. He walked deliberately up it. He had no fear. In the middle he stopped and fumbled in his pocket for a cigarette. A soft step was coming up behind him. It will be quickly over, he said to himself. Wait, don't look round. He stood motionless. His silver cigarette case dropped from his hand. He looked at it for a second, forgetting to pick it up. A dirty hand suddenly pounced upon it, and a miserable, ragged figure flew past him up the street. Hugh stared after it, bewildered, 
and then looked round. The street was quite empty. He drew a long breath, and something between relief and despair took hold of him. Then he does not want to, after all. He has not even followed me. Why was he there? He was waiting for me. What horrible revenge is he planning against me? Is he laying a second trap for me? The following night, Hugh read in the evening papers that Lord Newhaven had been accidentally killed on the line. The revulsion of feeling was too sudden, too overwhelming. He could not bear it. He could not live through it. He flung himself on his face upon the floor and sobbed as if his heart would break. The cyclone of passion which had swept Hugh into its vortex spent itself and him and flung him down at last. How long a time elapsed, he never knew between the moment when he read the news of the accident and the moment when, shattered, exhausted, disfigured by emotion, he raised himself to his feet. He opened the window, and the night air laid its cool mother touch upon his face and hands. The streets were silent, the house was silent. He leaned with closed eyes against the window post. Time passed by on the other side. And after a while angels came and ministered to him. Thankfulness came softly, gently, to take his shaking hand in hers. The awful past was over. A false step, a momentary giddiness on the part of his enemy, and the hideous strangling meshes of the past had fallen from him at a touch, as if they had never wrapped him round. Lord Newhaven was gone, to return no more. The past went with him. Dead men tell no tales. No one knew of the godless compact between them, and of how he, Hugh, had failed to keep it, save they two alone. He and one other, and that other was dead. Was dead. Hope came next, shyly, silently, still pale from the embrace of her sister, despair, trimming anew her little lamp, which the labouring breath of despair had well nigh blown out. She held the light before Hugh, shading it with her veil, for his eyes were dazed with long gazing into darkness. She turned it faintly upon the future, and he looked where the light fell, and the light grew. He had a future once more. He had been given that second chance for which he had so yearned. His life was his own once more, not the shamed life in death, worse than death of the last two days, but his own, to take up again, to keep, to enjoy, best of all, to use worthily. No horrible constraint was upon him to lay it down, or to live in torment because he still held it. He was free, free to marry Rachel, whom he loved, and who loved him. He saw his life with her. Hope smiled and turned up a light. It was too bright. Hugh hid his face in his hands. And, last of all, dwarfing hope, came a divine, constraining presence, whoever stretches out strong hands to them that fall, who alone sets the stumbling feet upon the upward path. Repentance came to Hugh at last. In all this long time she had not come while he was suffering, while smouldering remorse had darkened his soul with smoke. But in this quiet hour she came and stood beside him. Hugh had in the past leaned heavily on extenuating circumstances. He had made many excuses for himself, but now he made none. Perhaps for the first time in his life, under the pressure of that merciful, that benign hand, he was sincere with himself. He saw his conduct, that easily condoned conduct, as it was. Love and repentance. Love and repentance. Are not these the great teachers? Some of us so frame our lives that we never come face to face with either, or with ourselves. Hugh came to himself at last. He saw how, whether detected or not, his sin had sapped his manhood, spread like a leaven of evil through his whole life, laid its hideous touch of desecration and disillusion even on his love for Rachel. It had tarnished his mind, his belief in others, his belief in good. These ideals, these beliefs, had been his possession once, his birthright. He had sold his birthright for red pottage.
Until now he had scorned the red pottage. Now he saw that his sin lay deeper, even in his original scorn of his birthright, his disbelief in the divine spirit who dwells with man. Nevertheless, his just punishment had been remitted. Hitherto he had looked solely at that punishment, feeling that it was too great. He had prayed many times that he might escape it. Now, for the first time, he prayed that he might be forgiven. Repentance took his hands and locked them together. God helping me, he said, I will lead a new life. End of chapter 38《Chapter 39 of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. • Chapter 39 • Les sots sont plus à craindre que les méchants. • Mr. Gressley had often remarked to persons in affliction that when things are at their worst, they generally take a turn for the better. This profound truth was proving itself equal to the occasion at Warpington Vicarage. Mrs. Gresley was well again after a fortnight at the seaside with Reggie. The sea air had blown back a faint colour into Reggie's cheeks. The new baby's vaccination was ceasing to cast a vocal gloom over the thin-walled house. The old baby's whole attention was mercifully diverted from his wrongs to the investigation of that connection between a chair and himself, which he perceived the other children could assume at pleasure. He stood for hours looking at his own little chair, solemnly seating himself at long intervals where no chair was. But his mind was working, and work, as we know, is the panacea for mental anguish. Mr. Gresley had recovered that buoyancy of spirit which was the theme of Mrs. Gresley's increasing admiration. On this particular evening, when his wife had asked him if the beef were tender, he had replied, as he always did, if in a humorous vein, Douglas, Douglas, tender and true, the arrival of the pot of marmalade, that integral part of the mysterious meal which begins with meat and is crowned with buns, had been hailed by the exclamation, What? More family jars? In short, Mr. Gresley was himself again. The jocund vicar, with his arm round Mrs. Gresley, proceeded to the drawing room. On the hall table was a large parcel, insured for two hundred pounds. It had evidently just arrived by rail. Aha, said Mr. Gresley, my pamphlets at last. Very methodical of Smithers, insuring them for such a large sum. And without looking at the address, he cut the string. Well packed, he remarked, waterproof sheeting. I do declare, Smithers is certainly a cautious man. Ha, at last. The inmost wrapping shelled off, and Mr. Gresley's jaw dropped. Where were the little green and gold pamphlets entitled Modern Descent? for which his parental soul was yearning. He gazed down, frowning, at a solid mass of manuscript written in a small, clear hand. "'This is Hester's writing,' he said. "'There is some mistake.' He turned to the direction on the outer cover. "'Miss Hector Gresley, care of Reverend James Gresley.' He'd only seen his own name. "'I do believe,' he said, "'that this is Hester's book, refused by the publisher. "'Poor Hester!' I am afraid she will feel that. His turning over of the parcel dislodged an unfolded sheet of notepaper, which made a parachute expedition to the floor. Mr. Cressley picked it up and laid it on the parcel. Oh, it's not refused after all, he said, his eye catching the sense of the few words before him. Hester seems to have sent for it back to make some alterations, and Mr. Bentham, I suppose that is the publisher, asked for it back with as little delay as possible. Then she has sold it to him. I wonder what she got for it. She got a hundred for the idol. It is wonderful to think of when Bishop Heavisides got nothing at all for his diocesan sermons and had to make up thirty pounds out of his own pocket as well. But as long as the public is willing to pay through the nose for trashy fiction to amuse its idleness, so long will novelists reap in these large harvests. If I had Hester's talent... You have. Mrs. Lofthouse was saying so only yesterday. If I had time to work it out, I should not pander to the depraved public taste, as Hester does. I should use my talent, as I have often told her, for the highest ends, not for the lowest. It would be my aim, 
Mr Grizzly's voice rose sonorously, to raise my readers, to educate them, to place a high ideal before them, to ennoble them. You could do it, said Mrs Grizzly with conviction, and it is probable that the conviction both felt was a true one, that Mr Grizzly could write a book which would, from their point of view, fulfil these vast requirements. Mr Grizzly shook his head and put the parcel on a table in his study. Hester will be back the day after tomorrow, he said, and then she can take charge of it herself. And he filled in the railway form of its receipt. Mrs. Cressley, who had been to tea with the Pratts for the first time since her convalescence, was tired and went early to bed, or, as Mr. Cressley termed it, Bedfordshire. And Mr. Cressley retired to his study to put a few finishing touches to a paper he was writing on St. Augustine, not by request for that receptacle of clerical genius, the Parish Magazine. Will the contents of Parish Magazines always be written by the clergy? Is it utopian to hope that a day will dawn when it will be perceived even by clerical editors that apostolic succession does not invariably confer literary talent? What can an intelligent artisan think when he reads what he reads in his Parish Magazine? A serial story by a rector unknown to fame, who, if he possesses talent, conceals it in some other napkin than the parish magazine, a short paper on bees by an archdeacon, an Easter hymn by a bishop, and such a good bishop too, but what a hymn, poultry keeping by Alice Brown. We draw breath, but the relief is only momentary. Side lights on the Reformation by a canon, half hours with the young by a rural dean. But as an invalid will rebel against a long course of milk puddings and will crave for the jam roll which is for others, so Mr. Gresty's mind revolted from St. Augustine and craved for something different. His wandering eye fell on Hester's book. I can't attend to graver things tonight, he said. I will take a look at Hester's story. I showed her my paper on descent, so of course I can dip into her book. I hate lopsided confidences and I dare say I could give her a few hints, as she did me. Two heads are better than one. The Pratts and Thursbys all think that bit in the idyll where the two men quarrelled was dictated by me. Strictly speaking, it wasn't, but no doubt she picked up her knowledge of men, which surprises people so much, from things she has heard me say. She certainly did not want me to read her book. She said I should not like it. But I shall have to read it some time, so I may as well skim it before it goes to the printers. I have always told her I did not feel free from responsibility in the matter after the idyll appeared with things in it which I should have made a point of cutting out if she had only consulted me before she rushed into print. Mr. Gressy lifted the heavy mass of manuscript to his writing table, turned up his reading lamp, and sat down before it. The church clock struck nine. It was always wrong, but it set the time at Warpington. There were two hours before bedtime. I mean Bedfordshire. He turned over the first blank sheet and came to the next, which had one word only written on it. Husks, said Mr. Gresty. That must be the title. Husks that the swine did eat. Oh, I see. A very good sound story might be written on that theme, of a young man who left the church and how inadequate he found the teaching, the spiritual food of other denominations compared to that which he had partaken freely of in his father's house? Husks. It is not a bad name, but it is too short. The consequences of sin would be much better, more striking, and convey the idea in a more impressive manner. Mr. Gressy took up his pen, and then laid it down. I will run through the story before I alter the name. It may not take the line, I expect. It did not. The next page had two words on it. To Rachel. What an extraordinary thing. Anyone, be they who they might, would naturally have thought that if the book were dedicated to anyone, it would be to her only brother. But Hester, it seemed, thought nothing of blood relations. She disregarded them entirely. The blood relation began to read. He seemed to forget to skip. Page after page was slowly turned. Sometimes he hesitated a moment to change a word. He'd always been conscious of a gift for finding the right word. 
This gift Hester did not share with him. She often got hold of the wrong end of the stick. He could hardly refrain from a smile when he came across the sentence, He was young enough to know better, as he substituted in a large, illegible hand the word old for young. There were many obvious little mistakes of this kind that he corrected as he read, but now and then he stopped short. One of the characters, an odious person, was continually saying things she had no business to say. Mr. Gressley wondered how Hester had come across such doubtful women, not under his roof. Lady Susan must have associated with thoroughly unsuitable people. I keep a smaller spiritual establishment than I did, said the odious person. I've dismissed that old friend of my childhood, the devil. I really have no further use for him. Mr. Gressley crossed through the passage at once. How could Hester write so disrespectfully of the devil? This is positive nonsense, said Mr. Gressley irritably, coming as it does just after the sensible chapter about the new vicar who made a clean sweep of all the old dead regulations in his parish because he felt he must introduce spiritual life into the place. Now that is really good. I don't quite know what Hester means by saying he took exercise in his clerical cul-de-sac. I think she means Sir too, but she is a good French scholar, so she probably knows what she is talking about. Whatever the book lacked, it did not lack interest. Still, it bristled with blemishes. And then what could the Pratts, or indeed anyone, make of such a sentence as this? When we look back at what we were seven years ago, five years ago, and perceive the difference in ourselves, a difference amounting almost to change of identity, when we look back and see in how many characters we have lived and loved and suffered and died before we reach the character that momentarily clothes us, and from which our soul is struggling out to clothe itself anew. When we feel how the sympathy, even of those who love us best, is always with our last expression, never with our present feeling, always with the last dead self on which our climbing feet are set. She is hopelessly confused, said Mr. Gressley, without reading to the end of the sentence, and substituting the word ladder for dead self. Of course, I see what she means, the different stages of life, the infant, the boy, the man, but hardly anyone else will so understand it. The clock struck ten. Mr. Gressley was amazed. The hour had seemed like ten minutes. I will just see what happens in the next chapter, he said, and he did not hear the clock when it struck again. The story was absorbing. It was as if through that narrow, shut-up chamber a gust of mountain air was sweeping like a breath of fresh life. Mr. Gressley was vaguely stirred in spite of himself, until he remembered that it was all fantastic, visionary. He had never felt like that, and his own experience was his measure of the utmost that is possible in human nature. He would have called a kettle visionary if he had never seen one himself. It was only saved from that reproach by the fact that it hung on his kitchen hob. What was so unfair about him was that he took gorillas and alligators and the wart pig and all its warts on trust that he had never seen them. But the emotions which had shaken the human soul since the world began, long before the first wart pig was thought of, these he disbelieved. All the love which could not be covered by his own mild courtship of the obviously grateful Mrs. Gressley, Mr. Gressley put down as exaggerated. There was a good deal of such exaggeration in Hester's book, which could only be attributed to the French novels of which he had frequently expressed his disapproval when he saw Hester reading them. It was given to Mr. Gressley to perceive that the French classics are only read for the sake of the hideous improprieties contained in them. He had explained this to Hester, and was indignant that she had continued to read them just as frequently as before, even translating parts of some of them into English, and back again into the original. She would have lured that bishop forever in his vicar's eyes, if she had mentioned by whose advice and selection she read. So she refrained. Suddenly, as he read, Mr. Gressy's face softened. He came to the illness and death of a child. It had been written long before Reggie fell ill, but Mr. Gressy supposed it could only have been the result of what had happened a few weeks ago, since the book was sent up to the publisher. Two large tears fell onto the sheet. Hester's had been there before him. It was all true, every word. 
Here was no exaggeration, no fantastic overcolouring for the sake of effect. Ah, oh, Hester, he said, wiping his eyes, if only the rest were like that, if you would only write like that. A few pages more and his eyes were like flint. The admirable clergyman who had attracted him from the first reappeared. His opinions were uncommonly well put. But gradually it dawned upon Mr. Grestia that the clergyman was toiling in very uncomfortable situations in which he did not appear to advantage. Mr. Grestia did not see that the uncomfortable situations were the inevitable result of holding certain opinions, but he did see that Hester was running down the clergy. Any fault found with the clergy was, in Mr. Grestia's eyes, an attack upon the church, nay, upon religion itself. That a protest against a certain class of the clergy might be the result of a close observation of the causes that bring ecclesiastical Christianity into disrepute, could find no admission to Mr. Gressley's mind. Yet a protest against the ignorance or inefficiency of some of our soldiers, he would have seen without difficulty might be the outcome, not of hatred of the army, but of a realisation of its vast national importance and of a desire of its well-being. Mr. Gressley was outraged. She holds nothing sacred, he said, striking the book. I told her after the idyll that I desired she would not mention the subject of religion in her next book, and this is worse than ever. She has entirely disregarded my expressed wishes. Everything she says has a sting in it. Look at this. It begins well, but it ends with a sneer. Christ lives. He wanders still in secret over the hills and the valleys of the soul. That little kingdom which should not be of this world which knows not the things that belong unto its peace. And earlier or later there comes an hour when Christ is arraigned before the judgment bar in each individual soul. Once again the church and the world combine to crush him who stands silent in their midst, to condemn him who has already condemned them. Together they raise their fierce cry, Crucify him! Crucify him! Mr. Gressley tore the leaf out of the manuscript and threw it in the fire. But worse remained behind. To add to its other sins, the book, now drawing to its close, took a turn which had been led up to inevitably, step by step, from the first chapter, but which, in its reader's eyes, who perceived none of the steps, was a deliberate, gratuitous intermeddling with vice. Mr. Gressley could not help reading, but as he laid down the manuscript for a moment to rest his eyes, he felt that he reached the limit of Hester's powers, and that he could only attribute the last volume to the evil one himself. He had hardly paid this high tribute to his sister's talent, when the door opened, and Mrs. Gresty came in in a wrapper that had once been white. "'Dear James,' she said, "'is anything wrong? It is past one o'clock. Are you never coming to bed?' "'Mina,' said her pastor and master, I have been reading the worst book I have come across yet, and it was written by my own sister under my own roof. He might have added, close under the roof, if he'd remembered the little attic chamber where the cold of winter and the heat of summer had each struck in turn and in vain at the indomitable perseverance of the writer of those many pages. End of chapter 39《ハッピーバースデーとは何だ?》今回は私が書いたのは、ハッピーバースデーという言葉を使っていますが、私はそれを言うことができます。ハッピーバースデーという言葉を使っていますが、私はそれを言うことができます。ハッピーバースデーという言葉を使っています。and had had doubts as to the justice of eternal punishment. He was apt to speak in after years of the furnace through which he had passed, and from which nothing short of a conversation with a bishop had had power to save him, as a great experience which he could not regret because it had brought him into sympathy with so many minds. As he often said in his favourite language of metaphor, he had threshed out the whole subject of agnosticism and could consequently meet other minds still struggling in its turbid waves. But now, again, he was deeply perturbed, and it was difficult to see in what blessing to his fellow creatures this particular agitation would result. He walked with bent head for hours in the garden, 
he could not attend to his sermon, though it was Friday. He entirely forgot his Bible class at the almshouses in the afternoon. Mrs. Gressley watched him from her bedroom window where she was mending the children's stockings. At last she laid aside her work and went out. She might not be his mental equal. She might be unable, with her small feminine mind, to fathom the depths and heights of that great intelligence. But still, she was his wife. Perhaps, though she did not know it, it troubled her to see him so absorbed in his sister, for she was sure it was of Hester and her book that he was thinking. "'I am his wife,' she said to herself, as she joined him in silence, and passed her arm through his. He needed to be reminded of her existence. Mr. Gressley pressed it, and they took a turn in silence. He had not a high opinion of the feminine intellect. He was wont to say that he was tired of most women in ten minutes. But he had learned to make an exception of his wife. What mind does not feel confidence in the sentiments of its echo? I am greatly troubled about Hester, he said at last. It is not a new trouble, said Mrs. Gressley. I sometimes think, dearest, it is we who are to blame in having her to live with us. She is worldly, I suppose she can't help it, and we are unworldly. She is irreligious, and you are deeply religious. I wish I could say I was too, but I lag far behind you. And though I am sure she does her best, and so do we, her presence is a continual friction. I feel she always drags us down. Mr. Gressley was too much absorbed in his own thoughts to notice the diffident plea which his wife was putting forward that Hester might cease to live with them. "'I was not thinking of that,' he said, "'so much as of this novel which she has written. "'It is a profane, immoral book "'and will do incalculable harm if it is published.' "'I feel sure it will,' said Mrs. Gressley, "'who had not read it. "'It is dreadfully coarse in places,' continued Mr. Gressley, who had the same opinion of George Eliot's work. And I warned Hester most solemnly on that point when I found she had begun another book. I told her that I well knew that to meet the public taste it was necessary to interlard fiction with risque things in order to make it sell, but that it was my earnest hope she would in future resist this temptation. She only said that if he introduced improprieties into her book in order to make money, in her opinion, she deserved to be whipped in the public streets. She was very angry, I remember, and became as white as a sheet, and I dropped the subject. She can't bear even the most loving word of advice, said Mrs. Gressley. She holds nothing sacred, went on Mr. Gressley, remembering an unfortunate incident in the clergyman's career. Her life here seems to have had no softening effect upon her. She sneers openly at religion. I never thought... I never allowed myself to think that she was so dead to spiritual things as her book forces me to believe. Even her good people, her heroine, have not a vestige of religion, only a sort of vague morality, right for the sake of right, and love teaching people things, nothing real. There was a moment's silence. Hester is my sister, said Mr. Gressley, and I am fond of her in spite of all, and she has no one to look to for help and guidance but me. I am her only near relation. That is why I feel so much the way she disregards all I say. She does not realise that it is for her sake I speak. Mr. Gressley thought he was sincere, because he was touched. Mrs. Gressley's cheeks burned. That faithful, devoted little heart, which lived only for her husband and children, could not brook... What? That her priest should be grieved and disregarded? Or was it any affection for an interest in another woman that it could not brook? I have made up my mind, said Mr. Gressley, to forbid her most solemnly when she comes back tomorrow to publish that book. She does not come back tomorrow, but this evening, said the young wife. And pushed by some violent, nameless feeling which was too strong for her, she added, She will not obey you. When has she ever listened to what you say? She will laugh at you, James. She always laughs at you. And the book will be published all the same. It shall not, said Mr. Gressley, colouring darkly. I shall not allow it. You can't prevent it, said Mrs. Gressley, her breath coming quickly. She was not thinking of the book at all, but of the writer. What was a book, one more or one less? 
It was her duty to speak the truth to her husband. His sister, whom he thought so much of, had no respect for his opinion, and he ought to know it. Mr. Gresley did know it, but he felt no particular satisfaction in his wife's presentment of the fact. It is no use saying I can't prevent it, he said coldly, letting his arm fall by his side. He was no longer thinking of the book either, but of the disregard of his opinion, nay, of his authority, which had long gravelled him in his sister's attitude towards him. I shall use my authority when I see fit, and if I have so far used persuasion rather than authority, it was only because, in my humble opinion, it was the wisest course. It has always failed, said Mrs. Gresley, stung by the slackening of his arm. Yes, in spite of the new baby, she would rather have a hundred a year less than have this woman in the house. The wife ought to come first. By first, Mrs. Gresley meant without a second. She had this morning seen Emma laying Hester's clean clothes on her bed, just returned from a distant washerwoman whom the Gresties did not employ and whom they had not wished Hester to employ. The sight of those two white dressing gowns, beautifully got up with goffered frills, had aroused afresh in Mrs. Gresley what she believed to be indignation at Hester's extravagance, an indignation which had been increased when she caught sight of her own untidy wrapper over her chair. She always appeared to disadvantage in Hester's presence. The old smouldering grievance about the washing set alight to other feelings. They caught. They burned. They had been drying in the oven a long time. It has always failed, said Mrs. Gresley with subdued passion, and it will fail again. I heard you tell Mrs. Loftus that you would never let Hester publish another book like the Idyll. But though you say this one is worse, you won't be able to stop her. You will see when she comes back that she will pack up the parcel and send it back to the publishers, whatever you may say. The young couple were so absorbed in their conversation that they had not observed the approach of a tall, clerical figure whom the parlour-maid was escorting towards them. I saw you through the window, and I said I would join you in the garden, said Archdeacon Thursby majestically. I have been lunching with the Pratts. They naturally wished to hear the details of the lamented death of our mutual friend, Lord Newhaven. Archdeacon Thursby was the clergyman who had been selected, as a friend of Lady Newhaven's, to break to her her husband's death. It seems, he added, that a, a Miss West, who was at the Abbey at the time, is an intimate friend of the Pratts. Mrs. Christie slipped away to order tea, the silver teapot, etc. The archdeacon was a friend of Mr. Gresley's. Mr. Gresley had not many friends among the clergy, possibly because he always attributed the popularity of any of his brethren to a laxity of principle on their part, or their success, if they did succeed, to the peculiarly easy circumstances in which they were placed. But he greatly admired the archdeacon, and made no secret of the fact that, in his opinion, he ought to have been the bishop of the diocese. A long conversation now ensued on clerical matters, and Mr. Gresty's drooping spirits revived under a refreshing douche of compliments on modern descent. The idea flashed across his mind of asking the archdeacon's advice regarding Hester's book. His opinion carried weight. His remarks on modern descent showed how clear, how statesmanlike his judgment was. Mr. Gresley decided to lay the matter before him and to consult him as to his responsibility in the matter. The archdeacon did not know Hester. He did not know, for he had lived at a distance of several miles, that Mr. Gresley had a sister who had written a book. Mr. Gresley did not wish him to become aware of this last fact, for we all keep our domestic skeletons in their cupboards. So he placed a hypothetical case before his friend. Supposing someone he knew a person for whose actions he felt himself partly responsible, had written a, a most unwise letter, and this letter by no fault of Mr. Gresley's had fallen into his hands and been read by him. What was he, Mr. Gresley, to do? The letter, if posted, would certainly get the writer into trouble and would cause acute humiliation to the writer's family. What would the archdeacon do in his place? Mr. Gresley did not perceive that the hypothetical case was not on all fours with a real one. His first impulse had been to gain the opinion of an expert without disclosing family dissensions. Did some unconscious secondary motive impel him to shape the case so that only one verdict was probable? The good archdeacon ruminated, 
asked a few questions, and then said without hesitation, I cannot see your difficulty. Your course is clear. You are responsible. To a certain degree. To a certain degree, for the action of an extremely injudicious friend or relation who writes a letter which will get him and others into trouble. It providentially falls into your hands. If I were in your place, I should destroy it. Inform your friend to that I have done so principally for his own sake, and endeavour to bring him to a better mind on the subject. Supposing the burning of the letter entailed a money loss. I judge from what you say of this particular letter that any money that accrued from it would be ill-gotten gains. Oh, decidedly. Then burn it, and if your friend remains obstinate, he can always write it again. But we must hope that by gaining time you will be able to arouse his better feelings, and at least induce him to moderate its tone. Of course he could write it again if he remains obstinate. I never thought of that, said Mr. Gressley in a low voice. So he would not eventually lose the money if he was still decided to gain it in an unscrupulous manner. Or I could help him to rewrite it. I never thought of that before. Your course is perfectly clear, my dear Gressley, said the Archdeacon, not impatiently, but as one who is ready to open up a new subject. Your tender conscience alone makes the difficulty. Is not Mrs. Gressley endeavouring to attract our attention? Mrs. Gressley was beckoning them in to tea. When the Archdeacon had departed, Mr. Gressley said to his wife, I have talked over the matter with him, not mentioning names, of course. He is a man of great judgment. He advises me to burn it. Hester's book? Yes. He's quite right, I think, said Mrs. Gressley, her hands trembling as she took up her work. Hester was would never forgive her brother if he did that. It would certainly cause a quarrel between them. Young married people did best without a third person in the house. Will you follow his advice? she asked. I don't know. I, you see, poor Hester, it has taken her a long time to write. I wish to goodness she would leave writing alone. She's coming home this evening, said his wife significantly. Mr. Gressley abruptly left the room and went back to his study. He was irritated, distressed. Providence seemed to have sent the Archdeacon to advise him. And the Archdeacon had spoken with the decision. Burn it, that was what he had said, and tell your friend that you have done so. It did not strike Mr. Gressley that the advice might have been somewhat different if the question had been respecting the burning of a book instead of a letter. Such subtleties had never been allowed to occupy Mr. Gressley's mind. He was, as he often said, no splitter of hairs. He told himself that from the very first moment of consulting him, he had dreaded that the Archdeacon would counsel exactly as he had done. Mr. Gressley stood a long time in silent prayer by his study window. If his prayers took the same bias as his recent statements to his friend, was that his fault? If he silenced, as a sign of cowardice, a voice within him which entreated for delay, was that his fault? If he had never educated himself to see any connection between a seed and a plant, a cause and a result, was that his fault? The first seedling impulse to destroy the book was buried and forgotten. If he mistook this tiring, full-grown determination which had sprung from it for the will of God, the direct answer to prayer, was that his fault? As his painful duty became clear to him, a thin veil of smoke drifted across the little lawn. Reggie came dancing and caracoling round the corner. Father, he cried, rushing to the window, Abel has made such a bonfire in the backyard, and he is burning weeds and all kinds of things, and he's each given us a potato to bake, and Fraulein has given us a bandbox she did not want, and we've filled it quite full of dry leaves, and do you think if we wait a little, Auntie Hester will be back in time to see it burn? It was a splendid bonfire. It leaped, it rose and fell, it was replenished. Something alive in the heart of it died hard. The children danced round it. Oh, if only Auntie Hester was here, said Reggie, clapping his hands as the flame soared. But Auntie Hester was too late to see it. End of chapter 40
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 41 And we are punished for our purest deeds, and chastened for our holiest thoughts, alas! There is no reason found in all the creeds why these things are, nor whence they come to pass. Owen Meredith It was while Hester was at the palace that Lord Newhaven died. She had perhaps hardly realised, till he was gone, how much his loyal friendship had been to her. Yet she had hardly seen him for the last year, partly because she was absorbed in her book, and partly because, to her astonishment, she found that her brother and his wife were coldly upon an unmarried woman receiving calls from a married man. For in the country, individuality has not yet emerged. People are married, or they are unmarried. That is all. Just as in London they are agreeable or dull, that is all. Since I have been at Warbington, Hester said to Lord Newhaven one day, the last time he found her in, I have realised that I am unmarried. I never thought of it all the years I lived in London, but when I visit among the country people here, as I drive through the park, I remember with a qualm that I am a spinster, no doubt because I can't help it. As I enter the hall, I recall with a pang that I am eight and twenty. By the time I am in the drawing-room, I am an old maid. She had always imagined she would take up her friendship with him again, and when he died, she reproached herself for having temporarily laid it aside. Perhaps no one, except Lord Newhaven's brothers, felt his death more than Dick and Hester and the bishop. The bishop had sincerely liked Lord Newhaven. A certain degree of friendship has existed between the two men, which had often trembled on the verge of intimacy. But the verge had never been crossed. It was the younger man who always drew back. The bishop, with the instinct of the true priest, had an unshaken belief in his cynical neighbour. Lord Newhaven, who trusted no one, trusted the bishop. They might have been friends, but there was a deeper reason for grief at his death than any sense of personal loss. The bishop was secretly convinced that he had died by his own hand. Lord Newhaven had come to see him the night he'd left Westop on his way to the station. He'd only stayed a few minutes and had asked him to do him a trifling service. The older man had agreed had seen a momentary hesitation as Lord Newhaven turned to leave the room, and had forgotten the incident immediately in the press of continuous business. But with the news of his death, the remembrance of that momentary interview returned, and with it the instant conviction that that accidental death had been carefully planned. And now Hester's visit at the palace had come to an end, and the bishop's carriage was taking her back to Warpington. The ten days at Southminster had brought a little colour back to her thin cheeks, a little calmness to her glance. She had experienced the rest, better than sleep, of being understood, of being able to say what she thought without fear of giving offence. The bishop's hospitality had been extended to her mind, instead of stopping short at the menu. Her hands were full of chrysanthemums which the bishop had picked for her himself, her small head full of his parting words and counsel. Yes, she would do as he so urgently advised, give up the attempt to live at Warpington. She'd been there a whole year. If the project had failed, as he seemed to think it had, at any rate it had been given a fair trial. Both sides had done their best. She might ease money matters later for her brother by laying by part of the proceeds of this book for Reggie's schooling. She could see that the bishop thought highly of the book. He had read it before it was sent to the publisher. While she was at the palace, he had asked her to reconsider one or two passages in it, which he thought might give needless offence to her brother and others of his mental calibre, and she had complied at once, and had sent for the book. No doubt she should find it at Warpington on her return. When it was published, she would give Mina a new sofa for the drawing-room, and Fraulein a fur boa and muff, and Miss Brown a typewriter for her GFS work, and Abel a barometer, and each of the servants a new gown, and James, those four enormous volumes of Pusey for which his soul yearned. And what should she give Rachel, dear Rachel? Ha! Huh, what need to give her anything? The book itself was hers, was it not dedicated to her? And she would make her home with Rachel for the present, as the bishop advised, as Rachel had so urgently begged her to do. 
and we will go abroad together after Christmas, as she suggests, said Hester to herself. We will go to Madeira, or one of those warm places where one can sit like a cat in the sun, and do nothing, 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 from morning till night. I used to be so afraid of going back to Warpington, but the now that the time is coming to an end, I'm sure I shall not irritate them so much. And Minna will be glad. One can always manage if it is only for a fixed time. And they shall not be the losers by my leaving them. I will put by the money for my little Reggie. I shall feel parting with him. The sun was setting as she reached Warpington. All was grey. The church tower, the trees, the pointy gables of the vicarage, set small together, as in a Christmas card, against the still red sky. It only needed peace and goodwill, and a robin in the foreground, to be complete. The stream was the only thing that moved, with its shimmering mesh of far-tipped ripples fleeing into the darkness of the reeds. The little bridge, so vulgar in everyday life, leaned a mystery of darkness over a mystery of light. The white frost held the meadows, and, binding them to the grey house and church and bare trees, there was a thin floating ribbon of, was it mist or smoke? In her own window a faint light wavered. They had lit a fire in her room. Hester's heart warmed to her sister-in-law at that little token of care and welcome. Mina should have all her flowers, except one small bunch for Fräulein. In another moment she was ringing the bell, and Emma's smiling red face appeared behind the glass door. Hester ran past her into the drawing-room. Mrs. Greston was sitting near the fire with the old baby beside her. She returned Hester's kiss somewhat nervously. She looked a little frightened. The old baby, luxuriously seated in his own little armchair, rose and, holding it firmly against his small person to prevent any disconnection with it, solemnly crossed the hearthrug and placed the chair, with himself in it, by Hester. "'We would like some tea,' said Mrs. Gressley. "'It is quiet practice this evening. We don't have supper till nine. But Hester had had tea before she started. "'And you are not cold?' Hester was quite warm. The bishop had ordered a foot warmer in the carriage for her. You are looking much better. Hester felt much better, thanks. And what lovely flowers. Hester suggested, with diffidence, that they would look pretty in the drawing-room. I think, said Mrs. Gressley, who had thought the same till that instant, that they would look best in the hall. And the rest of the family, said Hester, whose face had fallen a little. Where are they? The children have just come in. They will be down directly. Come back to me, Toddy. You are boring your aunt. James is in his study. Is he busy, or may I go in and speak to him? He is not busy. He is expecting you. Hester gathered up her rejected flowers and rose. She felt as if she had been back at Warpington a year, as if she had never been away. She stopped a moment in the hall to look at her letters, and laid down her flowers beside them. Then she went on quickly to the study and tapped at the door. "'Come in,' said the well-known voice. Mr. Gresty was found writing. Hester instantly perceived that it was a pose, and that he had taken up the pen when he heard her tap. Her spirits sank a peg lower. "'He's going to lecture me about something,' she said to herself as he kissed her. "'Have you had tea? It is choir practice this evening, and we don't have supper till nine. Hester had had tea before she started. And you are not cold? On the contrary, Hester was quite warm, thanks, bishop, foot warmer, etc. You are looking much stronger. Hester felt much stronger. Certainly married people grew very much alike by living together. Mr. Gressley hesitated. He never saw the difficulties entailed by any action until they were actually upon him. He had had no idea that he would find it well nigh impossible to open a certain subject. Hester involuntarily came to his assistance. Well, perhaps I ought to look at my letters. By the way, there ought to be a large package for me from Bentham. It was not with my letters. Perhaps you sent it to my room. It did arrive, said Mr. Gresty, and perhaps I ought to apologise, for I saw my name on it and I opened it by mistake. I was expecting some more copies of my modern descent. It does not matter. I have no doubt you put it away safely. Where is it? Having opened it, I glanced at it. I'm surprised to hear that, said Hester, 
a pink spot appearing on each cheek, and her eyes darkening. When did I give you leave to read it? Mr. Gracie looked dully at his sister, and went on without noticing her question. I glanced at it. I do not see any difference between reading a book in manuscript or in print. I don't pr pretend to quibble on a point like that. After looking at it, I felt that it was desirable I should read the whole. You may remember, Hester, that I showed you my modern descent. If I did not make restrictions, why should you? The thing is done, said Hester. I did not wish you to read it, and you have read it. It can't be helped. We won't speak of it again. It is my duty to speak of it. Hester made an impatient movement. But it is not mine to listen, she said. Besides, I know all you are going to say. The same as about the idyll, only worse. That it is coarse and profane and exaggerated, and that I have put in improprieties in order to make it sell, and that I run down the clergy, and that the book ought never to be published. Dear James, spare me. You and I shall never agree on certain subjects. Let us be content to differ. Mr. Gresty was disconcerted. Your antagonist has no business to discount all you were going to remark by saying it first. His colour was gradually leaving him. This was worse than an Easter vestry meeting, and that was saying a good deal. I cannot stand by calmly and see you walk over a precipice if I can forcibly hold you back, he said. I think, Hester, you forget that it is my affection for you that makes me try to restrain you. It is for your own sake that... that... That what? That I cannot allow this book to be published, said Mr. Gressley in a low voice. He hardly ever lowered his voice. There was a moment's pause. Hester felt the situation was serious. How not to wound him, yet not to yield? I am eight and twenty, she said. I am afraid I must follow my own judgment. You have no responsibility in the matter. If I am blamed, she smiled proudly, at that instant she knew all that her book was worth, the blame will not attach to you. And after all, Minna and the Pratts and the Falsbys need not read it. No one will read it, said Mr. Gressley. It was a profane, wicked book. No one will read it. I'm not so sure of that, said Hester. The brother and sister looked at each other with eyes of flint. No one will read it, repeated Mr. Gressley. He was courageous, but all his courage was only just enough. Because, for your own sake, and for the sake of the innocent minds which might be perverted by it, I have, I have, burned it. Hester stood motionless, like one struck by lightning. Livid, dead already, all but the eyes. You dared not, said the dead lips. The terrible eyes were fixed on him. They burned into him. He was frightened. Dear Hester, he said, I will help you to rewrite it. I will give up an hour every morning till... Would she never fall? Would she always stand up like that? Some day you will know I was right to do it. You are angry now, but some day... If she would only faint or cry or look away. When Reggie was ill, said the slow, difficult voice, I did what I could. I did not let your child die. Why have you killed mine? There was a little patter of feet in the passage. The door was slowly opened by Mary, and Reggie walked solemnly in, holding with extreme care a small tin plate on which reposed a large potato. I made it for you, Auntie Hester, he said in his shrill voice, his eyes on the offering. It was my very own potato Abel gave me, and I baked it in the bonfire and kept it for you. Hester turned upon the child like some blinded, infuriated animal at bay, and thrust him violently from her. He fell, shrieking. She rushed past him out of the room and out of the house, his screams following her. I've killed him, she said. The side gate was locked. Abel had just left for the night. She tore it off its hinges and ran into the backyard. The bonfire was out. A thread of smoke twisted up from the crater of grey ashes. She fell on her knees beside the dead fire and thrust apart the hot embers with her bare hands. A mass of thin black films that had once been paper met her eyes. 
The small writing on them was plainly visible as they fell to dust at the touch of her hands. It is dead, she said in a loud voice, getting up. Her gown was burned through where she had knelt down. In the still air, a few flakes of snow were falling in a great compassion. Quite dead, said Hester. Reggie and the book. And she set off, running blindly across the darkening fields. It was close on eleven o'clock. The bishop was sitting alone in his study writing. The night was very still. The pen travelled, travelled. The fire had burned down to a red glow. Presently he got up, walked to the window, and drew aside the curtain. The first snow, he said half aloud. It was coming down gently through the darkness. He could just see the white rim on the stone sill outside. I can do no more tonight, he said, and he bent to lock his dispatch box with the key on his watch chain. The door suddenly opened. He turned to, to see a little figure rushing towards him and fall at his feet, holding him convulsively by the knees. Hester, he said in amazement. Hester! She was bareheaded. The snow was upon her hair and shoulders. She brought in the smell of the fire with her. He tried to raise her up, but she held him tightly with her bleeding hands, looking up at him with a convulsed face. His own hands were red as he vainly tried to loosen hers. They have killed my book, she said. They have killed my book. They burned it alive when I was away, and my head went. I don't know what I did, but I think I killed Reggie. I know I meant to. End of chapter 41Chapter 42 of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 42 Is it well with the child? I am not really anxious, said Mr. Gressley, looking out across the vicarage laurels to the white fields and hedges. All was blurred and vague and very still. The only thing that had a distinct outline was the garden railing, with a solitary rook on it. I am not really anxious, he said again, sitting down at the breakfast table. But his face contradicted him. It was blue and pinched, for he had just returned from reading the morning service to himself in an ice-cold church. But there was a pucker in the brow that was not the result of cold. The vicarage porch had fallen down in the night, but he was evidently not thinking of that. He drank a little coffee and then got up and walked to the window again. She is with the Pratts, he said with decision. I am glad I sent a note over early, if it will relieve your mind. But I am convinced she is with the Pratts. Mrs. Gressley murmured something. She looked scared. She made an attempt to eat something, but it was a mere pretense. The swing door near the back staircase creaked. In the vicarage, you could hear everything. Mr. and Mrs. Gressley looked eagerly at the door. The parlour-maid came in with a note between her finger and thumb. "'She is not there,' said Mr. Gressley, in a shaking voice. I, "'I wrote Mr. Pratt such a guarded letter, saying Hester had um, imprudently run across to see them on her return home, and how grateful I was to Mrs. Pratt for not allowing her to return, as it had begun to snow. He says he and Mrs. Pratt have not seen her.' "'James,' said Mrs. Gressley, "'where is she?' A second step shuffled across the hall, and Fräulein stood in the doorway. Her pale face was drawn with anxiety. In both hands she clutched a trailing skirt plastered with snow, hitched above a pair of large galoshed feet, into which the legs were grafted without ankles. "'She has not returned?' "'No,' said Mr. Gressley, "'and she is not with the Pratts.' "'I know always she is not with the Pratts,' said Fräulein scornfully. "'She never go to Pratt if she is in grief.' I go out at half seven this morning to the Browns, but Miss Brown knows nothing. I go to Wilderley. I see Mrs. Loftus still in bed, but she is not there. I go to Evans's. I go to Smith. I go last to Mr. Walsh, but she is not there. Mr. Cressley began to experience something of what Fräulein had been enduring all night. She would certainly not go from my house to a dissenter's, he said stiffly. You might have saved yourself the trouble of calling there, Fräulein. 
She likes Mr. and Mrs. Welsh. She gives them her book. Twilight's voice drowned the muffled rumbling of a carriage and a ring at the bell, the handle of which, uninjured amid the chaos, kept watch above the remains of the late porch. The bishop stood a moment in the little hall, while the maid went into the dining room to tell the graces of his arrival. His eyes rested on the pile of letters on the table, on the dead flowers beside them. They had been so beautiful yesterday when he gave them to Hester. Hester herself had been so pretty yesterday. The maid came back and asked him to step into the dining room. Mr. and Mrs. Cressley had risen from their chairs. Their eyes were fixed anxiously upon him. Fräulein gave a little shriek and rushed at him. She is with you, she gasped, shaking him by the arm. She is with me, said the bishop, looking only at Fräulein and taking her shaking hands in his. Thank God, said Mr. Gresley, and Mrs. Gresley sat down and began to cry. Some of the sternness melted out of the bishop's face as he looked at the young couple. I came as soon as I could, he said. I started soon after seven, but the roads are heavy. This is a great relief, said Mr. Gresley. He began on his deepest organ note, but it quavered quite away on the word relief for want of wind. How is Reggie? said the bishop. It was his turn to be anxious. Reggie is very well, said Fräulein with decision. Tell her he is so well as he was. He's very much shaken, said Mrs. Gresley, indignant mother love flashing in her wet eyes. He is a delicate child, and she, Hester, may God forgive her, struck him in one of her passions. She might have killed him, and the poor child fell and bruised his arm and shoulder, and he was bringing her a little present when she did it. The child had done nothing whatever to annoy her, had he, James? Nothing, said Mr. Gresley, and his conscience pricking him, he added, I must own Hester had always seemed fond of Reggie till last night. He felt that it would not be entirely fair to allow the bishop to think that Hester was in the habit of maltreating the children. I have told him that his own mother will take care of him, said Mrs. Gresley, and that he need not be afraid. His aunt shall never come back again. When I saw his little arm, I felt I could never trust Hester in the house again. As Mrs. Gresty spoke, she felt she was making certainty doubly sure that the woman of whom she was jealous would return and no more. Already well, cried till his head ache because you say Miss Gresty no come back, said Fräulein, looking at Mrs. Gresty as if she would have bitten a piece out of her. I think, Fräulein, it is the children's lesson time, said Mr. Gresty. Majestically. Who could have imagined that unobtrusive, submissive Fräulein, gentlest and shyest of women, would put herself forward in this aggressive manner? The truth is, it is all very well to talk. You can never tell what people will do. They suddenly turn round and act exactly opposite to their whole previous character. Look at Fräulein. That poor lady, recalled thus to a sense of duty, hurried from the room and the bishop, who had opened the door for her, closed it gently behind her. "'You must excuse her, my lord,' said Mr. Gresley. "'The truth is, we are all somewhat upset this morning. Hester would have saved us much uneasiness, I may say anxiety, if she had mentioned to us yesterday evening that she was going back to you. No doubt she overtook your carriage, which put up at the inn for half an hour.' "'No,' said the bishop. "'She came on foot.' She walked all the way. Mr. Cresty smiled. I am afraid my Lord Hester has given you an inaccurate account. I assure you she is incapable of walking five miles, much less ten. She took about five hours to do it, said the bishop, who had hesitated an instant of his swallowing something unpalatable. In a moment of great excitement, nervous persons like your sister are capable of almost anything. The question is whether she will survive the shock that drove her out of your house last night. Her hands are severely burned. Dr. Brown, whom I left with her, fears brain fever. The bishop paused, giving his words time to sink in. Then he went on slowly in a level voice, looking into the fire. She still thinks that she has killed Reggie. She won't believe the doctor and me when we assure her she has not. She turns against us for deceiving her. Mr. Gresley wrestled with a very bitter feeling towards his sister, overcame it, and said hoarsely, 
Tell her from me that Reggie is not much the worse, and tell her that I, that his mother and I, forgive her. Not me, James, sobbed Mrs. Grisley. It is too soon. I don't. I can't. If I said I did, I should not feel it. Hester is not in a condition to receive messages, said the bishop. She would not believe them. Dr. Brown says the only thing we can do for her is to show Reggie to her. If she sees him, she may believe her own eyes, and this frightful excitement may be got under. I came to take him back with me now in the carriage. I will not let him go, said Mrs. Gressley, the mother in her overriding her awe of the bishop. I'm sorry if Hester is ill. I will... And Mrs. Gressley made a superhuman effort. I will come and nurse her myself, but I won't have Reggie frightened a second time. He shall not be frightened a second time. But it is very urgent. While we are wasting time talking, Hester's life is ebbing away as surely as if she were bleeding to death. If she were actually bleeding in this room, how quickly you two would run to her and bind up the wound. There would be nothing you would not do to relieve her suffering. If I would let Reggie go, said Mrs. Gressley, he would not be willing, and we could not have him taken away by force, could we, James? The door opened and Reggie appeared, gently pushed from behind by Fräulein's thin hand. Bulu followed. The door was closed again immediately, almost on Bulu's tail. The bishop and Reggie looked hard at each other. "'I send my love to Auntie Hester,' said Reggie, in his catechism voice, "'and I am quite well. "'I should like to have some conversation with Reggie alone,' said the bishop. Mrs. Gressley wavered but the bishop's eye remained fixed on Mr. Gressley, and the latter led his wife away. The door was left ajar, but the bishop closed it. Then he sat down by the fire and held out his hand. Reggie went up to him fearlessly and stood between his knees. The two faces were exactly on the same level. Bulu sat down before the fire, his tail uncurling in the heat. Auntie Hester is very sorry, said the bishop. She is so sorry that she can't even cry. Tell her not to mind, said Reggie. It's no good telling her. Does your arm hurt much? I don't know. Mother says it does, and Fräulein says it doesn't. But it isn't that. What is it, then? It isn't that, or the tato been lost. It was only crumbs afterwards. But, Mr Bishop, I hadn't done nothing. Reggie looked into the kind, keen eyes and his own little red ones filled again with tears. I'd not done nothing, he repeated, and I kept my tato for her. It's that, that, I don't mind about my arm. I'm Christian soldiers about my arm, but it's that, that. That hurts you in your heart, said the bishop, putting his arm round him. Yes, said Reggie, producing a tight little ball that had once been a handkerchief. Auntie Hester and I were such friends. I told her all my secrets, and she told me hers. I knew long before when she gave father the silver cream jug, and about Fräulein's muff. If it was a mistake, like father treading on my foot at the school feast, I should not mind, but she, she did it on purpose. The bishop's brow contracted. Time was ebbing away, ebbing away like a life. Yet Mr. Brown's warning remained in his ears. If the child is frightened of her and screams when he sees her, I won't answer for the consequences. Is that your little dog? he said after a moment's thought. Yes, that is Bulu. Was he ever in a trap? asked the bishop, with a vague recollection of the ways of clergymen's dogs, those little rifts within the lute, which so often break the harmony between a sporting squire and his clergyman. He was once. Mr. Pratt says he hunts, but father says not, that he could not catch anything if he tried. I had a dog once, said the bishop, called Jock, and he got in a trap like Bulu did. Now, Jock loved me. He cared for me more than anybody in the world. Yet, as I was letting him out of the trap, he bit me. Do you know why he did that? Why? because the trap hurt him so dreadfully that he could not help biting something. He did not really mean it. He licked me afterwards. Now Auntie Hester was like Jock. She was in dreadful, dreadful pain like a trap, and she hit you like Jock bit me. 
but Jock loved me best in the world all the time. And Auntie Hester loves you and is your friend she tells secrets to all the time. Mother says she does not love me, really. It was only pretense. Richard's voice shook. M Mother says she, she must never come back because it might be baby next. She, she said so to father. Mother has made a mistake. I'm so old that I know better even than mother. Auntie Hester loves you and can't eat any breakfast till you tell her you don't mind. Will you come with me and kiss her and tell her so? And we'll make up a new secret on the way. Yes, said Reggie eagerly, his wan little face turning pink. But, Mother, he said, dropping short. Run and get your coat on. I will speak to Mother. Quick, Reggie. Reggie rushed, curvetting out of the room. The bishop followed more slowly and went into the drawing room where Mr and Mrs Gresty were sitting by the fireless hearth. The drawing room fire was never lit till two o'clock. Reggie goes with me of his own free will, he said. So that is settled. He will be quite safe with me, Mrs. Gresley. My wife demurs at sending him, said Mr. Gresley. No, no, she does not, said the bishop gently. Hester saved Reggie's life, and it is only right that Reggie should save hers. You will come over this afternoon to take him back, he continued to Mr. Gresley. I wish to have some conversation with you. Fraulein appeared breathless, dragging Reggie with her. "'He's not got on his new overcoat,' said Mrs. Gresley. "'Reggie, run up and change at once.' Fraulein actually said, "'Buzzer, you new coat. And she swept Reggie into the carriage, the bishop following, stumbling over the ruins of the porch. "'Have they had their hot mash?' he said to the coachman, who was tearing off the horse's clothing. "'Yes, my lord.' "'Then drive all you know. Put them at the hills at a gallop.' Fraulein pressed a packet of biscuits into the bishop's hand. He eats no breakfast, she said. Uncle Dick said the porch would sit down, and it has, said Reggie, in an awestruck voice, as the carriage swayed from side to side of the road. Father knows a great deal, but sometimes I think Uncle Dick knows most of all. First gates and flying hypnies, and now porches. Uncle Dick is staying in Southminster. Perhaps we shall see him. I should like to ask him about his finger, if it isn't a secret. I don't think it is. Now, what secret shall we make up on the way? The bishop put his head out of the window. Drive faster, he said. It was decided that the secret should be a Christmas present for Auntie Hester to be bought in Southminster. The bishop found that Reggie's entire capital was sixpence. But Reggie explained that he could spend a shilling because he was always given sixpence by his father when he pulled a tooth out. And I've one loose now, he said. When I suck it, it moves. It'd be ready by Christmas. There was a short silence. The horse's hoofs beat the muffled ground altogether. Don't you find, Mr Bishop, said Reggie tentatively, that this riding so quick in carriages and talking secrets does make people very hungry? The bishop blushed. It is quite true, my boy. I, I ought to have thought of that before. I am uncommonly hungry myself, he said, looking in every pocket for the biscuits Fraulein had forced into his hand. When they were at last discovered, in a somewhat dilapidated condition, in the rug, the bishop found they were a kind of biscuit that always made him cough. So he begged Reggie, who was dividing them equally as a personal favour, to eat them all. It was a crumb-besprinkled bishop who, half an hour later, hurried up the stairs of the palace, what an age you have been, snapped Dr. Brown from the landing. How is she? The same, but weaker. Have you got Reggie? Yes, but it took time. Is he frightened? Not a bit. Then bring him up. The doctor went back into the bedroom, leaving the door ajar. A small, shrunken figure with bandaged head and hands was sitting in an armchair. The eyes of the rigid, discoloured face were fixed. Dr. Brown took the bandage off Hester's head and smoothed her hair. He's coming upstairs now, he said, shaking her gently by the shoulders. Reggie is coming upstairs now to see you. Reggie is quite well, and he's coming in now to see you. Reggie is dead, you old grey wolf, said Hester, in a monotonous voice. I killed him in the backyard. 
The place is quite black and it smokes. Look at the door, repeated Dr. Brown over and over again. He's coming in at the door now. Esther trembled and looked at the door. The doctor noticed with a frown that she could hardly move her eyes. Reggie stood in the doorway holding the bishop's hand. The cold snow light fell upon the gallant little figure and white face. The doctor moved between Hester and the window. His shadow was upon her. The hearts of the two men beat like hammers. A change came over Hester's face. My little Reg, she said, holding out her bandaged hands. Reggie ran to her and put his arms round her neck. They clasped each other tightly. The doctor winced to watch her hands. It's all right, Auntie Hester, said Reggie. I love you just the same, and you must not cry any more. For Hester's tears were falling at last, quenching the wild fire in her eyes. My little treasure, my little mouse, she said, over and over again, kissing his face and hands and little brown overcoat. Then all in a moment her face altered, her agonised eyes turned to the doctor. In an instant Dr Brown's hand was over Reggie's eyes and he hurried him out of the room. Take him out of hearing, he whispered to the bishop and darted back. Hester was tearing the bandages off her hands. I don't know what has happened to you, well, but my hands hurt me so that I can't bear it. Thank God, said the old doctor, blowing his nose. End of chapter 42Chapter 43 of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 43. The devil has no stancher ally than want of perception. Philip A. Wicksteed. It takes two to speak truth, one to speak and another to hear. Thoreau. Mrs. Gressley had passed an uncomfortable day. In the afternoon, all the Pratts had called, and Mr. Gressley, who departed early in the afternoon for Southminster, had left his wife no directions as to how to act in this unforeseen occurrence, or how to parry the questions with which she was overwhelmed. After long hesitation, she at last owned that Hester had returned to Southminster in the bishop's carriage, not more than half an hour after it had brought her back. "'I can't explain Hester's actions,' she would only repeat over and over again. I don't pretend to understand clever people. I'm not clever myself. I can only say Hester went back to Southminster directly she arrived here. Hardly had the Pratts taken their departure when Doll Loftus was ushered in. His wife had sent him to ask where Hester was, as Fräulein had alarmed her earlier in the day. Doll at least asked no questions. He'd never asked but one in his life, and that had been of his wife five seconds before he had become engaged to her. He accepted with equanimity the information that Hester had returned to Southminster, and departed to impart the same to his exasperated wife. "'But why did she go back? She had only that moment arrived,' inquired Sybil. "'How should Doll know? She, Sybil, had said she would not rest till she knew where Hester was, and he, Doll, had walked to Warmington through the snowdrifts to find out for her. And he had found out, and now she wanted to know something else.' There was no satisfying some women, and the injured husband retired to unlace his boots. Yes, Mrs. Gresley had passed an uncomfortable day. She had ventured out for a few minutes, and had found Abel, with his arms akimbo, contemplating the little gate which led to the stables. It was lying on the ground. He had swept the snow off it. I looked it up the same as usual last night, he said to Mrs. Gresley. There's been somebody about as has it off its hinges. Yeah, nothing has been touched, the coal nor the stack. It doesn't seem natural twisting the gate off for nothing. Mrs. Cresty did not answer. She did not associate Hester with the gate, but she was too much perturbed to care about such small matters at the moment. His lordship's coachman tells me as Miss Cresty was at the palace, continued Abel, while I was a hotting up his mash for him, for William had gone in with a note, and once he's in the kitchen, the animals might be starts and stones for what he cares. He said his nevy, that footman, heard the front doorbell ring just as he was getting into bed last night. 
of Miss Christie coming without her hat, with the snow upon her. The coachman says that she must have run afoot all the way. Abel looked anxiously at Mrs. Gressley. I was just thinking, he said, as perhaps the little lady wasn't quite right in her head. They do say as too much learning flies to the head, the same as spirits to them as ain't manure to do em. And the little lady does work desperate hard. Not as hard as Mr. Gressley, said Mrs. Gressley. Uh, maybe not, ma'am, maybe not. When I come up when Red Cow was sick at four in the morning, or maybe earlier, there was always a light in her window, and the shadow of her face again the blind. Here yeah, she do work precious hard. Mrs. Cressy retreated into the house, picking her way over the debris of the porch. At any other time, its demise would have occupied the minds of the vicarage household for days. But until this moment, it had hardly claimed the tribute of a sigh. Mrs. Cressy did sigh as she crossed the threshold. That prostrate porch meant expense. She had understood from her husband that Dick had wantonly torn out the clamp that supported it, and that the whole thing had in consequence given way under the first snowfall. He meant no harm, Mr. Gresty had added, but I suppose in the colonies they mistake horseplay for wit. Mrs. Gresty went back into the drawing room and sat down to her needlework. She was an exquisite needlewoman, but all the activity of her untiring hands was hardly able to stem the type of mending that was ever flowing in upon her. When was she to find time to finish the darling little garments which the new baby required? Fräulein had been kind in helping, but Fräulein's eyes are not very strong, or her stitches in consequence very small. Mrs. Gressy would have liked to sit in the schoolroom when lessons were over, but Fräulein had been so distant at luncheon about the rissole that he had not the courage to go in. So she sat and stitched with a heavy heart, awaiting her husband's return. The fly was another expense. Southminster was ten miles from Warpington, eleven according to the Loftus Arms from which it issued, the owner of which was not on happy terms with his teetotal vicar. Yet it had been absolutely necessary to have the fly, in order that Reggie, who so easily caught cold, might return in safety. The dusk was already falling, and more snow with it. It was quite dark when Mrs. Gressley at last caught the sound of wheels, and hurried to the door. Mr. Gressley came in, bearing Reggie, fast asleep in a fur rug, and laid him carefully on the sofa, and then went out to have an altercation with the driver, who demurred in forcible language to the arrangement adhered to by Mr. Gressley, that the cost of the fly should be considered as part payment of certain arrears of tithe, which in those days it was the unhappy duty of the clergyman to collect himself. Mr. Gressy's methods of dealing with money matters generally brought in a high rate of interest in the way of friction, and it was a long time before the driver drove away, turning his horse deliberately on the little patch of lawn under the dining-room windows. Reggie, in the meantime, had waked up, and was having tea in the drawing-room as a great treat. He had much to tell about his expedition, how the bishop had given him half a crown, and Uncle Dick had taken him into the town to spend it, and how after dinner he'd ridden on Uncle Dick's back. And Auntie Hester, how was she? She was very well, and she, she cried a little. I did not stay long, because Mr Bishop was wanted to give me the half-crown, and he kept it downstairs. And when I went in again, she was in bed, and she was so sleepy, she hardly said anything at all. Mr Gresty came in wearily and dropped into a chair. Mrs Gresty gave him his tea, and presently took Reggie upstairs. Then she came back and sat down in a low chair close to her husband. It was the first drop of comfort in Mr. Gressley's cup today. How is Hester? According to Dr. Brown, she is very ill, said Mr. Gressley in an extinguished voice. But they would not let me see her. Not see her own brother, my dear James, you should have insisted. I did, but it was of no use. You know how angry Dr. Brown gets at the least opposition. And the bishop backed him up. They said it would excite her. I never heard of such a thing. What is the matter with her? Shock, Dr. Brown calls it. They have been afraid of collapse all day, but she is better this evening. They seem to think a great deal of her knowing Reggie. Did the little lamb forgive her? Oh, yes. He kissed her, and she knew him, and cried. 
and it seems her hands are severely burned. They have got a nurse, and they have telegraphed for Miss West. The bishop was very good to Reggie, and gave him that fur rug. They looked at the splendid blue fox rug on the sofa. I am afraid, said Mrs Cressley after a pause, that Hester did run all the way to Southminster, as the bishop said. Abel said the bishop's coachman told him that she came late last night to the palace, and she was white with snow when the footman let her in. My dear, I should have thought you were too sensible to listen to servants' gossip, said Mr. Cressley impatiently. Your own common sense will tell you that Hester never performed that journey on foot. I told Dr. Brown the same, but he lost his temper at once. It's curious how patient he is in a sick room and how furious he can be out of it. He was very angry with me, too, because when he mentioned to the bishop in my presence that Hester was under morphia, I said I strongly objected to her being drugged. When I repeated that morphia was a most dangerous drug, with effects worse than intoxication, in fact that morphia was a form of intoxication, he positively, before the bishop, shook his fist in my face and said he was not going to be taught his business by me. The bishop took me away into the study. Dick Vernon was sitting there. At least he was creeping about on all fours with Reggie on his back. I think he must be in love with Hester. He asked so anxiously if there was any change. He would not speak to me, pretending not to know me. I suppose the bishop had told him about the porch, and he was afraid I should come on him for repairs, as he had tampered with it. The bishop sent them away, and said he wanted to have a talk with me. The bishop himself was the only person who was kind. There was a long pause. Mrs. Cressley laid her soft cheek against her husband's, and put her small hand in a protecting manner over his large one. It was not surprising that on the following Sunday Mr. Cressley said such beautiful things about women being pillows against which weary masculine athletes could rest. He spoke very nicely of you, went on Mr. Gresley at last. He said he appreciated your goodness in letting Reggie go after what had happened, and your offer to come and nurse Hester yourself. And then he spoke about me, and he said he knew well how devoted I was to my work, and how anything I did for the church was a real labour of love, and that my heart was in my work. It is quite true, so it is, said Mrs. Gresley. I never thought he understood me so well and he went on to say that he knew I must be dreadfully anxious about my sister, but that as far as money was concerned, I had offered to pay for nurse, I was to put all anxiety off my mind, he would take all responsibility about the illness, he said he had a little fund laid by for emergencies of this kind, and that he could not spend it better than on Hester, whom he loved like his own child. Then he went on to speak of Hester. I don't remember what he said when he turned off about her, but he spoke of her as if she were a person quite out of the common. You always did spoil her, said Mrs. Cressley. He went off on a long rigmarole about her and her talent, and how vain he and I should be if leading articles appeared in the spectator about us as they did about her. I did not know there had been anything of the kind, but he said everyone else did. And then he went on more slowly that Hester was under a foolish hallucination, as groundless, no doubt, as that she had caused Reggie's death, that her book was destroyed. He said, It is this idea which has got firm hold of her, but which has momentarily passed off her mind in her anxiety about Reggie, which has caused her illness. And then he looked at me. He seemed really quite shaky. He held on to a chair. I think his health is breaking. What did you say? I said the truth, that it was no hallucination but the fact. But much as I regretted to say so, Hester had written a profane and immoral book, and that I had felt it my duty to burn it, and a very painful duty it had been. I said he would have done the same if he had read it. I'm glad you said that. Well, the awkward part was that he said he had read it, every word, and that he considered it the finest book that had been written in his day. And then he began to walk up and down and to become rather excited to say that he could not understand how I could take upon myself such a responsibility or on what grounds I considered myself a judge of literature. 
as if I ever did consider myself a judge. But I do know right from wrong. He got on all right up till then, especially when he spoke so cordially of you and me. But directly he made a personal matter of Hester's book, setting his opinion against mine, for he repeated over and over again it was a magnificent book. His manner seemed to change. He tried to speak kindly, but all the time I saw that my considering the book bad, while he thought it good, gravelled him and made him feel annoyed with me. The truth is, he can't bear anyone to think differently from himself. He always was like that, said the comforter. I said I supposed he thought it right to run down the clergy and hold them up to ridicule. He said, certainly not, but he did not see how that applied to anything in Hester's book. He said, she has drawn us, without bias towards us, exactly as we appear to three-quarters of the laity. It won't do us any harm to see ourselves for once as others see us. There is in these days an increasing adverse criticism of us in many men's minds, to which your sister's mild rebukes are as nothing. We have drawn it upon ourselves, not so much by our conduct, which I believe to be uniformly above reproach, or by any lack of zeal, as by our ignorance of our calling, by our inability to convert life into to truth, the capital secret of our profession, as I was once told as a divinity student. I, for one, believe that the Church will regain her prestige and her hold on the heart of the nation, but if she does, it will be mainly due to a new element in the minds of the clergy, a stronger realisation, not of our responsibilities, we have that, but of the education, the personal search for truth, the knowledge of human nature, which are necessary to enable us to meet them. He went on a long time about that. I think he grows very wordy, but I did not argue with him. I let him say what he liked. I knew that I must be obedient to my bishop, just as I should expect my clergy to be to me, if I ever am a bishop myself. Not that I expect I ever shall be. Mr. Gresty was overtired. But it seemed to me, as he talked about the book, that all the time, though he put me down to the highest motives, he did me that justice. He was trying to make me own I had done wrong. You didn't say so, said the little wife hotly. My dear, need you ask? but I did say at last that I had consulted with Archdeacon Thursby on the matter, and he had strongly advised me to do as I did. The bishop seemed thunderstruck. And then, it really seemed providential, who should come in but Archdeacon Thursby himself? The bishop went straight up to him and said, You come as a fortunate moment, for I am greatly distressed at the burning of Miss Gresty's book, and Gresty tells me that you advised it. Would you believe it? said Mr. Gresley, in a strangled voice. The Archdeacon actually denied it then and there. He said he did not know Hester had written a book and had never been consulted on the subject. The tears forced themselves out of Mr. Gresley's eyes. He was exhausted and overwrought. He sobbed against his wife's shoulder. Wicked liar, whispered Mrs. Gresley into his party. Wicked, wicked man. Oh, James, I never thought the Archdeacon could have behaved like that. Nor I, gasped Mr. Gresley, but he did. I suppose he did not want to offend the bishop, and when I expostulated with him and reminded him of what he had advised only the day before, he said that was about a letter, not a book, as if it mattered which it was. It was the principle that mattered. But they neither of them would listen to me. I said I had offered to help to rewrite it, the bishop became quite fierce. He said I might as well try to rewrite Reggie if he were in his coffin. And then he mentioned, casually, as if it were quite an afterthought, that Hester had sold it for a thousand pounds. All through I knew he was really trying to hurt my feelings, in spite of his manner, but when he said that, he succeeded. Mr. Gresley groaned. A thousand pounds, said Mrs. Gresley, turning white. Oh, it isn't possible. He said he'd seen the publisher's letter offering it and that Hester had accepted it by his advice. He seemed to know all about her affairs. When he said that, I, I was so distressed I could not help showing it. And he made rather light of it, saying the money loss was the least serious part of the whole affair. But, of course, it is the worst. 
poor Hester, when I think that owing to me she had lost a thousand pounds, seventy pounds a year, if I had invested it for her, and I know of several good investments, all perfectly safe at seven per cent. When I think of it, it makes me absolutely miserable. We won't talk of it any more. The bishop sat with his head in his hands for a long time after the archdeacon had gone, and afterwards he was quite kindly again, and said he we looked at the subject from such different points of view that perhaps there was no use in discussing it. And we talked of the church congress until the fly came, only he seemed dreadfully tired, quite knocked up. And he promised to let us know first thing tomorrow morning how Hester was. He was cordial when we left. I think he meant well. But I can never feel the same to Archdeacon Thursby again. He was quite my greatest friend among the clergy round here. I suppose I shall learn in time not to have such a high ideal of people, but I certainly thought very highly of him until today. Mr. Gresty sat upright and put away his handkerchief with decision. One thing this miserable day has taught us, he said, and that is that we must part with Fraulein. If she is to become impertinent the first moment we are in trouble, such a thing is not to be borne. We could not possibly keep her after her behaviour today. End of chapter 43Chapter 44 of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 44. If two lives join, there is oft a scar. Robert Browning. Rachel left Westhope Abbey the day after Lord Newhaven's funeral and returned to London. And the day after that, Hugh came to see her and proposed and was accepted. He had gone over in his mind a hundred times all that he should say to her on that occasion. If he had said all that he was fully resolved to say, it is hardly credible that any woman, however well disposed towards him, would have accepted so tedious a suitor. What he really said, in a hoarse, inaudible voice, was, Rachel, will you marry me? He was looking so intently into a little grove of Roman hyacinths that perhaps the hyacinths heard what he said. At any rate, she did not. But she supposed from long experience that he was proposing, and she said yes immediately. She had not intended to say so, at least not at first. She had made up her mind that it would be only right to inform him that she was fourteen months older than he. She looked him out in Burke, where she herself was not to be found. That she was old enough to be his mother. Also, that she was of a cold, revengeful temper, not calculated to make a home happy, and several other odious traits of character which she had never dreamed of confiding to any of the regiment of her previous lovers. But the only word she had breath to say when the time came was yes. Rachel had shivered and hesitated on the brink of a new love long enough. Her anxiety about Hugh had unconsciously undermined her resistance. His confession had given her instantly the confidence in him which had been wanting. It is not perfection that we look for in our fellow creatures, but for what is apparently rarer, a little plain dealing. How they rise before us, the sweet, reproachful faces of those whom we could have loved devotedly if they had been willing to be straightforward with us, whom we have lost not by our own will, but by that paralysis of feeling which gradually invades the heart at the discovery of small insincerities. Sincerity seems our only security against losing those who love us, the only cup in which those who are worth keeping will care to pledge us when youth is past. Rachel was not by nature de celle qui se jette dans l'amour comme dans un précipice, but she shut her eyes, recommended her soul to God, and threw herself over. She had climbed down once, with assistance, and she was not going to do that again. That she found herself alive at the bottom was a surprise to her, but a surprise that was quickly forgotten in the constant wonder that Hugh could love her as devotedly as it was obvious he did. Women would have shared that wonder, but not men. 
There was a home ready-made in Rachel's faithful, dog-like eyes, which at once appealed to the desire of expansion of empire in the heart of the free-born Britain. He had, until lately, considered woman as connected with the downward slope of life. He would have loudly disclaimed such an opinion if it had been attributed to him, but nevertheless it was the keynote of his behaviour towards them, his belief concerning them which was of a piece with his cheap cynicism and dilettante views of life. He now discovered that woman was made out of something more than man's spare rib. It's probable that if he had never been in love with Lady Newhaven, he would never have loved Rachel. He would have looked at her, as many men did, with a view to marriage, and would probably have dismissed her from his thoughts as commonplace. He knew better now. It was Lady Newhaven who was commonplace. His worldliness was dropping from him day by day as he learned to know Rachel better. Where was his cynicism now that she loved him? His love for her, humble, triumphant, definite, passionate, impatient by turns, now exacting, now selfless, possessed him entirely. He remembered once with astonishment that he was making a magnificent match. He had never thought of it, as Rachel knew, as she knew well. December came in bleak and dark. The snow did its poor best, laying day after day its white veil upon the dismal streets. But it was misunderstood. It was scraped into murky heaps. It melted and then froze and then melted again. And London groaned and shivered on its daily round. Every afternoon Hugh came, and every morning Rachel made her rooms bright with flowers for him. The flower shop at the corner sent her tiny trees of white lilac and sweet little united families of harsons and tulips. The time of azaleas was not yet, and once he sent her a bunch of daffodils. He knew best how he had obtained them. Their wild, sweet faces peered at Rachel, and she sat down, faint and dizzy, holding them in her nerveless hands. If one daffodil knows anything... All daffodils know it to the third and fourth generation. Where is he? they said, that man whom you loved once. We were there when he spoke to you. We saw you stand together by the attic window. We never say but we heard, we remember. And you cried for joy at nights afterwards. We never say, but we heard, we remember. Rachel's secretary in the little room on the ground floor was interrupted by a tap at the door. Rachel came in laden with daffodils. Their splendour filled the grey room. Would you mind having them? she said, smiling, and laying them down by her. And would you kindly write a line to Jones, telling him not to send me daffodils again? They are a flower I particularly dislike. Rachel, Hugh, don't you think it would be better if we married immediately? Better than what? Oh, I don't know. Better than breaking it off. You can't break it off now. I'm not a person to be trifled with. You've gone too far. If you gave me half your attention, you would understand that I am only expressing a wish to go a little further. But you've become so frivolous since we've been engaged that I hardly recognise you. I suit myself to my company. Are you going to talk to me in that flippant manner when we are married? I sometimes fear, Rachel, you don't look upon me with sufficient awe. I foresee I shall have to be very firm when we are married. When may I begin to be firm? Are these such evil days, Hugh? I am like Oliver Twist, he said. I want more. They were sitting together one afternoon in the firelight in silence. They often sat in silence together. A wise woman once advised me said Rachel at last, if I married, never to tell my husband of any previous attachment. She said, let him always believe that he was the first that ever burst into that silent sea. I believe it was good advice, but it seems to me to have one drawback. To follow it may be to tell a lie. It would be in my case. Silence. I know that a lie and an adroit appeal to the vanity of man are supposed to be a woman's recognised weapons. The same woman told me 
that I might find myself mistaken in many things in this world, but never in counting on the vanity of man. She said, that was a reed which would never pierce my hand. I don't think you are vain, Hugh. Not vain? Why, I'm so conceited at the fact that you are going to marry me that I look down on everyone else. I only long to tell them so. When may I tell my mother, Rachel? She's coming to London this week. You have the pertinacity of a fly. You always come back to, to the same point. I'm beginning to be rather bored with your marriage. You can't talk of anything else. I can't think about anything else. He drew her cheek against his. He was an ingratiating creature. Neither can I, she whispered. And that was all Rachel ever said of all she meant to say about Mr. Tristram. A yellow fog. It made rings round the shaded electric lamp by which Rachel was reading. The fire burned tawny and blurred. Even her red gown looked dim. Hugh came in. What are you reading? he said, sitting down by her. He did not want to know, but if you are reading a book on another person's knee, you cannot be a very long way off. He glanced with feigned interest at the open page, stooping a little, for he was short-sighted now and then, at least now. Rachel took the opportunity to look at him. You can't really look at a person when he is looking at you. Hugh was very handsome, especially side-face, and he knew it but he was not sure whether Rachel thought so. He read mechanically. Take back your vows. Elsewhere you trimmed and taught those lamps to burn. You bring them stale and dim to serve my turn. You lit those candles in another shrine. Guttered and cold you offer them on mine. Take back your vows. A shadow fell across Hugh's mind. Rachel saw it fall. You do not think that of me, Rachel, he said, pointing to the verse. It was the first time he had alluded to that halting confession which had remained branded on the minds of both. He glanced up at her, and she suffered him for a moment to look through her clear eyes into her soul. I never thought that of you, she said with difficulty. I am so foolish that I believe the candles are lit now for the first time. I am so foolish that I believe you love me nearly as much as I love you. It is a dream, said Hugh passionately, and he fell on his knees and hid his white face against her knee. It is a dream. I shall wake and find you never cared for me. She sat for a moment stunned by the violence of his emotion, which was shaking him from head to foot. Then she drew him into her trembling arms and held his head against her breast. She felt his tears through her gown. "'What is past will never come between us,' she said brokenly, at last. "'I have cried over it too, Hugh, but I have put it from my mind. "'When you told me about it, no, you risked losing me by telling me. I, "'I suddenly trusted you entirely. "'I had not quite up till then. "'I can't say why, except that perhaps I had grown suspicious "'because I was once deceived.' But I do now, because you were open with me. I think you, you and I can dare to be truthful to each other. You have been so to me, and I will be so to you. I knew about that long before you told me. Lady Newhaven, poor thing, confided in me last summer. She had to tell someone. I think you ought to know that I know. And oh, Hugh, I knew about the drawing of lots, too. Hugh started violently, but he did not move. Would she have recognised that ashen, convulsed face if he had raised it? Lady Newhaven listened at the door when you were drawing lots, and she told me. But we never knew which had drawn the short lighter till Lord Newhaven was killed on the line. Only she and I, and you, know that that was not an accident. I know what you must have gone through all the summer, feeling you had taken his life as well. But you must remember it was his own doing, and had a perfectly even chance. You ran the same risk. His blood is on his own head. But, oh, my darling, when I think it might have been you. Hugh thought afterwards that if her arms had not been round him, 
if he'd been a little distance from her, he might have told her the truth. He owed it to her, this woman, who was the very soul of truth. But if she had withdrawn from him, however gently, in the moment when her tenderness had, for the first time, vanquished her natural reserve, if she had taken herself away then, he could not have borne it. In deep repentance after Lord Newhaven's death, he had vowed that, that from that day forward he would never deviate again from the path of truth and honour, however difficult it might prove. But this frightful moment had come upon him unawares. He drew back instinctively, giddy and unnerved, as from a chasm yawning suddenly among the flowers, one step in front of him. He was too stunned to think. When he rallied, they were standing together on the hearthrug, and she was saying, he did not know what she was saying, for he was repeating over and over again to himself, the moment is past, the moment is past. At last her words conveyed some meaning to him. We will never speak of this again, my friend, she said, but now that no harm can be done by it, it seemed right to tell you I knew. I ought never to have drawn, said Hugh hoarsely. No, said Rachel, he was in fault to demand such a thing. It was inhuman. But having once drawn, he had to abide by it, as you would have done if you had drawn the short lighter. She was looking earnestly at him, as at one given back from the grave. Yes, said Hugh, feeling she expected him to speak. If I had drawn it, I should have had to abide by it. I thank God continually that you did not draw it. You made him the dreadful reparation he asked. If it recalled upon himself, you were not to blame. You have done wrong, and you have repented. You have suffered, Hugh. I know it by your face. And perhaps I have suffered, too. But that is past. We will shut up the past and think of the future. Promise me that you will never speak of this again. I promise, said Hugh, mechanically. The moment to speak is past, he said to himself. Had it ever been present? End of chapter 44Chapter 45 of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 45 Dieu n'oublie personne. Il visite tout le monde. Vinay. Hugh did not sleep that night. His escape had been too narrow. He shivered at the mere thought of it. It had never struck him as possible that Rachel and Lady Newhaven had known of the drawing of lots. Now that he found they knew, sundry small incidents unnoticed at the time came crowding back to his memory. That was why Lady Newhaven had written so continually those letters which he had burned unread. That was why she had made that desperate attempt to see him in the smoking-room at Wilderley after the boating accident. She wanted to know which had drawn the straw lighter. That explained the mysterious tension which Hugh had noticed in Rachel during the last days in London before, before the time was up. He saw it all now. And, of course, they naturally supposed that Lord Newhaven had committed suicide. They could not think otherwise. They were waiting for one of the two men to do it. If Lord Newhaven had not turned giddy and stumbled onto the line, if he had not died by accident when he did, said Hugh to himself, where should I be now? There was no answer to that question. What was the use of asking it? He was dead. Unfortunately, the two women firmly believed he had died by his own hand. Hugh as firmly believed that the death was accidental. But it could not be his duty to set them right to rake up the whole hideous story again. By an extraordinary, by a miraculous chance, he was saved, as it were, a second time. It could do no good to allude to the dreadful subject again. Besides, he had promised Rachel never to speak of it again. He groaned and hid his face in his hands. Oh, coward and wretch that I am, he said. Cannot I even be honest with myself? I lied to her today. I, I never thought I could have told Rachel a lie, but I did. I can't live without her. I must have her. I would rather die than lose her now. And I should have lost her if I told her the truth. I felt that. 
I am not worthy. It was an ill day for her when she took my tarnished life into her white hand. She ought to have trodden me underfoot. But she does love me, and I will never deceive her again. She does love me. God helping me, I will make her happy. The strain of conflict was upon Hugh. The old, old conflict of the seed with the earth, of the soul with love. How many little fibres and roots the seed puts out, pushed by an unrecognised need within itself, not without pain, not without a gradual rending of its being, not without a death unto self into a higher life. Love was dealing with Hugh's soul as the earth deals with the seed, and he suffered. It was as a man who did not look like an accepted lover who presented himself at Rachel's door the following afternoon. But Rachel was not there. Her secretary handed Hugh a little note which she had left for him, telling him that Hester had suddenly fallen ill and that she had been sent for to Southminster. The note ended, These first quiet days are past, so now you may tell your mother and put our engagement in the morning post. Hugh was astonished at the despair which overwhelmed him at the bare thought that he should not see Rachel that day, and not the next either. It was not to be borne. She had no right to make him suffer like this. Day by day, when a certain restless fever returned upon him, he had known, as an opium eater knows, that at a certain hour he should become rested and calm and sane once more. To be in the same room with Rachel, to hear her voice, to let his eye dwell upon her, to lean his forehead for a moment against her hand, was to enter, as we enter in dreams, a world of joy and comfort, and boundless, endless, all-pervading peace. And now he was suddenly left shivering in a bleak world without her. With her he was himself, a released, freed self, growing daily further and further away from all he had once been. Without her, he felt he was nothing but a fierce, wounded animal. He tried to laugh at himself as he walked slowly away from Rachel's house. He told himself that he was absurd, that an absence of a few days was nothing. He turned his steps mechanically in the direction of his mother's lodgings. At any rate, he could tell her. He could talk about this cruel woman to her. The smart was momentarily soothed by his mother's painful joy. He wrenched himself somewhat out of himself as she wept the tears of jealous love, which all mothers must weep when the woman comes who takes their son away. I'm so glad, she kept repeating. These are tears of joy, Huey. I can forgive her for accepting you, but I should never have forgiven her if she had refused you, if she had made my boy miserable. And you have been miserable lately. I've seen it for a long time. I suppose it was all this coming on. He said it was. The remembrance of other causes of irritation and moodiness had slipped entirely off his mind. He stayed a long time with his mother, who pressed him to wait till his sister, who was shopping, returned. But his sister tarried long out of doors, and at last the pain of Rachel's absence returning on him, he left suddenly, promising to return in the evening. He did not go back to his rooms. He wandered aimlessly through the darkening streets, impatient of the slow hours. At last he came out on the embankment. The sun was setting redly, frostily, in a grey world of sky mist and river mist and spectral bridge and spire. A shaking pathway of pale flame came across the grey of the hidden river to meet him. He stood a long time looking at it. The low sun touched and forsook, touched and forsook point by point the little crowded world which it was leaving. My poor mother, said Hugh to himself, poor gentle loving soul whom I so nearly brought down with sorrow to the grave. She will never know what an escape she has had. I might have been more to her, I might have made her happier, seeing her happiness is wrapped up in me. I will make up to her for it. I will be a better son to her in future. Rachel and I together will make her last years happy. Rachel and I together, said Hugh, over and over again. And then he suddenly remembered that though Rachel had taken herself away, he could write to her, and he might look out the trains to Southminster. He leaped into a hansom and hurried back to his rooms. 
the porter met him in a mysterious manner in the entrance. Lady waiting to see him. Lady said she was his sister. Had been waiting two hours. In his rooms now. Hugh laughed and ran up the wide common staircase. His sister had heard the news from his mother and had rushed over her once. As he stooped a little to fit the latch key on his chain into the lock, a man, who was coming down the stairs, feeling in his pockets, stopped with a sudden exclamation. It was Captain Pratt, padded, smiling, hair newly varnished, resplendent in a magnificent fur overcoat. What luck, he said. Scarlet, I think. We, we met at Wilderley. Have you such a thing as a match about you? Hugh felt in his pockets. He had not one. Never mind, he said, opening the door. I have plenty inside. Come in. Hugh went in first, extricating his key. Captain Pratt followed, murmuring, Nice little dens, these. Pat of mine lives just above. Streatham. You know Streatham, son of Lord? The remainder of the sentence was lost. The door opened straight into the little sitting-room. A woman in deep mourning rose suddenly out of a chair by the fire and came towards them. Huey, she said. It was Lady Newhaven. It is probable that none of the tableaux she had arranged were quite so dramatic as this one, in which she had not reckoned on that elaborate figure in the doorway. Captain Pratt's opinion of Hugh, whom he had hitherto regarded as a pauper with an involved estate, leaped from temperate to summer heat, blood heat. After the first instant, he kept his eyes steadily fixed on Hugh. I, uh, uh, thank you, Scarlet. I, I found my matches. A, a thousand thanks. Good night. He was disappearing, but Hugh, his eyes flashing in his grey face, held him forcibly by the arm. Lady Newhaven, he said, the, the porter is inexcusable. These are my rooms, which he has shown you into by mistake, not Mr. Streatham's, your nephew. He is just above. I think, turning to Captain Pratt, Streatham is out of town. He is out of town said Captain Pratt, looking with cold admiration at Hugh. Admirable, he said to himself. A born gentleman. This is not the first time Stratton's visitors have been shown in here, continued Hugh. The porter shall be dismissed. I trust you will forgive me my share in the annoyance he has caused you. Is your carriage waiting? No, said Lady Newhaven faintly, quite thrown off the lines of her prepared scene by the sudden intrusion into it of a foreign body. "'My handsome is below,' said Captain Pratt, deferentially, venturing now that the situation was, so to speak, draped, to turn his discreet, agate eyes towards Lady Newhaven. "'If it could be the least use, I, I myself should prefer to walk.' Now that he looked at her, he looked very hard at her. She was a beautiful woman. Lady Newhaven's self-possession returned sufficiently for her to take up her fur cloak. "'Thank you.' she said, letting Captain Pratt help her on with it. I shall be glad to make use of your handsome, if you are sure you can spare it. I am shocked at having taken possession of your rooms, turning to Hugh. I have a right to Georgie Stratham tonight. I am staying with my mother, and I came across to ask him to take my boys to the pantomime, as I, I cannot take them myself so soon, with a glance at her crepe. Don't come down, Mr. Scarlet. I have given you enough trouble already. Captain Pratt's arm was crooked. He conducted her in his best manner to the foot of the staircase and helped her into his hansom. His manner was not so unctuous as his father's, but it was slightly adhesive. Lady Newhaven shuddered involuntarily as she took his arm. Hugh followed. "'I hope you will both come and see my mother,' she said with an attempt at graciousness. "'You know Lady Trentham, I think,' to Captain Pratt. Uh, "'Very slightly.' No, oh, de delighted, murmured Captain Pratt, closing the handsome door in an intimate manner. And if I could be of the least use at any time in taking your boys to the pantomime, <laughs> only too glad. At last, Diane Richards. The handsome with its splendid bay horse rattled off. Captain Pratt nodded to Hugh, who was still standing on the steps, and turned away to buy a box of matches from a passing urchin. Then he turned up his fur collar, and proceeded leisurely on his way. Very standoff, both of them in the past, he said to himself. Well, they'll have to be civil in future. I wonder if it will make her keep her title. It used to awkward for them both, though, only a month after New Haven's death. 
I wish that sort of contretemps would happen to me when I'm bringing in a lot of fellows suddenly. An enemy like that is all I wanted to give me a start, and I should get on as well as anybody. The aristocracy all hang together, whatever Selina and Ada may say. Money don't buy everything, as the governor thinks. But when you're once in with them, you're in. Hugh went back to his room and locked himself in. He was a delicate man, highly strung, and he had not slept the night before. He collapsed into a chair and remained a long time, his head in his hands. It was too horrible. This woman coming back upon him suddenly like the ghost of someone whom he had murdered. His momentary infatuation had been clean forgotten in his overwhelming love for Rachel. His intrigue with Lady Newhaven seemed so long ago that it had been relegated to the same mental shelf in his mind as the nibbling of a certain forbidden gingerbread when he was home for his first holidays. He could not be held responsible for either offence after this immense interval of time. It was not he who had committed them, but that other embryo self, that envelope of flesh and sense which he was beginning to abhor, through which he had passed before he reached himself, Hugh, the real man, the man who loved Rachel, and whom Rachel loved. He had not flinched when he came unexpectedly on Lady Newhaven. At the sight of her, a sudden passion of anger shot up and enveloped him as in one flame, from head to foot. His love for Rachel was a weapon, and he used it. He did not greatly care about his own good name, but the good name of the man whom Rachel loved was a thing to fight for. It was for her sake, not Lady Newhaven's, that he had concocted the story of the mistaken rooms. He should not have had the presence of mind if Rachel had not been concerned. He had not finished with Lady Newhaven. He should have trouble yet with her, hideous scenes, in which the corpse of his dead lust would be dragged up, a thing to shudder at, out of its netly grave. He could bear it. He must bear it. Nothing would induce him to marry Lady Newhaven, as she evidently expected. He set his teeth. She will know the day after tomorrow, he said to himself, when she sees my engagement to Rachel in the papers. Then she will get at me somehow and make my life a hell to me while she can. And she will try and come between me and Rachel. I deserve it. I deserve anything I get. But Rachel knows and will stick to me. I will go down to her tomorrow. I can't go on without seeing her. And she won't mind, as the engagement will be given out next day. He became more composed at the thought of Rachel. But presently his lip quivered. It would be all right in the end. But, oh, not to have done it, not to have done it, to have come to his marriage with a whiter past, not to need her forgiveness on the very threshold of their life together, not to have been unfaithful to her before he knew her. What man who has disbelieved in his youth in the sanctity of love, and then later has knelt in its holy of holies, has escaped that pang? End of chapter 45Chapter 46 of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 46 There's neither honesty, manhood, nor good fellowship in thee. Shakespeare My mind misgives me, Dick, said the bishop, a day or two later, as Dick joined him and his sister and Rachel at luncheon at the palace. I am convinced that you have been up to some mischief. I have just returned from Morpington, my lord. I understood it was your wish I should ride over and tell them Hester was better. It certainly was my wish. I am very much obliged to you. But I remembered after you had gone that you had refused to speak to Gresley when he was over here, and I was sorry I sent you. I spoke to him all right, said Dick grimly. That was why I was so alacritous to go. The bishop looked steadily at him. Until you are my suffragan, I should prefer to manage my own business with my clergy. Just so, said Dick, helping himself to mustard. But you see, I'm his cousin, and I thought it just as well to let him know quietly and dispassionately what I thought of him. So I told him I was not particular about my acquaintances. I knew lots of bad eggs out in Australia, half of them hatched in England. Chaps had been shaved and tubbed gratis by government. In fact, I had a large visiting list, but that I drew the line at such a cad as him. 
and that he might remember I wasn't going to preach for him at any more of his little cold-water cures. A smile hovered on Dick's crooked mouth. Or ever take any notice of him in future. That was what he wanted, my lord. You were too soft with him, if you'll excuse my saying so. But that sort of chap wants it given him hot and strong. Doesn't understand anything else. He gets quite beyond himself, fizzing about on his little pocket handkerchief of a parish, thinking he's a sort of god because no one makes it their business to keep him in his place and rub it into him that he is an infernal fool. That is why some clergymen jaw so, because they never have it brought home to them what rot they talk. They'd be no sillier than other men if they were only treated properly. I was very calm, but I let him have it. I told him he was a mean sneak, and that either he was the biggest fool or the biggest rogue going, and that the mere fact of his cloth did not give him the right to do dishonest things with other people's property, though it did save him from the pounding he richly deserved. He tried to interrupt. Indeed, he was tooty all the time, like a foghorn. But I didn't take any notice, and I wound up by saying it was men like him who brought discredit on the church and on the clergy, and who made the gorge rise of decent traps like me. Yes, said Dick after a pause. When I left him, he understood. I don't say entirely, but he had a distant glimmering. It isn't often I go on these errands of mercy, but I felt that the least I could do was to back you up, my lord. Of course, it is in little matters like this that lay helpers come in who are not so hampered about their language as I suppose the clergy are. The bishop tried, he tried hard, to look severe but his mouth twitched. "'Don't thank me,' said Bishop. "'Nothing is a trouble where you are concerned. "'It was <laughs> a pleasure.' "'That I can believe,' said the Bishop. "'Well, Dick, Providence makes use of strange instruments. "'The jawbone of an ass has a certain scriptural prestige. "'I dare say you reached poor Gressley where I failed. "'I certainly failed. "'But if it is not too much to ask,' I should regard it as a favour another time, if I might be informed beforehand what direction your diocesan aid was about to take. Dr. Brown, who often came to luncheon at the palace, came in now. He took off his leathern driving gloves and held his hands to the fire. Cold, he said. They're skating everywhere. How is Miss Cressley? She knows us today, said Rachel, and she is quite cheerful. Does the poor thing know her book is burned? No, she was speaking this morning of its coming out in the spring. The little doctor thrust out his underlip and changed the subject. I travelled from Pottersbury this morning, he said, with that man who was nearly drowned at Bermere in the summer. I doctored him at Wilderley. Tall, thin, rather a fine gentleman. I, I forget his name. Dr. Brown always spoke of men above himself on the social scale as fine gentlemen. Mr. Redman, said Miss Keene, the bishop's sister, a dignified person who had been hampered throughout life by a predilection for the wrong name and by making engagements in illegible handwriting by last year's almanacs. Was it Mr. Scarlet? said Rachel, feeling Dick's lynx eyes upon her. I was at Wilderley when the accident happened. That's the man. He got out at Southminster and asked me which was the best hotel. No, I won't have any more, thanks. I'll go up and see Miss Cressley at once. Rachel followed the bishop into the library. They generally waited there together till the doctor came down. I don't know many young men I like better than Dick, said the bishop. I should marry him if I were a young woman. I admire the way he acts up to his principles. Very few of us do. Until he has a further light on the subject, he is right to knock a man down who insults him. And from this point of view, he was justified in speaking to Miss Gressley as he did. I was sorely tempted to say something of that kind to him myself. But as one grows grey, one realises that one can only speak in a spirit of love. A man of Dick's stamp will always be respected, because he does not assume virtues which belong to a higher grade than he is on at present. But when he reaches that higher grade, he will act as thoroughly upon the convictions that accompany it as he does now on his present convictions. He certainly would not turn the other cheek to the smiter. I should not advise the smiker to reckon on it. And unless it is turned from that rear sense of spiritual brotherhood, it would be unmanly to turn it. 
To imitate the outward appearance of certain virtues is like imitating the clothes of a certain class. It does not make us belong to the class to dress like it. The true foundation for the spiritual life, as far as I can see it, is in the full development of our human nature, with all its simple trusts and aspirations. I admire Dick's solid foundation. It will carry a building worthy of him some day. But my words of wisdom appear to be thrown away upon you. You are thinking of something else. I was thinking that I ought to tell you that I am engaged to be married. The bishop's face lit up. I am engaged to Mr. Scarlet. That is why he has come down here. The bishop's face fell. Rachel had been three days at the palace. Dick had not allowed the grass to grow under his feet. That admirable promptitude, the bishop had remarked to himself, deserves success. Poor dear Dick, he said softly. That is what Hester says. I told her yesterday. I really have a very high opinion of Dick, said the bishop. So have I. If I might have two, I would certainly choose him second. But this superfluous Mr. Scarlet comes first, eh? I'm afraid he does. Well, said the bishop with a sigh, if you are so ungrateful as to marry to please yourself instead of to please me, there is nothing more to be said. I will have a look at your Mr. Scarlet when he comes to tea. I suppose he will come to tea. I notice the most farouche men do when they are engaged. It is the first step in the turning process. I shall, of course, bring an entirely unprejudiced mind to bear upon him, as I always make a point of doing. But I warn you beforehand, I shan't like him. Because he is not Mr. Dick. Well, yes, because he is not Dick. I suppose his name is Bertie. Not Bertie, said Rachel indignantly. Hugh. It's a poor, inefficient kind of name, only four letters and a duplicate at each end. I don't think, my dear, he is worthy of you. Dick has only four letters. I make it a rule never to argue with women. Well, Rachel, I'm glad you have decided to marry. Heaven bless you, and may you be happy with this man. Ah, here comes Dr. Brown. Well, said the bishop and Rachel simultaneously. She's better, said the little doctor angrily. He was always angry when he was anxious. She's round the first corner, but how to put her round the next corner, that is what I'm thinking. Defer the next corner. We can't, now her mind is clear. She's as sane as you or I are, and a good deal sharper. When she asks you about her book, she'll have to be told. A lie would be quite justifiable under the circumstances. Of course, of course, but it would be useless. You might hoodwink her for a day or two, and then she would find out, first, that the magnum opus is gone, and secondly, that you and Miss West, whom she does trust entirely at present, have deceived her. You know what she is when she thinks she is being deceived. She abused you well, my lord, until you reinstated yourself by producing Reggie Gresley. But you can't reinstate yourself a second time. You can't produce the book. No, said the bishop, that is gone for ever. Rachel could not trust herself to speak. Perhaps she had realised more fully than even the bishop had done what the loss of the book was to Hester, at least what it would have been when she knew it was gone. Tell her, and give her that if she becomes excitable, said Dr. Brown, producing a minute bottle out of a voluminous pocket. And if you want me, I shall be at Canon Wilde's at five o'clock. I'll look in anyhow before I go home. Rachel and the bishop stood a moment in silence after he was gone, and then Rachel took up the little bottle, read the directions carefully, and turned to go upstairs. The bishop looked after her, but did not speak. He was sorry for her. You can go out till tea time, said Rachel to the nurse. I will stay with Miss Cresty till then. Esther was lying on a couch by the fire in a rose-coloured wrapper. Her small face, set in its ruffle of soft lace, looked bright and eager. Her hair had been cut short, and she looked younger and more like Reggie than ever. Her thin hands lay contentedly in her lap. The principal bandages were gone. Only three fingers of the right hand were in a chrysalis state. I shall not be in too great a hurry to get well, she said to Rachel. If I do, you will rush away to London and get married. Shall I? 
which was set down the little bottle on the mantelpiece. When is Mr. Scarlet coming down? He came down today. Then possibly he may call. Such things do happen. I should like to see him. In a day or two, perhaps. And I want to see dear Dick, too. He sent you his love. Mr. Pratt was here at luncheon yesterday, and he asked me who the old chap was who put on his clothes with a shoehorn. How like him. Has he said anything more to the bishop on the uses of swearing? No, but the bishop draws him on. He delights in him. Rachel, are you sure you have chosen the best man? Quite sure. I mean, I never had any choice in the matter. You see, I love Hugh, and I'm only fond of Mr. Dick. I always liked Mr. Scarlet, said Hester. I've known him ever since I came out, and that wasn't yesterday. He is so gentle and refined, and one need not be on one's guard in talking to him. He understands what one says, and he is charming-looking. Of course I think so. And this is the genuine thing, Rachel. Do you remember our talk last summer? Rachel was silent a moment. All I can say is, she said brokenly, that I thank God day and night that Mr. Tristram did not marry me, that I'm free to marry Hugh. Esther's uncrippled hand stole into Rachel's. Everybody will think, said Rachel, when they see the engagement in tomorrow's papers, that I give him everything because he is poor and his place involved. And of course I am horribly wealthy. But in reality, it is I who am poor and he who is rich. He has given me a thousand times more than I could ever give him. Because he has given me back the power of loving. It almost frightens me that I can care so much a second time. I should not have thought it possible, but I seem to have got the hang of it now, as Mr. Dick would say. I wish you were downstairs, Hester, as you will be in a day or two. You'd be amused by the way he shocks Miss Key. She asked if he had written anything on his travels, and he said he was on the point of bringing out a little book on cannibal cookery for the use of colonials. He said some of the recipes were very simple. He began, You take a hand and close it round a yam. But the bishop stopped him. The moment Rachel had said, He is on the point of bringing out a book, her heart stood still. How could she have said such a thing? But apparently Hester took no notice. He must have been experimenting on my poor hand, she said. I'm sure I never burned it like this myself. It will soon be better now. Well, I don't mind about it now that it doesn't hurt all the time. And your head does not ache today, does it? Nothing to matter. But I feel as if I had fallen on it from the top of the cathedral. Dr. Brown says that it is nonsense. But I think so all the same. When you believe a thing and you're told it's nonsense, and you still believe it, that is an hallucination, isn't it? Yes. I have had a great many, said Hester slowly. I suppose I have been more ill than I knew. I thought I saw, I really did see, the spirits of the frost and the snow looking in at the window, and I talked to them a long time, and asked them what quarrel they had with me, their sister, that since I was a child they had always been going about to kill me. Aunt Susan always seemed to think they were enemies who gave me bronchitis, and I told them how I loved them and all their works. And they breathed on the pain and wrote beautiful things in frost work, and I read them all. Now, Rachel, is that an hallucination about the frost work? Because it seems to me still, now that I am better, that I can't explain it that I do see the meaning of it at last, and that I shall never be afraid of them again. Rachel did not answer. She had long since realised that Hester, when in her normal condition, saw things which she herself did not see. She had long since realised that Hester always accepted as final the limit of vision of the person she was with, but with that limit changed with every person she met. Rachel had seen her adjusted to persons more short-sighted than herself, with secret self-satisfaction, and then, with sudden bewilderment, had heard Hester accept as a commonplace from someone else what appeared to Rachel fantastic in the extreme. If Rachel had considered her own mind as the measure of the normal of all other minds, 
she could not have escaped the conclusion that Hester was a victim of manifold delusions. But fortunately for herself, she saw that most ladders possessed more than the one rung on which she was standing. That is quite different, isn't it, said Hester, from thinking Dr. Brown is a grey wolf. Quite different. That was an hallucination of fever. You see that for yourself now that you have no fever. I see that, of course, now that I have no fever, repeated Hester, her eyes widening. But one hallucination quite as foolish as that is always coming back, and I can't shake it off. The wolf was gone directly, but this is just the same now I am better. Only it gets worse and worse. I've never spoken it to anyone, because I know it is so silly. But, Rachel, I have no fever now, and yet you laugh at me. I laugh at my own foolish self, and yet all the time I have a horrible feeling that... Esther's eyes had in them a terror that was hardly human. That my book is burned. End of chapter 46Chapter 47 of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 47. The soul of thy brother is a dark forest. Russian proverb. A marriage has been arranged and will shortly take place between Hugh St. John Scarlet of Kenston Manor, Shropshire, only son of the late Lord Henry Scarlet, and Rachel, only child of the late Joshua Hopkins West of Birmingham. This announcement appeared in the Morning Post a few days after Christmas and aroused many different emotions in the breasts of those who read it. She has done it to spite me, said Mr. Tristram to himself over his morning rasher in the little eating house near his studio. I knew there was someone else in her mind when she refused me. I rather thought it was that weedy fellow with the high nose. Will he make her happy because he's a lord's son? That's what I should like to ask her. Poor Rachel. If we'd been able to marry five years ago, we should never have heard of this society craze. Well, it's all over now. And Mr Tristram, henceforward, took the position of a man suffering from indelible attachment to a woman who has thrown him over for a title. The Gressleys were astonished at the engagement. It was so extraordinary that they should know both persons. Now that they came to think of it, both of them had been to tea at the vicarage only last summer. A good many people pop in and out of this house, they agreed. I am as certain as that I stand here, said Mr. Gressley, who was sitting down, that that noisy boar, that underbred, foul-mouthed Dick Vernon, wanted to marry her. Don't mention him, said Mrs. Gressley. When I think of what he dared to say... My love, said Mr. Gressley, I have forgiven him. I have put from my mind all he said, for I am convinced he was under the influence of drink at the time. We must make allowance for those who live in hot climates. I bear him no grudge, but I am glad that a man of that stamp should not marry Miss West. Drunkenness makes a hell of married life. Mr. Scarlet, though he looked delicate, had at least the appearance of being abstemious. Fraulein heard the news as she was packing her boxes to leave Warpington Vicarage. She was greatly depressed. She could not be with her dear Miss Gressley in this mysterious illness which some secret sorrow had brought upon her, but at least Miss West could administer to her, and now it seemed Miss West was thinking of Brauti Gange more than of Hester. Fraulein had been very uncomfortable at the vicarage, but she wept at leaving. Mrs. Gressley had never attained to treating her with the consideration which she would have accorded to one whom she considered her equal. The servants were allowed to disregard with impunity her small, polite requests. The nurse was consistently, ferociously jealous of her. But the children had made up for all, and now she was leaving them. And she did not own it to herself, for she was but five and thirty, and the shyest of the shy. But she should see no more that noble-hearted, that musical, her brown. Doll, said Sybil Loftus to her husband at breakfast, I've made another match. I thought at the first he liked her. You remember Rachel West, not pretty, but with a nice expression. What does beauty matter? She's engaged to Mr. Scarlet. Well, decent chap, said Doll, and I like her. 
No nonsense about her. Good thing he wasn't drowned. Mr. Harvey will feel it. He confided to me that she was his ideal. Now Rachel is everything that is sweet and good and dear, and she will make a most excellent wife. But I should never have thought, would you, that she could be anybody's ideal? Doll opened his mouth to say, That depends. But remembered that his wife had taken an unaccountable dislike to that simple phrase, and remained silent. Captain Pratt, who was spending Christmas with his family, was the only person at Warpington Towers who read the papers. On this particular morning he came down to a late breakfast after the others had finished. His father, who was always down at eight, secretly admired his son's aristocratic habits while he affected to laugh at them. Shameful luxurious ways, these young men in the guards. Fashionable society is rotten, sir. What to the car? Never get up till noon. My boy's as bad as any of them. Captain Pratt propped up the paper open before him while he sipped his coffee and glanced down the columns. His travelling eye reached Hugh's engagement. Captain Pratt rarely betrayed any feeling except ennui, but as he read, astonishment got the better of him. By George, he said below his breath. The bit of omelette on its way to his mouth was slowly lowered again and remained sticking on the end of his fork. What did it mean? He recalled that scene in Hugh's rooms only last week. He'd spoken of it to no one, for he intended to earn gratitude by his discretion. Of course, Scarlet was going to marry Lady Newhaven after a decent interval. She was a very beautiful woman with a large jointure, and she was obviously in love with him. The question of her conduct was not considered. It never entered Captain Pratt's head any more than that of a ten-year-old child. He was aware that all the women of the upper classes were immoral, except newly come out girls. That was an established fact. The only difference between the individuals, which caused a separation as of the sheep from the goats, was whether they were compromised or not. Lady Newhaven was not, unless he chose to compromise her. No breath of scandal had ever touched her. But what was Scarlet about? Could they have quarrelled? What did it mean? And what would she do now? By George! said Captain Pratt again, and the agate eyes narrowed down to two slits. He sat a long time motionless, his untasted breakfast before him. His mind was working, weighing, applying now its scales, now its thermometer. Rachel and Hugh were sitting together, looking at a paragraph in the morning post. Does Miss Cresty take any interest? said Hugh. He was a little jealous of Hester, this illness, the cause of which had sincerely grieved him, had come at an inopportune moment. Hester was always taking Rachel from him. Yes, said Rachel, a little when she remembers, but she can only think of one thing. That unhappy book. Yes, I think the book was to Hester something of what you are to me. Her whole heart was wrapped up in it, and she has lost it. Here, whatever happens, you must not be lost now. It is too late. I... I could not bear it. I can only be lost if you throw me away, said Hugh. There was a long silence. Lady Newhaven will know today, said Rachel at last. I tried to break it to her, but she did not believe me. Rachel, said Hugh, stammering. I meant to tell you the other day, only we were interrupted, that she came to my rooms the evening before I came down here. I should not have minded quite so much, but Captain Pratt came in with me and found her there. Oh, Hugh, that dreadful man. Poor woman. Poor woman, said Hugh, his eyes flashing. It was poor you I thought of. Poor Rachel. To be marrying a man who... There was another silence. I have one great compensation, said Rachel, laying her cool, strong hand on his. You are open with me. You keep nothing back. You need not have mentioned this unlucky meeting, but you did. It was like you. I trust you entirely, Hugh. I bless and thank you for loving me. If my love can make you happy, oh, Hughie, you will be happy. Hugh shrank from her. The faltered words were as a two-edged sword. She looked at the sensitive, paling face with tender comprehension. The mother look crept into her eyes. 
If there is anything else that you wish to tell me, tell me now. A wild, overwhelming impulse to flick himself over the precipice out of the reach of those stabbing words. A horrible, nauseating recoil that seemed to read his whole being. Somebody said hoarsely, There's there nothing else. It was his own voice, but not his will that spoke. Had anyone ever made him suffer like this woman who loved him? Lady Newhaven had returned to Westop ill with suspense and anxiety. She had felt sure she should successfully waylay Hugh in his rooms, convinced that if they could but meet, the clouds between them, to borrow from her vocabulary, would instantly roll away. They had met, and the clouds had not rolled away. She vainly endeavoured to attribute Hugh's evident anger at the sight of her to her want of prudence to the accident of Captain Pratt's presence. She would not admit the thought that Hugh had ceased to care for her, but it needed a good deal of forcible thrusting away. She could hear the knock of the unwelcome guest upon her door, and though always refused admittance, he withdrew only to return. She had been grievously frightened, too, at having been seen in equivocal circumstances by such a man as Captain Pratt. The very remembrance made her shiver. How angry Edward would have been, she said to herself, I wonder whether he would have advised me to write a little note to Captain Pratt, explaining how I came there, and asking him not to mention it. But, of course, he won't repeat it. He won't want to make an enemy of me and Hugh. The Pratts think so much of me. And when I marry Hugh, knock at the mental door, if ever I marry Hugh, we will be civil to him and have him to stay. Ever never would, but I don't think so much of good family and all that as Edward did. We will certainly ask him. It was not till after luncheon that Lady Newhaven, after scanning the lady's pictorial, languidly opened the morning post. Suddenly the paper fell from her hands onto the floor. She seized it up and read again the paragraph which had caught her eye. No, no, she gasped. It is not true. It is not possible. And she read it a third time. The paper fell from her nerveless hands again, and this time it remained on the floor. It is doubtful whether until this moment Lady Newhaven had known what suffering was. She had talked freely of it to others. She had sung, as if it were her own composition, cleansing fires. She often said it might have been written for her. In the cruel fire of sorrow, slow soft pedal, cast thy heart, do not faint or wail, both pedals down quicker, let thy hand be firm and steady, loud and hold on to last syllable, do not let thy spirit quail. Bang, be natural, with resolution. Bars, hurricane of false notes, etc., etc. But now, poor thing, the fire had reached her, and her spirit quailed immediately. Perhaps it was only natural that as her courage failed, something else should take its place, an implacable burning resentment against her two betrayers, her lover and her friend. She rocked herself to and fro. Lover and friend. Oh, never, never trust in man's love or woman's friendship heads forth forever. So learned Lady Newhaven the lesson of suffering. Lover and friend hast thou put far from me, she sobbed, and mine acquaintance out of my sight. A ring at the doorbell proved that the latter part of the text, at any rate, was not true in her case. A footman entered. Not at home, not at home, she said impatiently. I said not at home, but the gentleman said I was to take up his card, said the man, presenting a card. When Captain Pratt tipped, he tipped heavily. Lady Newhaven read it. No, yes, I will see him, she said. It flashed across her mind that she must be civil to him and that her eyes were not red. She had not shed tears. The man picked the newspaper from the floor, put it on a side table, and withdrew. Captain Pratt came in, bland, deferential, orchid in buttonhole. It was not until he was actually in the room, his cold, appraising eyes upon her, that the poor woman realised that her position towards him had changed. She could not summon up the nonchalant, distant civility, which, according to her ideas, was sufficient for her country neighbours in general, and the Pratts in particular. 
Captain Pratt opined that the weather, though cold, was seasonable. Lady Newhaven agreed. Captain Pratt regretted the hard frost on account of the hunting, four hunters eating their heads off, etc. Lady Newhaven thought the four might come any day. Captain Pratt had been skating yesterday on the parental flooded meadow, flooded with fire engine, men out of work, land of employment, etc. How kind of Captain Pratt to employ them. Not at all, it was his father, duties of the landed gentry, etc. He believed if the frost continued they would skate on Bermia. No, no one was allowed to skate on Bermia, the springs rendered the ice treacherous. Silence. Captain Pratt turned the gold knob of his stick slowly in his thick white fingers. He looked carefully at Lady Newhaven, as a connoisseur with intent to buy looks at a piece of valuable china. She was accustomed to being looked at, but there was something in Captain Pratt's prolonged scrutiny which filled her with vague alarm. She writhed under it. He observed her uneasiness, but he did not remove his eyes. Were the boys well? They were quite well, thanks. She was cowed. Were they fond of skating? Very fond. Might he suggest that they should come over and skate at Warpington Towers tomorrow? He himself would be there and would take charge of them. He rose slowly, as one who has made up his mind. Lady Newhaven feared it would be troubling Captain Pratt too much. It would be no trouble to Captain Pratt, on the contrary, a pleasure. His hand was now extended. Lady Newhaven had to put hers into it. Perhaps next week, if the frost held, she tried to withdraw her hand. Oh, well then, tomorrow. Certainly, tomorrow. You may rely on me to take good care of them, said Captain Pratt, still holding her hand. He obliged her to look at him. His hard eyes met her frightened blue ones. You may rely on my discretion entirely, in all matters, he said meaningly. Lady Newhaven winced, and her hand trembled violently in his. He pressed the shrinking little hand, let it go, and went away. End of chapter 47Chapter 48 of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 48. The ton apot, on pot, min rapot pa. Uh, may I come in? said the bishop, tapping at Hester's door. Do come in. Hester was lying propped up by many cushions on a sofa in the little sitting room leading out of her bedroom. She looked a mere shadow in the firelight. She smiled at him mechanically, but her face relapsed at once into the apathetic expression which sat so ill upon it. Her lustreless eyes fixed themselves again on the fire. "'And what are you going to do this afternoon?' she said politely. It was obvious she did not care what he did. "'I'm going to West upon business,' he said, looking narrowly at her. It was all very well for Dr. Brown to say she must be roused, but how were his instructions to be carried out?' "'I am a great deal of trouble to you,' said Hester. "'Could not I be sent to a home or a place where you go through a cure, "'where I should be out of the way till I am well?' "'Have I deserved that, Hester?' "'No, but you know I always try to wound my best friends.' "'You don't succeed, my child, because they know you are in heavy trouble.' "'We will not speak of that,' said Hester quickly. "'Yes, the time has come to speak of it. "'Why do you shut us out of this sorrow?' Don't you see that you make our burdens heavier by refusing to let us share yours? You can't share it, said Hester. No one can. Do you think I have not grieved over it? I know you have, but it was waste of time. It's, it's no good, no good. Please don't cheer me and tell me I shall write better books yet and that this trial is for my good. Dear Bishop, don't try and comfort me. I can't bear it. My poor child, I firmly believe you will write better books than the one which is lost, and I firmly believe that you will one day look back upon this time as a stop in your spiritual life. But I had not intended to say so. The thought was in my mind, but it was you who put the words into my mouth. I was so afraid that... that I was going to improve the occasion. 
Yes. Dr. Brown and the nurse are so dreadfully cheerful now, and always talking about the future and how celebrated I shall be some day. If you and Rachel follow suit, I shall... I think I shall go out of my mind. The bishop did not answer. Dr. Brown may be right, Esther went on. I may live to seventy, and I may become... What does he call it? A distinguished author. I don't know, and I don't care. But whatever happens in the future, nothing will bring back the book which was burned. The bishop did not speak. He dared not. If I had a child, Hester continued, in the exhausted voice with which he was becoming familiar, and it died, I might have ten more beautiful and clever and affectionate, but they would not replace the one I had lost. Only if it were a child, a little tremor broke the dead level of the passionless voice. I shall meet it again in heaven. There is the resurrection of the body for the children of the body, but there is no resurrection that I ever heard of for the children of the brain. Hester held her thin right hand with its disfigured first finger to the fire. A great writer who had married and had children whom she worshipped once told me that the pang of motherhood is that even your children don't seem your very own. They are often more like someone else than their parents, perhaps the spinster sister-in-law whom everyone dislikes, or some entire alien. Look at Reggie. He's just like me, which must be a great trial to Mina. And they grow up bewildering their parents at every turn by characteristics they don't understand. But she said the spiritual children, the books, are really ours. If you were other than you are, said Hester, after a long pause, you would reprove me for worshipping my own work. I suppose love is worship. I loved it for itself, not for anything it was to bring me. That is what people like Dr. Brown don't understand. It was part of myself, but it was the better part. The side of me which loves success and which he is always appealing to had no hand in it. My one prayer was that I might be worthy to write it, that it might not suffer by contact with me. I spent myself upon it. Hester's voice sank. I knew what I was doing. I joyfully spent my health, my eyesight, my very life upon it. I was impelled to do it by what you perhaps will call a blind instinct. What I, poor simpleton and dupe, believed at the time to be nothing less than the will of God. You will think so again, said the bishop, when you realise that the book has left its mark and influence upon your character. It has taught you a great deal. The mere fact of writing it has strengthened you. The output of visible form is dead, but its spirit lives on in you. You will realise this presently. Shall I? On the contrary, the only thing I realise is that it is not God who is mocked, but his foolish children who try to do his bidding. It seems he is not above putting a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. Do you think I still blame poor James for his bonfire? Or his jealous little wife who wanted to get rid of me? Why should I? They acted up to their lights, as your beloved Jock did when he squeezed the life out of that rabbit in Western Park. In all those days when I did not say anything, it was because I felt I had been deceived. I had done my part. God had not done his. He should have seen to it that the book was not destroyed. You prayed by me once when you thought I was unconscious. I heard you all right. I should have laughed if I could, but it was too much trouble. These thoughts will pass away with your illness, said the bishop. You are like a man who has had a blow, who staggers about giddy and dazed, and sees the pavement rising up to strike him. The pavement is firm under his feet all the time. Half of me knows in a dim, blind way that God is the same always, said Hester, while the other half says, Curse God and die. That is the giddiness, the vertigo after the shock. Is it? I dare say you're right. But I don't care either way. Why trouble your mind about it, or about anything? Because I have a feeling, indeed, it would be extraordinary if I had not, for Dr. Brown is always rubbing it in, that I ought to meet my trouble bravely and not sink down under it, as he thinks I am doing now. He says others have suffered more than I have. I know that, for I have been with them. 
It seems, said Hester with the ghost of a smile, that there is an etiquette about these things, just as the blinds are drawn up after a fly funeral. The moment has come for me, but I have not drawn up my blinds. You will draw them up presently. I would draw them up now, said Hester, looking at him steadily, if I could. I owe it to you and Rachel to try, and I have tried, but I can't. The bishop's cheek paled a little. Take your own time, he said, but his heart sank. He saw a little boat with torn sail and broken rudder drifting onto a lee shore. I seem to have been living at a great strain for the last year, said Hester. I don't know one word from another now, but I think I mean concentration. That means holding your mind to one place, doesn't it? Well, now, something seems to have broken, and I can't fix it to anything any more. I can talk to you and Rachel for a few minutes, if I hold my mind tight, but I, I can't really attend. And directly I'm alone, or you leave off speaking, my mind gets loose from my body and wanders away to an immense distance to long, dreary, desert places. And then if you come in, I make a great effort to bring it back and to open my eyes, because if I don't, you think I'm ill. You don't mind if I shut them now, do you? Because I've explained about them, and holding them open does tire me so. I wish they could be propped open, and my mind gets farther and further away every day. I, I hope you and Rachel won't think I'm giving way if sometime I, I really can't bring it back any longer. Dear Hester, no. I will not talk any more, then. If you and Rachel understand, that's all that matters. I used to think so many things mattered, but I don't now. I don't think I'm grieving about the book while I'm lying still. I have grieved, but it's over. I'm too tired to be glad or sorry about anything any more. Hester lay back, spent and grey, among her pillows. The bishop roused her to take the stimulant put ready near at hand, and then sat a long time watching her. She seemed unconscious of his presence. At last the nurse came in, and he went out silently and returned to his study. Rachel was waiting there to hear the result of the interview. I can do nothing, he said. I have no power to help her. After forty years' ministry, I have not a word to say to her. She is beyond human aid, at least she is beyond mine. You think she will die? I do not see what is going to happen to prevent it but I am certain it might be prevented. You could not rise her? No, she discounted anything I could have said by asking me not to say it. That is the worst of Esther. The partition between her mind and that of other people is so thin that she sees what they are thinking about. Thank God, Rachel, that you are not cursed with the artistic temperament. That is why she is never married. She sees too much. I'm not a matchmaker, but if I had had to take the responsibility, I should have married her at seventeen to Lord Newhaven. You know he asked her. No, I did not know it. It was a long time ago when first she came out. Lady Susan was anxious for it and pressed her. I sometimes think if she'd been given time, and if her aunt had left her alone, that he married within the year. And what are we to do about Hester? Dr. Brown says something must be done, or she will sink in a decline. I would give my life for her, but I can do nothing. I have tried. So have I, said the bishop. But it has come to this. We have got to trust the one person whom we always show we tacitly distrust by trying to take the matter out of his hands. We must trust God. So far we have strained ourselves to keep Hester alive, but she is past our help now. She is in none the worse care for that. We are her two best friends, save one. We must leave her to the best friend of all. God has her in his hand. For the moment, the greater love holds her away from the less, like the mother who takes her sick child into her arms, apart from the other children who are playing round her. Esther is in God's keeping, and that is enough for us. And now, take a turn in the garden, Rachel. You are too much indoors. I'm going out on business.
When Rachel had left him, the bishop opened his dispatch box and took out a letter. It was directed to Lady Newhaven. I promised to give it into her own hand a month after his death, whenever that might happen to be, he said to himself. There was some trouble between them. I hope she won't confide it to me. Anyway, I must go now and get it over. I wish I did not dislike her so much. I should advise her not to read it till I am gone. End of chapter 48Chapter 49 of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 49. The mouse fell from the ceiling and the cat cried Allah. Syrian proverb. That help should come through such a recognised channel as a bishop could surprise no one, least of all Lady Newhaven, who had had the greatest faith in the clergy all her life, but nevertheless so overwhelmed was she by despair and its physical sensations that she very nearly refused to see the bishop when he called. Her faith, even in lawn sleeves, momentarily tottered. Who would show her any good? Poor Lady Newhaven was crushed into a state of prostration so frightful that we must not blame her if she felt that even an archbishop would have been powerless to help her. She had thought after the engagement was announced, of rushing up to London and insisting on seeing Hugh. But always, after she had looked out the trains, her courage had shrunk back at the last moment. There had been a look on Hugh's face during that last momentary meeting, which she could not nerve herself to see again. She had been to London already once to see him, without success. She knew Rachel was at the palace at Southminster nursing Hester, and twice she had ordered the carriage to, to drive over to see her, and make a desperate appeal to her to give up Hugh. But she knew that she should fail, and Rachel would triumph over her. Women always did over a defeated rival. Lady Newhaven had not gone. The frightful injustice of it all wrung Lady Newhaven's heart to the point of agony, to see her own property deliberately stolen from her in the light of day, as it were, in the very marketplace, before everybody, without being able to raise a finger to regain him. It was intolerable. For she loved Hugh, as far as she was capable of loving anything, and her mind had grown round to the idea that he was hers as entirely as a tree will grow round a nail fastened into it. And now he was to marry Rachel, and soon. Let no one think they know pain until they know jealousy. But when the bishop sent up a second time, asking to see her on business, she consented. It was too soon to see callers, of course, but a bishop was different. And how could she refuse to admit him when she had admitted that odious Captain Pratt only four days before? She hoped no one would become aware of that fact. It was as well for her that she could not hear the remarks of Selina and Ada Pratt as they skated on the frozen meadows with half not the better half, of Middleshire. Poor Vine Newhaven! Yes, she won't see a creature. She saw Algy for a few minutes last week, but then he is an old friend and does not count. He said she was quite heartbroken. He was quite upset himself. He was so fond of Ted Newhaven. The bishop would not even sit down. He said he was on his way to a confirmation, and added that he had been entrusted with a letter for her, and held it towards her. It is my husband's handwriting, she said, drawing back with instinctive fear. It is from your husband, said the bishop gently, softening somewhat at the sight of the ravages which despair had made in the lovely face since he had last seen it. He asked me to give it into your own hand a month after his death. Then he told you that... He told me nothing, and I wish to hear nothing. I should like to confess all to you, to feel myself absolved said Lady Newhaven, in a low voice, the letter in her trembling hand. He looked at her, and he saw that she would not say all. She had arranged details to suit herself, and would omit the main point altogether, whatever it might be, if, as if it were more than probable, it told against herself. He would at least save her from the hypocrisy of a half-confession. If in a month's time you wish to make a full confession to me, 
he said. I will hear it. But I solemnly charge you in the meanwhile to speak to no one of this difficulty between you and your husband. Whatever it may have been, it is past. If he sinned against you, he is dead, and the least you can do is to keep silence. If you wronged him, Lady Newhaven shook her head vehemently. If you wronged him, repeated the bishop, his face hardening, be silent for the sake of the children. It is the only miserable reparation you can make him. You don't understand, she said feebly. I know that he was a kindly, gentle-natured man, and that he died a hard and a bitter one, said the bishop. God knows what is in that letter, but your husband said it would be of the greatest comfort and assistance to you in a difficulty which he foresaw for you. I will leave you to read it. And he left the room. The early December twilight was creeping over everything. Lady Newhaven took the letter to the window, and after several futile attempts succeeded in opening it. It ran as follows. It is irreligious to mourn too long for the dead. I should go to him, but he shall not return to me. Second book of Samuel, chapter 12, verse 23. In the meanwhile, until you rejoin me, I trust you will remember that it is my special wish that you should allow one who is in every way worthy of you to console you for my loss, which will make you as happy as you both deserve to be. That I die by my own hand, you and your so-called friend, Miss West, are of course aware. That the one love of your life drew the short lighter, you are perhaps not aware. I waited two days to see if he would fulfil the compact, and as he did not, I never thought he would, I retired in his place. I present to you this small piece of information as a wedding present, which, if adroitly handled, may add to the harmony of domestic life. And if by any chance he should have conceived that dastardly the immoral idea of deserting you in favour of some mercenary marriage, of which I rather suspect him, you will find this piece of information invaluable in restoring his allegiance at once. He is yours by every sacred tie, and no treacherous female friend must wrest him from you. Your late husband, Newhaven. Lady Newhaven put the letter in her pocket, and then fainted away with her fair head on the window ledge. End of chapter 49《Chapter 50 of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 50. There cannot be a pinch in death more sharp than this. The bishop's sister, Miss Keene, whose life was a perpetual orgy of mothers' meetings and GFS gatherings, was holding a district visitor's working party in the drawing room at the palace. The ladies knitted and stitched, while one of their number heaped fuel on the flame of their enthusiasm by reading aloud the History of the Diocese of Southminster. Miss Keene took but little heed of the presence of Rachel and Hester in her brother's house. Those who work mechanically on fixed lines seem, as a rule, to miss the pith of life. She was kind when she remembered them, but her heart was where her treasure was, namely, in her escritoire, with a list of Bible classes and servants' choral unions, and the long roll of contributors to the Guild of Work, which she herself had started. When she had been up to Hester's room, invariably at hours when Hester could not see her, and when she had entered Rachel's sledgehammer subscriptions in her various account books, her attention left her visitors. She considered them superficial, and wondered how it was that her brother could find time to spend hours talking to both of them, while he had really a moment in which to address her chosen band in the drawing-room. She was one of those persons who find life a very prosaic affair, quite unlike the fiction she occasionally read. She often remarked that nothing except the commonplace happened. Certainly she never observed anything else. So Hester lay in the room above, halting feebly between two opinions, whether to live or to die and Rachel sat in the bishop's study beneath, waiting to make tea for him on his return from the confirmation. 
If she did not make it, no one else did. Instead of ringing for it, he went without it. Rachel watched the sun set, a red ball dropping down a frosty sky. It was the last day of the year. The new year was bringing her everything. Goodbye, goodbye, she said, looking at the last rim of the sun as he sank. And she remembered other years when she had watched the sun set on the last day of December, when life had been difficult. How difficult! If Esther could only get better, I should have nothing left to wish for, she said. And she prayed the more fervently for her friend, because she knew that even if Hester died, life would still remain beautiful. The future without her would still be flooded with happiness. A year ago, if Hester had died, I should have had nothing left to live for, she said to herself. Now, this newcomer, this man who I have known barely six months, fills my whole life. Are other women as narrow as I am? Can they care only for one person at a time, like me? Ah, oh, Hester, forgive me, I can't help it. Hugh was coming in presently. He had been in that morning, and the bishop had met him, and had asked him to come in again to tea. Rachel did not know what the bishop thought of him, but he had managed to see a good deal of Hugh. Rachel waited as impatiently as most of us, when our happiness lingers by us, loath to depart. At last she heard the footman bringing someone across the hall. Would Hugh's coming ever become a common thing? Would she ever be able to greet him without this tumult of emotion? Ever be able to take his hand without turning giddy on the sheer verge of bliss? The servant announced, Lady Newhaven. The two women stood looking at each other. Rachel saw the marks of suffering on the white face, and her own became as white. Her eyes fell guiltily before Lady Newhaven's. Forgive me, she said. Forgive you? said Lady Newhaven in a hoarse voice. It is no use asking me for forgiveness. You are right, said Rachel, recovering herself and meeting Lady Newhaven's eyes fully. But what is the use of coming here to abuse me? You might have spared yourself and me this, at least. It will only exhaust you and wound me. You must give him up, said Lady Newhaven, her hands fumbling under her crape cloak. I've come to tell you that you must let him go. The fact that Hugh had drawn the short lighter and had not taken the consequences did not affect Lady Newhaven's feelings towards him in the least, but she was vaguely aware that somehow it would affect Rachel's, and now it would be Rachel's turn to suffer. Rachel paused a moment, and then said slowly, He does not wish to be let go. He is mine. He was yours once, said Rachel, her face turning from white to grey. That wound was long in healing. But he is mine now. Rachel, you cannot be bad all through. Lady Newhaven was putting the constraint upon herself, which that tightly clutched paper, that poisonous weapon in reserve, enabled her to assume. For Hugh's sake, she would only use it if other means failed. You must know that you ought to look upon him as a married man. Don't you see, wildly, that we must marry to put right what was wrong? He, he owes it to me. People always do. Yes, they generally do, said Rachel. But I don't see how it makes the wrong right. I look upon Hugh as my husband, said Lady Newhaven. So do I. Rachel, he loves me. He is only marrying you for your money. I will risk that. I implore you on my knees to give him back to me. And Lady Newhaven knelt down with bare, white, outstretched hands. Tableau number one, new series. Rachel shrank back involuntarily. Listen, Violet, she said, and get up. I will not speak until you get up. Lady Newhaven obeyed. If I gave back Hugh to you a hundred times, it would not make him love you any more, or make him marry you. I am not keeping him from you. This marriage is his own doing. Oh, Violet, I am not young and pretty. I have no illusions about myself. But I believe he really does love me, in spite of that. 
and I know I love him. I don't believe it, said Lady Newhaven. I mean about him, not about you, of course. Here he is. Let him decide, said Rachel. Hugh came in unannounced. Upon his grave face there was that concentrated look of happiness which was settled in the very deep of the heart and gleams up into the eyes. His face changed painfully. He glanced from one woman to the other. Rachel was sorry for him. She would fain have spared him, but she could not. Hugh, she said gently, her steadfast eyes resting on him, Lady Newhaven and I were talking of you. I think it would be best if she heard from your own lips what she naturally will not believe from mine. I will never believe, said Lady Newhaven, that you will desert me now, that all the past is nothing to you, and that you will cast me aside for another woman. He looked at her steadily. Then he went up to Rachel, and, taking her hand, raised it to his lips. There was in his manner a boundless reverent adoration that was to Lady Newhaven's jealousy as a match to gunpowder. Rachel kept his hand. Are you sure you want him, Rachel? asked Lady Newhaven, holding convulsively to a chair for support. He has cast me aside. He will cast you aside next, for he is a coward and a traitor. Are you sure you want to marry him? His hands are red with blood. He murdered my husband. Rachel's hand tightened on Hughes. It was an even chance, she said. Those who draw lots must abide by the drawing. It was an even chance, shrieked Lady Newhaven. But who drew the short lighter? Tell me that. Who refused to fulfil his part when the time was up? Tell me that. You are mad, said Rachel. I can prove it, said Lady Newhaven, holding out the letter in her shaking hands. You may read it, Rachel. I can trust you. Not him, he would burn it. It is from Edward. Look, you know his writing, written to tell me that he, pointing at Hugh, had drawn the short lighter, but that, as he had not killed himself when the time came, he, Edward, did so instead. That was why he was late. We always wondered today, Rachel, why he was two days late. Read it, read it. I will not read it, said Rachel, pushing away the paper. I do not believe a word of it. You shall believe it. Ask him to deny it if he can. You need not trouble to deny it, said Rachel, looking full at Hugh. The world held only her and him. And as Hugh looked into her eyes, his soul rose up and scaled the heights above it till he stood beside hers. There is a sacred place where, if we follow close in love's footsteps, we see him lay aside his earthly quiver and his bitter arrows, and turn to us as he is, with the light of God upon him, one with us as one with God. In that pure light lies ceased to be. We know them no more, neither remember them, for love and truth are one. Hugh strode across to Lady Newhaven, took the letter from her, and threw it into the heart of the fire. Then he turned to Rachel. I drew the short lighter, he said. I meant to take the consequences at first, but when the time came, I did not. Partly, I was afraid, and partly, I could not leave you. If Lady Newhaven yearned for revenge, she had it then. They had both forgotten her. But she saw Rachel's eyes change, as the eyes of a man at the stake might change when the fire reached him. She shrank back from the agony in them. Hugh's face became pinched and thin as a dead man's. A moment ago he saw no consequences, he saw only that he could not lie to her. His mind fell headlong from its momentary foothold. What mad impulse had betrayed him to his ruin? You drew the short lighter, and you let me think all the time he had, said Rachel, a voice almost inaudible in its fierce passion. You drew it, and you let him die instead of you, as anyone who knew him would know he would. And when he was dead, you came to me and kept me in ignorance, even that time when I said I trusted you. 
the remembrance of that beating was too much. Rachel turned her eyes on Lady Newhaven, who was watching her, terror-stricken. I said I would not give him up, but I will, she said violently. You can take him if you want him. What was it you said to me, Hugh? That if you had drawn the short lighter, you would have had to abide by it. Yes, that was it. Your whole intercourse with me has been one lie from first to last. You were right, Violet, when you said he ought to marry you. It would be another lie on the top of all the others. It is what Edward wished, called at his widow. He says so in the letter that has just been burned. Lord Newhaven wished it, said Rachel, looking at the miserable man between them. Poor Lord Newhaven. First his honour, then his life. You have taken everything he had. But there are still his shoes. Rachel, said Hugh suddenly, and he fell on his knees before her, clasping the hem of her gown. She pushed him violently from her, tearing her gown and releasing it from his frenzied grasp. Leave me. She whispered. Her voice was almost gone. Coward and liar, I will have nothing more to do with you. He got upon his feet somehow. The two grey, desperate faces, spent with passion, faced each other. They were past speech. He read his death warrant in her merciless eyes. She looked at the despair in his, without flinching. He stood a moment and then, feeling his way like one half-blind, left the room, unconsciously pushing aside Lady Newhaven, whom both had forgotten. She gave one terrified glance at Rachel, and slipped out after him. End of chapter 50。Chapter 51 of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 51 I thought, now, if I had been a woman, such as God made women, to save men by love, by just my love I might have saved this man. Elizabeth Barrett Browning Has Lady Newhaven been here? said the bishop, coming into the study, his hands full of papers. I thought I saw her carriage driving away as I came up. She has been here. The bishop looked up suddenly, his attention arrested by Rachel's voice. There is a white heat of anger that mimics the pallor of a fainting fit. The bishop thought that she was about to swoon until he saw her eyes. Those gentle, faithful eyes were burning. He shrank as one who sees the glare of fire raging inside familiar windows. My poor child, he said, and he sat down heavily in his leather armchair. Rachel still stood. She looked at him, and her lips moved, but no sound came forth. The bishop looked intently at her. "'Where is Scarlet?' he said. "'He, he is gone,' she said, stammering. "'I have broken off my engagement with him. He will never come back.' Then she fell suddenly on her knees, and hid her convulsed face against the arm of a chair. The bishop did not move. He waited for this paroxysm of anger to subside. He had never seen a Rachel angry before in all the years he had known her. But he watched her without surprise. Only stupid people think that coal cannot burn as fiercely as tar. She remained a long time on her knees, her face hidden. The bishop did not hurry her. At last she began to sob silently, shuddering from head to foot. Then he came and sat down near her, and took the cold, clinched hands in his. "'Rachel, tell me,' he said gently. She tried to pull her hands away, but he held them firmly. He obliged her to look up at him. She raised her fierce, disfigured face for a moment, and then let it fall on his hands and hers. "'I am a wicked woman,' she said. "'Don't trouble about me. I'm not worth it. I thought I would have kept all suffering from him, but now, if I could make him suffer, I would. I have no doubt he is suffering. Not enough, not like me. And I loved him and trusted him. And he is false too, like that other man I loved. Like you, only I have not found you out yet. Like Hester, like all the rest. I will never trust anyone again. 
I will never be deceived again. This is the second time. And Rachel broke into a passion of tears. The bishop released her hands and felt for his own handkerchief. Then he waited, praying silently. The clock had made a long circuit before she raised herself. I am very selfish, she said, looking with compunction at the kind, tired face. I ought to have gone to my room instead of breaking down here. Dear Bishop, forgive me. It is past now. I shall not give way again. Will you make me some tea? he said. She made the tea with shaking hands and awkward, half-blind movements. It was close on dinner time, but she did not notice it. He obliged her to drink some, and then he settled himself in his leather armchair. He went over his engagements for the evening. In half an hour he ought to be dining with Canon Lynn to meet an old college friend. At eleven he had arranged to see a young clergyman whose conscience was harrying him. He wrote a note on his knee without moving, saying he could not come, and touched the bell at his elbow. When the servant had taken the note, he relapsed into the depths of his armchair and sipped his tea. "'I think, Rachel,' he said at last, that I ought to tell you that I partly guess at your reason for breaking off your engagement. I have known for some time that there was trouble between the Newhavens. From what Lady Newhaven said to me today, and from the fact that she has been here, and that immediately after seeing her you broke your engagement with Scarlet, I must come to the conclusion that Scarlet has been the cause of this trouble. Rachel had regained her composure. Her face was white and hard. You are right, he said. He was at one time her lover. And you consider in consequence that he is unfit to become your husband? No. He told me about it before he asked me to marry him. I accepted him, knowing it. Then he was trying to retrieve himself. He acted towards you at any rate like an honourable man. Rachel laughed. So I thought at the time. If you accepted him, knowing about his past, I don't see why you should have thrown him over. One dishonourable action, sincerely repented, does not make a dishonourable man. I did not know all, said Rachel. I do now. The bishop looked into the fire. The next words surprised him. You really cared for Lord Newhaven, did you not? I did. Then, as you know, the one thing he risked his life to conceal for the sake of his children, namely his wife's misconduct, I think I had better tell you the rest. So Rachel told him in harsh, bald language the story of the drawing of lots, and how she and Lady Newhaven had remained ignorant as to which had drawn the short lighter, how Hugh had drawn it, how when the time came he had failed to fulfil the agreement, how two days later Lord Newhaven had killed himself, and how she and Lady Newhaven had both, of course, concluded that Lord Newhaven must have drawn the short lighter. Rachel went on, her hard voice shaking a little. Hugh had told me that he had had an entanglement with a married woman. I knew it long before he spoke of it, but just because he risked losing me by owning it, I loved and trusted him all the more. I thought he was, at any rate, an upright man. After Lord Newhaven's death, he asked me to marry him, and I accepted him. And when we were talking quietly one day, Rachel's face became, if possible, whiter than before. I told him that I knew of the drawing of lots. He thought no one knew of it except the dead man and himself. And I told him that he must not blame himself for Lord Newhaven's death. He had brought it on himself. I said to him, Rachel's voice trembled more and more, it was an even chance you might have drawn the short lighter yourself. And he said that if he had, he should have had to abide by it. The bishop shaded his eyes with his hand. It seemed cruel to look at Rachel, as it is cruel to watch a man drown. And how do you know he did draw it? he said. It seems Lord Newhaven left his wife a letter which she has only just received, telling her so. She brought it here today to show me. Ah, a letter, and you read it? No, said Rachel scornfully, I did not read it. 
I did not believe a word she said about it. He was there, and I told him I trusted him, and he took the letter from her and put it in the fire. And did he not contradict it? No. He said it was true. He had lied to me over and over again, but I saw he was speaking the truth for once. There was a long silence. I don't know how other people regard these things, said Rachel at last, less harshly. She was gradually recovering herself. But I know to me it was much worse that he could deceive me than that he should have been Lady Newhaven's lover. I did feel that, dreadfully. I had to choke down my jealousy when he kissed me. He had kissed her first. He had made that side of his love common and profane. But the other side remained. I clung to that. I believed he really loved me, and that supported me and enabled me to forgive him. But men don't know what that forgiveness costs us. Only the walls of our rooms know that. But it seems to me much worse to have failed me on that other side as well, to have deceived me, to have told me a lie, just when, just when we were talking intimately. It was infinitely worse, said the bishop. And it was the action of a coward to draw lots in the first instance, if he did not mean to abide by the drawing. And the action of a traitor, once they were drawn, not to abide by them. But yet, if he had told me, if he had only told me the whole truth, I loved him so entirely that I would have forgiven even that. But whenever I alluded to it, he lied. He was afraid of losing you. He has lost me by his deceit. He would not have lost me if he had told me the truth. I think I know that I could have got over anything, forgiven anything, even his cowardice, if he had only admitted it and been straightforward with me. A little plain dealing was all I asked, but I did not get it. The bishop looked sadly at her. Straightforwardness is so seldom the first requirement a woman makes of the man she loves. Women, as a rule, regard men and their conduct only from the point of view of their relation to women, as sons, as husbands, as fathers. Yet Rachel, it seemed, could forgive Hugh's sin against her as a woman, but not his further sin against her as a friend. Yet it seems he did speak the truth at last, he said. Yes. And after he had destroyed the letter, which was the only proof against him. Yes. Another silence. I am glad you have thrown him over, said the bishop slowly, for you never loved him. I deceived myself in that case, said Rachel bitterly. My only fear was that I loved him too much. The bishop's face had become fixed and stern. Listen to me, Rachel, he said. You fell desperately in love with an inferior man. He is charming, refined, well-bred, and, and with a picturesque mind, but that is all. He is inferior. He is by nature shallow and hard. The two generally go together. Without moral backbone. The kind of man who never faces a difficulty, who always flinches when it comes to the point. The stuff out of which liars and cowards are made. His one redeeming quality is his love for you. I have seen men in love before. I have never seen a man care more for a woman than he cares for you. His love for you has taken entire possession of him. By it he will sink or swim. The bishop paused. Rachel's face worked. He deceived you, said the bishop, not because he wished to deceive you, but because he was in a horrible position, and because his first impulse of love was to keep you at any price. But his love for you was raising him even while he deceived you. Did he spend sleepless nights because for months he vilely deceived Lord Newhaven? No. Rectitude was not in him. His conscience was not awake. But I tell you, Rachel, he has suffered like a man on the rack from deceiving you. I knew by his face as soon as I saw him that he was undergoing some great mental strain. I did not understand it, but I do now. Rachel's mind, always slow, moved, stumbled to its bleeding feet. It was remorse, she said, turning her face away. It was not remorse, it was repentance. Remorse is bitter, repentance is humble. His love for you has led him to it. Not your love for him, Rachel, which breaks down at the critical moment. 
his love for you, which has brought him for the first time to the perception of the higher life, to the need of God's forgiveness, which I know from things he has said has made him long to lead a better life, one worthier of you. Don't, said Rachel, I can't bear it. The bishop rose and stood facing her. And at last, he went on, at last, in a moment, when you showed your full trust and confidence in him, he shook off for an instant the clogs of the nature which he brought into the world, and rose to what he had never been before, your equal. And his love transcended the lies that love itself on its lower plane had prompted. He reached the place where he could no longer lie to you. And then, though his whole future happiness depended on one more lie, he spoke the truth. Rachel put out her hand as if to ward off what was coming. And how did you meet him the first time he spoke the truth to you? continued the bishop inexorably. You say you loved him, and yet you spurned him from you. You thrust him down into hell. You stooped to him in the beginning. He was nothing until your fancied love fell upon him. And then you break him. It is women like you who do more harm in the world than the bad ones. The harm that poor fool Lady Newhaven did him is as nothing compared to the harm you have done him. You were his god, and you have deserted him, and you say you loved him. May God preserve men from the love of women, if that is all that a good woman's love is capable of. I can do nothing, said Rachel hoarsely. Do nothing, said the bishop fiercely. You can do nothing when you are responsible for a man's soul. God will require his soul at your hands. Scarlet gave it into your keeping, and you took it. You had no business to take it if you meant to throw it away, and now you say you can do nothing. What can I do? said Rachel faintly. Forgive him. Forgiveness won't help him. The only forgiveness he would care for is to marry me. Of course, it is the only way you can forgive him. Rachel turned away. A stubborn, quivering face showed a frightful conflict. The bishop watched her. My child, he said gently, we all say we follow Christ, but most of us only follow him and his cross part of the way. When we are told that our Lord bore our sins and was wounded for our transgressions, I suppose that meant that he felt as if they were his own in his great love for us. But when you shrink from bearing your fellow creature's transgressions, it shows that your love is small. Rachel was silent. If you really love him, you will forgive him. Rachel clinched and unclinched her hands. You are appealing to a nobility and goodness which are not in me, she said stubbornly. I appeal to nothing but your love. If you really love him, you will forgive him. He has broken my heart. I thought that was it. It is yourself you are thinking of. But what is he suffering at this moment? You do not know or care. Where is he now, that poor man who loves you? Rachel, if you have ever known this despair, you would not thrust a fellow creature down into it. I have known it, said Rachel hoarsely. Were not you deserted once? You were deserted to very little purpose, if after that you could desert another. Go back in your mind, and remember. Where you stood once, he stands now. You and his sin have put him there. You and his sin have tied him to his stake. Would you range yourself forever on the side of his sin? Would you stand by and see him perish? Silence like the silence round a deathbed. He is in a great strait. Only love can save him. Rachel flung out her arms with an inarticulate cry. I will forgive him, she said. I will forgive him. End of chapter 51「ジャンプ」
Les armes dont j'aurais besoin et les étoiles sont trop longs. Je mourrai dans un coin. How Hugh shook off Lady Newhaven when she followed him out of the palace, he did not know. There had been some difficulty. She had spoken to him, had urged something upon him. But he had got rid of her somehow, and had found himself sitting in his bedroom at the Southminster Hotel. Anything to be alone. He had felt that that was the one thing in life to attain. But now that he was alone, solitude suddenly took monstrous and hideous proportions and became a horror to flee from. He could not bear the face of a fellow creature. He could not bear this ghoul of solitude. There was no room for him between these two great millstones. They pressed upon him till he felt they were crushing him to death between them. In vain he endeavoured to compose himself, to recollect himself. But exhaustion gradually did for him what he could not do for himself. Rachel had thrown him over. He had always known she would, and she had. They were to have been married in a few weeks, three weeks and one day. He marked a day off every morning when he waked. He had thought of her as his wife till the thought had become part of himself. Its roots were in his inmost being. He tore it out now and looked at it apart from himself as a man bleeding and shuddering looks upon a dismembered limb. The sweat broke from Hugh's forehead. The waiting and daily parting had seemed unbearable, that short waiting of a few weeks. Now she would never be his. That long, ever-growing hunger of the heart would never be appeased. She had taken herself away, taking away with her her dear hands and her faithful eyes and the low voice, the very sound of which brought comfort and peace. They were his hands and eyes. She had given them to him. And now she had wrenched them away again. Those faithful eyes had seared him with their scorn. Those white hands, against which he had leaned his forehead, had thrust him violently from her. He could not live without her. This was death, to be parted from her. I can't, Rachel, I can't, said Hugh over and over again. What was any lesser death compared to this, compared to her contempt? She would never come back. She despised him. She would never love him any more. He had told her that it must be a dream that she could love him, and that he should wake. And she had said it was all quite true. How sweetly she had said it. But it was a dream after all, and he had waked, in torment. Life, as long as he lived, would be like this moment. I will not bear it, he said suddenly, with the frantic instinct of escape which makes a man climb out of a burning house over a window ledge. Far down is the pavement, quiet, impassive, deadly, but behind is the blast of the furnace. Panic staggers between the two and jumps. I will not bear it, said Hugh. Tears of anguish welling up into his eyes. He had not only lost her, but he had lost himself. That better, humble, earnest self had gone away with Rachel, and he was thrust back on the old, false, cowardly self, whom, since she had loved him, he had abhorred. He had disowned it, he had cast it off. Now it enveloped him again, like a shirt of fire. And a voice within him said, This is the real you. You deceived yourself for a moment. But this is the real you, the liar, the coward, the traitor, who will live with you again for ever. I am forsaken, said Hugh. He repeated the words over and over again. Forsaken, forsaken. And he looked round for a way of escape. Somewhere in the back of his mind a picture hung, which he had seen once and never looked at again. He turned and looked at it now, as a man turns and looks at a picture on the wall behind him. He saw it again, the still upturned face of the little lake among its encircling trees, as he had seen it that day when he and Doll came suddenly upon it in the woods. What had it to do with him? He had escaped from it once. He understood now. Who that had once seen it had ever forgotten it? 
the look that deep water takes when life is unbearable. Come down to me among my tall water plants, it says. I am a refuge, a way of escape. This horror and nightmare of life cannot reach you in my bosom. Come down to me. I promise nothing but to lay my cool hand upon the fire in your brain, and that the world shall release its clutch upon you. The world which promises and will not keep its promises. I will keep mine. Hugh's mind wavered as the flame of a candle wavers in a sudden draught. So had it wavered once in the fear of death, and he had yielded to that fear. So it wavered now with a greater fear, the fear of life, and he yielded to that fear. He caught out his hat and went out. It was dark, and he hit against the people in the feebly lighted streets as he hurried past. How hot it was! How absurd to see those gathered heaps of snow and the muffled figures of men and women! Presently he had left the town and was in the open country. Where was he going along this interminable road in this dim snow light? The night was very still. The spirit of the frost stooped over the white face of the earth. The long homely lines of meadow and wold and hedgerow showed like the austere folds of a shroud. Hugh walked swiftly, looking neither to right nor left. The fire in his brain mounted, mounted. The moon, entangled in a dim thicket, got up behind him. At last he stopped short. That farm on the right, he'd seen it before. Yes, that was Greenfields. Doll had pointed it out to him when they walked on that Sunday afternoon to Bermia. They had left the road here and had taken to the fields. There was the gate. Hugh opened it. Crack had been lost here and had rejoined them in the wood. The field was empty. A path like a crease rang across it. He knew the way. It was the only way of escape from this shadow in front of him. This other self who had come back to him and torn Rachel from him and made her hate him. She loved him, really. She was faithful. She would never have forsaken him. But she had mistaken this evil, creeping shadow for him, and he had not been able to explain. But she would understand presently. He would make it all very clear and plain, and she would love him again when he had got rid of this other Hugh. He would take him down and drown him in Bermia. It was the only way to get rid of him. And he, the real Hugh, would get safely through. He had done it once, and he knew. He should stifle and struggle for a little while. There was a turn exceeding sharp to be passed, but he should reach that place of peace beyond, as he had done before, and find Rachel waiting for him, her arms round him again. It is the only way, he said over and over again. The only way. He reached the wood. The moon was up now, and smote white and sharp down the long winding aisle of the cathedral, which God builds him in every forest glade, where the hoar-frost and the snow held now their solemn service of praise. Hugh saw the little light of the keeper's cottage, and instinctively edged his way to the left. He was pressed for time. A wheel was turning in his head, so quickly, so quickly in this great heat, that unless he were quicker than it, it would outdistance him altogether. At last he saw the water, and ran down swiftly towards it, the white tree trunks were in league against him and waylaid him, striking him violently. But he struck back and got through them. They fell behind at last. His shadow was beside him now, short and nimble. He looked round once or twice to make sure it was still with him. He reached the water's edge, and then stopped short, aghast. Where was the water gone? It had deceived him and deserted him like everything else. It was all hard as iron, one great white sheet of ice stretching away in front of him. He had thought of the little lake as he had last seen it, cool and deep, and with the shadows of the summer trees in it. It was all changed and gone. There was no help here. The way of escape was closed. With a hoarse cry he set off, running across the ice in the direction of the place where he had nearly drowned before. It was here, opposite that clump of silver birch. The ice was a different colour here. It tilted and creaked suddenly beneath his feet. He flung himself down upon it and struck it wildly with his fist. Let me through, he stammered. But the ice resisted him. 
It made an ominous, dry crackling, as if in mockery. It barely resisted him, but it did resist him, and he had no time, no time. He scrambled to his feet again, and it gave way instantly. The other self pounced suddenly upon him and came through with him, and they struggled furiously together in deep water. I must, I must, gasped Hugh between his clenched teeth. You shall not, said the other self, mad with terror. Hold on to the ice. Hugh saw his bleeding hands holding tightly to the jagged edge. It broke. He clutched another piece. It broke again. The current was sucking him slowly under the ice. The broken pieces pushed him. One arm was under already, and he could not get it out. The animal horror of a trap seized him. He had not known it would be like this. He was not prepared for this. The other self fought furiously for life, clutching and tearing at the breaking ice. Call, it said to him, while there is still time. Hugh set his teeth. The ice broke in a great piece and tilted heavily against him. It was over one shoulder. Call, said the other self sharply again, or you would be under the ice. And up to the quiet heaven rose once and again a hoarse, wild cry of human agony and despair. End of chapter 52Chapter 53 of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 53. Uber allen gipfen ich ru, in allem wipfel spürst du. Kam einer hauch, die Vogelein schweigen in Walde. Warte nur, Walde, wo hast du auch? Goethe. The doctor was very late. Rachel, who was going to the watch service, waited for the bishop in the hall till he came out of his study with the curate, who had doubts. When the young man had left, Rachel said, hesitating, I shall not go to the service if Dr. Brown does not arrive before then. He was to have come with us. I don't want him to go all through the night thinking, perhaps if I am prevented going, you will see him and speak a word to him. My dear, said the bishop, I went across to his rooms two hours ago directly he went up to Hester. He loved Rachel, but he wondered at her lack of imagination. Two hours ago? And what did you say to him? I did not see him. I was too late. He was gone. Gone? said Rachel faintly. Where? I do not know. I went up to his rooms. All his things were still there. Where is he now? I do not know. The bishop looked at her compassionately. She had been a long time forgiving him. While she hesitated, he had said to her, Where is he now? And she had not understood. Her face became pinched and livid. She understood now, after the event. I am frightened for him, she said. The bishop had been alarmed while she poured out his tea before they began to talk. Perhaps he's gone back to London, she said her eyes widening with a vague dread. The bishop had gone on to the station and had ascertained that Hugh had not left by the one train which had stopped at Southminster between seven and nine, but he did not add to her anxiety by saying so. The doctor's broom, coming at full speed, drew up suddenly at the door. There he is at last, said the bishop, and before the bell could be rung he opened the door. A figure was already on the threshold, but it was not Dr. Brown. It was Dick. Where is Dr. Brown? said Rachel and the bishop simultaneously, looking at the doctor's well-known broom and smoking horses. He asked me to come, said Dick, mirroring Rachel with his eye. Then he did as he would be down by and added slowly, He was kept. He was on his way here from Wilderley, where one of the servants is ill, and as I was dining there he offered me a lift back. And when we were passing that farm near the wood, a man stopped us. He said there had been an accident. Someone nearly drowned. I went too. It turned out to be Scarlet. Dr. Brown remained with him and sent me to take you to him. Is he dead? asked Rachel, her eyes never leaving Dick's face. No, but he is very ill. I will come now. The chaplain came slowly across the hall, laden with books and papers. Let Canon Seabright know at once that I cannot take part in the service. 
said the bishop sharply, and he hurried down the steps after Rachel and got into the carriage with her. Dick turned up the collar of his fur coat and climbed up beside the coachman. The carriage turned warily and then set off at a great pace. The cathedral loomed up suddenly all aglow with light within. Out into the night came the dirge of the organ for the dying year. The bishop kept his eyes fixed on the pane. The houses were left behind. They were in the country. Who is that? said Rachel suddenly, as a long shadow ran beside them along the white hedgerow. It's only Dick. There is a rise on the ground here, and he is running to ease the horses. There was a long silence. I believe he did it on purpose, said Rachel at last. I forsook him in his great need, and now he has forsaken me. He would never forsake you, Rachel. Not knowingly, she said. I did it knowing. That is the difference between him and me. She did not speak again. For a lifetime, as it seemed to the bishop, the carriage swayed from side to side of the white road. At last, when he had given up all hope, it turned into a field and jilted heavily over the frozen ruts. Then it came to a standstill. Rachel was out of the carriage before Dick could get off the box. She looked at him without speaking, and he led the way swiftly through the silent wood under the moon. The bishop followed. The keeper's cottage had a dim yellow glimmer in it. Man's little light looked like a kind of darkness in the great white, all-pervading splendour of the night. The cottage door was open. Dr. Brown was looking out. Rachel went up to him. Where is he? she said. He tried to speak. He tried to hold her gently back while he explained something. But he saw she was past explanation, blind and deaf, except for one voice, one face. Where is he? she repeated, shaking her head impatiently. Here, said the doctor, and he led her through the kitchen. A man and woman rose up from the fireside as she came in. He opened the door into the little parlour. On the floor, on a mattress, lay a tall figure. The head, supported on a pillow, was turned towards the door. The wide eyes were fixed on the candle on the table. The lips moved continually. The hands were picking at the blankets. For the first moment, Rachel did not know him. How could this be Hugh? How could these blank, unrecognising eyes be Hugh's eyes, which had never until now met hers without love? But it was he. Yes, it was he. She traced the likeness, as we do in a man's son, to the man himself. She fell on her knees beside him and took the wandering hands and kissed them. He looked at her, through her, with those bright, unseeing eyes, and the burning hands escaped from hers back to their weary work. Dick, whose eyes had followed Rachel, turned away, biting his lip, and sat down in a corner of the kitchen. The keeper and his wife had slipped away into the little scullery. The bishop went up to Dick and put his arm round his shoulders. Two tears of pain were standing in Dick's hawk eyes. He'd seen Rachel kiss Hugh's hands. He ground his heel against the brick floor. The bishop understood, and understood too the sudden revulsion of feeling. Poor chap, said Dick huskily. It's frightfully hard luck on him to have to go just when she was to have married him. If it had been me, I could not have borne it. But then I would have taken care I was not drowned. I'd have seen to that. But it's frightfully hard luck on him all the same. I suppose he was taking a short cut across the ice. Yes, said Dick, and he got in where anyone who knew the look of ice would have known he would be sure to get in. The keeper watched him cross the ice. There was some time before they could get near him to get him out, and it seems there is some injury. Dr. Brown came slowly out, half closing the parlour door behind him. I can do nothing more, he said. If he lived, he would have brain fever. But he's dying. Does he know her? No, he may only know her at the last, but it's doubtful. I could do nothing, and I'm wanted elsewhere. I will stop, said the bishop. Shall I take you back? said Dr. Brown, looking at Dick. But Dick shook his head. I might be of use to her, he said, when the doctor had gone. So the two men who loved Rachel sat in impotent compassion in the little kitchen through the interminable hours of the night. At long intervals, the bishop went quietly into the parlour 
but apparently he was not wanted there. Once he went out and got a fresh candle and put it into the tin candlestick and set it among the china ornaments on woolwork mats. Hugh lay quite still now with his eyes half closed. His hands lay passive in Rachel's. The restless fever of movement was past. She almost wished it back, so far, so far was his life ebbing away from hers. Huey, she whispered to him over and over again, I love you, do not leave me. But he muttered continually to himself and took no heed of her. At last she gave up the hopeless task of making him hear and listened intently. She could make no sense of what he said. The few words she could catch were repeated a hundred times amid an unintelligible murmur. The boat, and Loftus, and her own name, and Crack. Who was Crack? She remembered the little dog which had been drowned. And the lips which were so soon to be silent talked on incoherently, while Rachel's heart broke for a word. The night was wearing very thin. The darkness before the dawn, the deathly chill before the dawn, were here. Through the low uncurtained window, Rachel could see the first wan light of the new day and of the new year. Perhaps he would know her with the daylight. The new day came up out of the white east in a great peace, pale as Christ newly risen from the dead, with the splendour of God's love upon him. A great peace and light stole together into the little room. Hugh stirred, and Rachel saw a change pass over his pinched, sunken face. It was the only way to reach her, he said, slowly and distinctly. The only way. I shall get through, and I shall find her upon the other side, as I did before. It is very cold, but I shall get through. I am nearly through now. He sat up and looked directly at her. He seemed suddenly freed, released. A boyish look that she had never seen came into his face, a look which remained in Rachel's heart while she lived. Would he know her? The pure light was upon his face, more beautiful than she had ever seen it. He looked at her with tender love and trust shining in his eyes, and laughed softly. I have found you, he said stretching out his arms towards her. I lost you, I don't remember how, but I came to you through the water. I knew I should find you, my Rachel, my sweet wife. He was past the place of our poor human forgiveness. He might have cared for it earlier, but he did not want it now. He had forgotten that he had any need of it, for the former things had passed away, love only remained. She took him in her arms. She held him to her heart. I knew you would, he said, smiling at her. I knew it. We will never part again. And with a sigh of perfect happiness, he turned wholly to her, his closed eyes against her breast. End of chapter 53《The Conclusion of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers The Conclusion It was autumn once more. The brambles were red in the hollow below Warpington Vicarage. Abel was gathering the apples in the orchard. Mr. and Mrs. Gressley were sitting together in the shade of the new porch, contemplating a triumphal arch which they had just erected across the road. Long life and happiness was the original motto inscribed thereon. Mrs. Gressley, in an alarming new hat, sank back exhausted in her garden chair. The Pratts are having six arches, all done with electric-like designs of hearts with their crest on the top, she said. They are to be lit up at nine o'clock. Mr. Pratt said he did not mind any expense on such an occasion. He said it made an epoch in the life of the county. Well, said Mr. Gressley, I lead too busy a life to be always poking my nose into other people's affairs. But I certainly never did expect that Lady Newhaven would have married Algy Pratt. 
Ada and Selina say Algy and she have been attached for years. That is why the wedding is so soon, only nine months, and she is to keep her title, and they are going to live at Weston. I told Ada and Selina I hoped they did not expect too much from the marriage, for sometimes people who did were disappointed. They only laughed and said Vi had promised Algy to take them out next season. We seem to live in an atmosphere of weddings, said Mr. Gressley. First, Dr. Brown and Fraulein, and now Algy Pratt and Lady Newhaven. I was so dreadfully afraid that Fraulein might think our arch was put up for her and presume upon it, said Mrs. Gressley, that I thought it better to send her a little note, just to welcome her cordially and tell her how busy we were about the Pratt festivities, and what a coincidence it was her arriving on the same day. I told her I would send down the children to spend the morning with her tomorrow. I knew that would please her, and it is Mrs. Baker's day in Southminster with her aunt, and I shall really be too busy to see after them. In some ways, I don't like Miss Baker as much as Fraulein. She's paid just the same, but she does much less. She's really quite short sometimes if I asked her to do any little thing for me, like copying out that church music. Hester used to do it, said Mr. Gressley. Miss Brown told me she'd heard from Hester, and that she and Miss West are still in India, and they mean to go to Australia and New Zealand and come home next spring. Was Hester well? Quite well. You know, James, I always told you that hers was not a genuine illness. That was why they would not let us see her. It was only hysteria, which girls get when they are disappointed at not marrying and are not so young as they were. Directly poor Miss Scarlet died, Hester left her room and devoted herself to Miss West, and Dr. Brown said it was the saving of her. But for my part, I always thought Hester took in Dr. Brown and the bishop about that illness. I should not wonder if Hester married Dick Vernon, said Mr. Gressley. It is rather marked they are going to Australia when he went back there only a few months ago. If she had consulted me, I should have advised her not to follow him up. A burst of cheering, echoed by piercing howls from Bulu, locked up in the empty nursery. I hope Miss Baker has put the children in a good place. She's sure to be in a good one herself, said Mrs. Gressley, as she and her husband took up their position by the gate. More cheering. A sudden flourish of trumpets and a trombone from the volunteer band at the corner, of which Mr. Pratt was colonel. A clatter of four white horses and an open carriage. A fleeting vision of Captain Pratt, white waistcoat, smile, teeth, eyeglass, hat waved in lavender kid hand. A fleeting vision of a lovely woman in white, with a wonderful white feathered hat and a large diamond heart, possibly a love token from Captain Pratt, hanging on a long diamond chain, bowing and smiling beside her elaborate bright room. In a moment they were passed, and a report of cannon and field artillery showed that the East Lodge of Warpington Towers had been reached, and the solemn joy of the Pratts was finding adequate expression. Do you look rather frightened? said Mrs. Gressley. Such a magnificent reception is alarming to a gentle, retiring nature, said Mr. Gressley. More cheering, this time much more enthusiastic than the last, louder, deafening. Dr. Brown's dog cart came slowly in sight, accompanied by a crowd. They have taken out the horse and are dragging them up, said Mrs. Gressley in astonishment. Look at Dr. Brown waving his hat and Fraulein bowing in that silly way. Well, I only hope her head won't be turned by the arches and everything. She will find my note directly she gets in. Really, James, two brides and bridegrooms in one day? It is like the end of a novel. Postscript We turn the pages of the Book of Life with impatient hands, and if we shut up the book at a sad page, we say hastily, Life is sad. But it is not so. There are other pages waiting to be turned. I, who have copied out one little chapter of the lives of Rachel and Hester, cannot see plainly, but I catch glimpses of those other pages. I seem to see Rachel with children round her, and Dick not far off, and the old light rekindled in Hester's eyes. For hope and love and enthusiasm never die. We think in youth that we bury them in the graveyards of our hearts, but the grass never yet grew over them. How then can life be sad when they walk beside us always in the growing light towards the perfect day? End of the conclusion. 
End of Red Pottage by Mary Chumley.